What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another Friday edition from Pre-Show here on Friday Night Bites, as we like to call it on uh, this corner of the internet. And uh, we're going to get into it tonight, Ravener, and chat, because uh, we are hitting go time. It feels like things are really been kicked up a notch over these last two episodes, and I have a feeling these next three are only going to continue that trend. I have a feeling we the craziest is still yet to come. Yeah, yeah, it's it's time. I mean, they they did really test everybody's patience. I mean, some people, I, I say it again and again. I mean, there's always that there's anticipation and there's frustration. And you got to amp up the anticipation without leaving people hanging so long. It turns into frustration. And man, they, they had us right on the edge. Uh, some people, you know, whenever there's a Twitter thread, there's always somebody like, oh, nothing has happened for so long. I'm done with this show. You know, there's always one of those guys in there. Um, but man, yeah, it's, it's about time. They need to pull the brakes off and then just, just knock us out these, these last three episodes leading into the, the final. Um, and like you mentioned last episode, um, nine and 10 are almost like a combined episode. Uh, the Mm. lady that plays, um, I I believe it was Julie, I think said, uh, six was her scariest, even though I thought number seven was scariest. And, and she said nine and 10 were her favorites just character wise. So I, uh, it, we got at least the notion that nine and 10 will almost be like a a combination. Although big finale. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what is a combination episode? We're literally only four days in from the arrival of the bus. If you go by time we're we're seven episodes in, but literally only four days have passed. Um, for day and night cycles in the from world, but yeah, man, I want to see it happen, man. I, I, I'm still like, whenever that, that frustration creeps in, I'm just like, fuck, you know, it's only like three more days and then it'll be Sunday again. We'll be doing a live viewing of the, the, <laughs> of the episode number eight. Uh, but yeah, these shows really keep me in it, man. And the, the way the chat is, the way the community is, uh, like there's so much hope and so much anticipation and so much positivity, um, everybody's got a theory. People are talking their theories, trying to iron them out and almost nothing has been discounted yet. Mm-hmm. So, you know, everything's still on the table. It's There's a whole world of potential and, you know, they have been selling us on the potential since episode one of this season, but man, come on, you know, how can you not be stoked for this? Right. <laughs> uh, yeah. I've been loving it. I, I've been loving it. Uh, I've been loving every episode personally. I, I, I know I, I, I definitely have had some of that in my comment section at time where people want to get to move a little bit faster, but I, I try to tell all those people, um, you know, the show like this is, it's very much a mystery box style kind of slow burn kind of show. Me personally, 
I guess I, I'm I'm not expecting any big answers to come early on, early on. So the kind of slower episodes don't bother me. I, we get some really good character moments, some really good acting in those episodes in particular. Um, so I thought those were, I mean, I haven't found an episode yet in season two that I found myself like, okay, let's move things along. That's just me personally, but that's what's so great about a show like this. Everyone's going to interpret it in a different way. But overall, it seems like people are having a blast with the show overall and are still very, very much uh, anticipating what is, how it's going to end. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I can't wait. Like I said, three episodes left. Um, it seems like things are definitely picking up a lot more now than they were in the first half of the season. There's no doubt about that. Um, and I'm looking forward to it. Like I said, I have, I have a few theories as to where potentially season two might end um, and where we might go from season three on. And I really hope we get uh, a, a, as many seasons as possible for them to properly tell this story, because I know they're going to need at least a good four, maybe even five seasons to really flesh this whole thing out, I would imagine. But yeah, I, I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying it. Oh, for sure. For sure. And the thing is, I mean, another thing, uh, you know, I, I hate to be like the the defender or whatever, but uh, when everybody's in, because, because they have so many characters and we saw this in the first, in the first uh, season. And, and that's where we really got the idea that every single uh, exchange of dialogue is significant, that mm -hmm. there are no throwaway lines because they have so many characters that they have to uh, interact with and that they have to interact with each other that they can't afford to put throwaway lines in. So every single thing should be treated like it's significant uh, just because most likely it is because they have so many characters they have to deal with and they have to fit all these scenes, all these interactions in a 45 minute, 48 minute episode. Set up uh, a ton of foreshadowing and all that. Yeah, that that you cannot, you cannot uh, like discount any of that stuff. Mm. Uh, but the, but the thing that happened is well, when everybody's at colony house, fine. When everybody's in, in the town or in the diner, fine you can force those interactions because the people are all present physically in one space now everybody's spread apart and it feels like it's going slower because they still have those same number of dialogues that they have to uh show to people but now the scenes are all changed uh i mean uh, it, it's better now that everybody's in the clinic now you got four people interacting and you can have you know you can have kenny and christy have a, a sidebar dialogue by running out of the clinic and talking and you can have Boyd and Marielle have a, an interaction or all the people that were in the clinic at the one time, or, um, you know, Ellis and Fatima were all in that one, like all in the building at that time. So you can have all of those things without them being spread out like Tabitha and Victor and Jim and Randall and, you know, whoever's up in colony house and, 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 it feels more disjointed and it feels like less is going on. And there's characters uh, people had mentioned that we hadn't even seen in this last mm. episode, like Sarah. Yeah. Like Sarah has been gone for two now. Yeah. Yeah. And man, to be fair, you know, it after, happens. Yeah, yeah. She was walking home after everybody shit on her. And, and then uh, Ethan gave her the mean mug when she tried to smile She's at probably him. Probably just settling up into yeah. the church or something. And that's yeah. it's, it's, it's the thing you bring up a lot and it's, it's important for, I think the audience to remember it. And it's, it's tough for us to remember it sometimes because we've already, we've already seen seven episodes. We've already been watching the show for seven weeks. So it feels like a lot of time has gone by, but for them, you know, in the time of the show wise, it's perfectly, you know, it makes perfect sense for how we haven't seen Sarah for two episodes because for them, it's only been a, a day since we've seen Sarah. So yeah, it's, it right. seems like a while for us, but for them, it's, it's very short amount of time. So in, keeping track of the time is just something I always try to keep in the back of my mind while watching from might seem like a while for us, but for them, it's only been a day or two. Yeah. And I have a feeling that when we all rewatch it, like once season 10 comes out or episode 10 comes out, and oh, God forbid we have a season 10, but yeah, uh, once episode 10 comes out and we are able to sit and watch this whole thing, you know, back to back to back the whole season, uh, we're going to, I mean, we'll realize when you watch season one going into season two, the, you know, the, the antenna fell, there was, there was the, the massacre or the, yeah, the antenna failed and fell. Uh, there's the massacre at colony house, the bus arrived. And then this whole season, man, all we've seen is exactly four days of, mm. of time pass since the bus rolled in at episode one. So when you're able to watch it all in one, uh, especially, got, you know, if there's any kind of reveals, any kind of knowledge that we are, are shared uh, in episodes eight, nine and ten, um, at least we'll be able to watch it in that context and we'll know, and it'll be way less painful. The, the, my point being, uh, you know, the, these long episodes where nothing, well, seemingly nothing is happening. It'll feel so much more um, satisfying when we know 
uh, you know, what is going to happen. Or we, we're watching all the episodes in a line without a one week. I'm looking forward to going back to <laughs> see. I'm looking forward to going back to season one more than anything. Like as soon as season two is is over, I I cannot wait to go back to season one and and watch every episode from start to finish and see you know try and pick up some things that we missed the first go around. Because whenever you get a second season of a show like this, it it adds a little bit more to the story. You get a little bit more world building, character development. You get a little bit more pieces to the puzzle, so you can go back to those earlier seasons and you'll always kind of pick up some stuff that you missed or you'll see something in season one that'll make a little bit more sense now when it didn't the first time you watch it because you have more information. So I I can't wait to go back and do the season one uh, rewatch party that we're going to do here on the channel. And I hope that everybody in the chat comes and hangs out with us and uh, rewatches season one with us again, because then, yeah, we can go right back into season two and uh, do a rewatch of season two right after that. I'm looking forward to it. Um, But uh, speaking of the awesome chat, we got a bunch of people in here. We got a super chat hanging up here from our good friend, Michael DJ. What is up, Michael? It is good to see you, my good friend. Thanks for the streams. Super fun. And I, I know we say it all the time, even when we're just talking in the back room, like these from streams have been some of the funnest times that we've had online in, in years. Um, since the Game of Thrones days, for, for me personally, it's just these discussions have made the show 10 times more enjoyable. For sure. Without a doubt, without a doubt. Uh, um, and, and it's not just, I mean, we come up with different theories, but the stuff that the chat gives us, and and, and I love talking them out. I literally, just yeah. before the show, I was on with some other friends. I was just on a phone call, and uh, one of them asked me about my theory. And I was like, okay, well, it's this and this. And they're like, well, how does that hold up in relation to this? Well, but what about this? So you, they're all about adjusting and pivoting and holding your theories up to scrutiny, given the information that we have current you know given the information that we have currently you have to hold your theory up to that and how much of it is uh you know supported by what we're given in the show and then how much of it is wishful thinking how much Mm. are you how much stuff that's out there are you denying or how much are you choosing to ignore because it doesn't fit into your your theory view um and and these guys yeah again the guys in the chat absolutely phenomenal even the guys in your um in your Twitter threads uh, or, or, and sometimes the YouTube comments, they'll come up with something that maybe we yeah, hadn't been addressed. Great stuff. Uh, a guy was asking, Hey, you know, do you have a, a, um, like a high res picture of the map that's in, in Victor's trailer, the, the, yeah. pe- the peach truck. And I was yeah. like, well, yeah, why don't I just freeze frame that? And I don't know what he was going to do with it. I don't know what he was going to make with it, but I know that somebody else is thinking about something. And if I could provide that, if I could provide a nice, like s- still, of a like a quality high quality still maybe he can do something with this so now that guy's off there or i think it was a couple uh, 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 a couple that were doing that but they're off there doing something they're following that thread they're going following down that their rabbit lead, hole yeah and god knows what they're going to come up with man they might come up with something magical right that's what's that and that's what's so fun about the show there's so mm-hmm. many different places you could take it the, the amount of mystery and the amount of threads that they're kind of throwing at us early on that are definitely that i believe will definitely you know be revealed and lead to some really good payoffs later on down the road once we get to the later seasons. But yeah, like at this point in the, in the show where we're very much in the mystery phase of it and they're still kind of just setting up the whole mystery of it. Yeah. There's so many places you could go with the show and we're still so early on that. Yeah. A lot of the theories that everybody are talking about could still very much hold weight. There not, there hasn't been a whole lot of theories out there that have been completely disproven up till this point, just because we're still so early on, but yeah, I'm loving it. I'm really, am loving it. And the discussions, like I said, the discussions around the show have been just as fun, if not more fun than actually watching the show itself. So it's been great. And that is thanks to you guys and girls in the chat, hanging out with us every week and sharing your thoughts and theories and just everything, just making this thing a, very positive experience overall. And we got a $2 super chat. Thank you. I appreciate that. Loving this channel for all the Game of Thrones and From content. Well, I appreciate that very much. Song of Ice and Fire and From are definitely my two favorite franchises out there at the time being. I, I love both of these franchises. I love what From is doing. I've always been a huge Song of Ice and Fire fan, so I support everything that uh, that is attached to that. But this show came out of just left field. And what I really am loving about From, and I I know I say it a lot, but it doesn't have any source material. It doesn't have a book that you can kind of go back to and read and and know everything that's going to happen before it happens. Like, I love Game of Thrones. I love House of the Dragon. But 
I know those stories. So I kind of know what's going to be happening. But here right. it is just a completely <laughs> blank canvas for everybody. Everybody's on the level playing field. Nobody has hidden knowledge that maybe book readers uh, that maybe show readers didn't read or it's just it's everybody's on the level playing field. Everybody's theories have been incredibly fun to watch. And yeah, it's just nice to have a blank canvas like that where you don't know what's coming. Oh my God. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Man, you get the wrong thing in, in one of the game of Thrones ones and they're like, excuse me, but um, no, that, wasn't know, that wasn't in the book. That was appendix, in the book. Appendix G yeah. that's referencing yeah. page 864 of volume seven. Uh, no, people get serious states, with their lore. Like, yeah. <laughs> it's like, crazy. Man, I don't know, man. Jon Snow. <laughs> all, I, all I do is like Jon Snow. Uh, she's my yeah. queen. She's my queen. But no, yeah, something like this, it's, it really is. It's, it's, an, it's a refreshing experience because it's so new and it's so original. Um, but yeah, let's, uh, let's see what we got in the chat hanging out with us tonight. We got Brian in the chat as well. Brian is always dropping some insanely good theories in the comment section of the videos. And keep it up, Brian. I, I try to read every single one of them. You got some really good ideas about the show, as do so many of you. So many of you in the chat always have really great ideas about the show. It's so fun to read that comment section. Uh, we got D-Wag hanging out as well. What is up, D-Wag? It is good to see you, my friend. I heard D-Wag is all caught up on from as well. We got yep. Too Tall hanging out. What is up, Too Tall? We got C-A-Y in the house. Donation celebration. Well, indeed, indeed. Well, I'll be honest. Just uh, hanging out and talking with all of you guys is more than payment enough to, uh, to do these shows. I have a blast simply talking about the show. Uh, <laughs> hello, <laughs> Dustin and Dames Tuckers. <laughs> what is up, Crazy Matt? It is good to see you as well. Good, good indeed. We got Dana Marie. What is up, Dana Marie? It is always good to see you as well. How did everyone like that crazy shit here in New York with the Canadian fire and the crazy smoke? It was like we were in an episode of From. Yeah, it's been pretty nuts. Um, I, I am also up here in the Northeast as well, and we're getting these advisories every day. Keep your window shut. Keep your, uh, if you have ACs in the window, keep them on for only a minimal time during the day. They're very serious about this whole smoke thing. Uh, we haven't had anything too bad in our area yet, but. I have seen in some of these surrounding areas like yourself in New York has been, uh, it's been pretty wild. Yeah. It definitely was uh, some from vibes, some Stephen King vibes, I would say for sure. That is, that is so weird. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, driving it back to the show, uh, somebody's saying like, if they were going to do some filming, they're going to want to start in July just so that they aren't, you know, cause they're in Nova Scotia. I don't know what the, what the, scenery is going to be like mm, like in yeah. the actual town but yeah, yeah they're a lot closer up. yeah shit. and yeah. and you know we have it out here out west you know the out, the west burns up you know on a yearly basis but there yeah, have been they times do controlled when wildfires every year out dude, there those yeah. controlled burns get out of control every day exactly they're like, yeah hey, let's let's do a controlled <laughs> burn on a day when the winds are forecast to be 55 miles an hour yeah and, and every have, tree for miles is bone dry Dude. And then we'll get ones from Arizona. I mean, literally uh, uh, like ash will be falling. I'm in New Mexico for anybody who doesn't know, but in like Northern Arizona or some of these other states, even California, sometimes the wildfires, depending on how high the yeah. smoke goes in the atmosphere, we'll either get a haze, which is really noticeable here. Cause we don't like anybody back East doesn't really know what the desert Southwest looks like uh, mm. because we have no humidity. There's no diffraction of, of, there's no haze or anything. There's no clouds that, that, so the sun is so intense and bright, like even comparative to like Illinois or something. Um, mm -hmm. But when that's not there, it's really, really noticeable. Um, and, and those hazes will get up there and I'm like, well, is that clouds? Nah, man, that's a forest fire from two States away. Two that's States burning. over. Yeah. And Crazy. sometimes you'll get ash. You'll get like, it'll look like you'll think it's snow or you'll think what the hell is this? And it could be, you know, you think it's like cottonwood fluff or whatever that blows on the wind. Nah, man, there's literally like ash sometimes that will just be dropping down here um, yeah. from a fire that's nowhere near here. Crazy, um, but man. yeah, man, that stuff happens all the time. So God bless those people. And it's, uh, you're yeah, really stay safe, everybody uh, out there for sure. Yeah, man. You're so, I mean, you're never more at the, the whims of the elements till like the, the southwesterly wind suddenly becomes a northeasterly wind and yeah, your house you change you on thought, a dime. Yeah, yeah. You thought you were home free and now you are not. Now, the one good thing is, as far as I know, they they have moisture out there. Uh, they have plentiful water. Hopefully they'll start getting some rain and precip um, um, or maybe even like the stuff that is burning. Uh, you know, isn't as, I mean, it's not tinder dry, hopefully, um, you know, hopefully even the trees are alive. So they're not mm. going to be as 
<laughs> down here, man, things get so dry. They just, ca- they just catch and everything's full of nice flammable resin. So I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what trees yeah, they have up there, but yeah, yeah man, those hopefully poor people, everybody man. stays safe. Yeah. Yeah, man. Take care of yourselves and, and, and best wishes for you, you know, and, and hopefully the government that, t- that has no qualms about dipping into your pocket for this, that, and the other, maybe they might uh, spend a, you know, a couple bucks trying to get you squared away. Right. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. Hopefully everybody stays safe. It's, 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 you definitely don't want to see anybody lose any homes or loss of life or anything like that. Those things can be dangerous for sure. Um, we got replicator Rob in the house. What is up, Rob? Uh, do you guys think that is Fatima? Now that has been one of the biggest questions going, coming out of episode seven. People have been wondering, is this Fatima? Is this some new form of monster? At, at first glance, I originally thought it maybe could be Fatima myself. I even brought the notion up in my original episode seven review video. But after watching the episode a few times, I'm pr- I'm almost 100% convinced now that there's nothing there at all. That this is just a similar vision, similar kind of hallucination to what Boyd was having with the ballerina. Not only is the ballerina box present there, which was kind of a giveaway, but there are some very specific stills um, on this scene that made me think, uh, I don't think there's anything there at all. Um, I, I, we brought this up on the last stream, but... You go through these stills, and these are in uh, chronological order, the way that they are aired on the episode. One minute you see the hand push Elgin down. You can sign it. You can still see the hand there holding Elgin down underwater, and then you see the first view of it. But then you switch back over to Elgin, and there's nothing holding Elgin down. It's almost like he's holding himself under the water. That leads me to believe that this is w- similar to what Boyd is going through. Like if someone were to walk in the room right now, I have a feeling they would probably just see Elgin underwater, kind of holding himself under there. Just my that's just my guess, of course. You know, like I said, this is the tinfoil hat theory place. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But just like just, yeah, like Boyd with the ballerina, like the ballerina yeah, is choking him I don't or think smothering it's real. him. Yeah, I don't think it's real. I, I think. I don't even the think way it's of, a question. Yeah, I, I think yeah. almost, uh, I mean, I think you could very solidly rest that it is purely hallucinatory or a dream. I think so. We could, yeah. I could be wrong. I and definitely it, could be probably, wrong. And I do think that creature is Fatima. I think it's a dream nightmare version of Fatima with the robe on. That much oh, yeah. is absolutely true. Yeah, I think yeah, that's I'm not almost, so sure. I mean, if it's really? maybe just like a, you know, a manifestation of his, you know, maybe that's just his consciousness, his consciousness kind of having Fatima manifest and doing that to him. Because I guess, I mean, you could kind of tie it back to the conversation that he had with Fatima at the Brundles talking about the water and stuff. So I, yeah. Fatima could kind of be associated with that subconsciously for him. Um, yeah, but yeah, I mean, yeah. if it is a representation of her, I, I think it's just solely based on that. I don't think it's actually Fatima up there in monster form. Although, I mean, anything's <laughs> possible. But yeah, let us know in the uh, comment section as well. What do you guys think? Do you think this is Fatima? Do you think this is just a random hallucination? Or, you know, let us know what you guys are thinking as well. Yeah. And, 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 and I, I think absolutely that that's it. I mean, yeah, she is the character that he's probably had more contact with almost anybody other maybe than Julie. But I think I mean, he, just between the walks to the Brundles and everything else and, and the stuff that she was saying to him regarding, you know, people have, have followed those lines of thinking, you know, trying to figure out answers and they all come back. It, it, that's what I mean. Just p- to paraphrase what she told him, you know, people have go- gone down that rabbit hole before and they all come back with the same answer. We're stuck. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, and and I guess if he was going to process somebody in his dream, a Fatima would be as, as likely as, as likely as candidate any. as anyone. Yeah. And definitely. if it turns into a nightmare, then she, then she just gets to turn into a nightmare, too. But, yeah, I mean, I if I, I would almost uh, I would almost bet anything that uh the one of the first scenes of the next episode will be him waking up or the first time you see elgin in the next yeah thing he might not even be in this bathroom in this bathtub and i think him having all (laughs) those clothes on is another indication as to maybe he's not even in this bathtub i mean who goes into the bathtub fully clothed like that nobody nobody does that so i'm thinking maybe this this might just be a complete dream and he we might see elgin in the beginning of next episode just like waking up in his bed or something he might not even be in this bathroom but who knows i can't wait to find out either way and he literally did tell julie i don't take baths Uh, yeah he's like i don't even take baths (laughs) (laughs) she's like well i don't know what to tell you then (laughs) that was what i thought was funny that was a good line of hers because i mean when you're trying to help somebody and they they aren't taking what you tell them like all right sorry bro you're on your own then that's what i got i give you all i got i don't have anything else (laughs) yeah that's it uh it's a dream sequence says coco yep uh, i think so as well i definitely think so as well uh fatima looking like a prune says do you i guess she's looking very prunish very prunish uh doc hayes agrees it could be a hallucination uh her shirt is the bile color yeah a little 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 bile s color yes indeed indeed uh, we got Kev Z with a $5 super chat. Thank you so much, Kev Z, with the super chat. I cannot thank you enough for that. 
wow, you guys have been incredibly generous tonight. You guys deserve a, uh, a whoa. Oh, what's in the box? Whoa! <laughs> a whoa and a what's in the box. Yeah, I loaded up the what's in the box just because I feel like it's fitting for this show. Oh, what's in the box? What's in the fucking box? Give me the gun. Right here in the middle. <laughs> it's yeah, it's just fitting for this kind of show, I think. What's in the box? Uh, but thank you, everyone. I cannot appreciate the generosity enough. You guys have been so cool. Awesome stuff. Uh, what's creepy is how uh, the new looks. What's creepy is how new it looks, like the music box. That is, yeah, the yeah, the music box. And at first, I was thinking that the music box was solely tied to the worms and that Boyd had, because obviously Boyd was the only one having these visions now. Uh, at first, but we saw in this episode not only did Elgin see the music box, but uh, Marielle saw it as well. So it, it seemed like this, you know, this ballerina, it's almost like it, it seems like every time the show is showing us this ballerina box, it's almost like it's a hint that maybe some type of vision or something is coming. At least that's what I'm taking from it so far. At first, I thought it was solely tied to the worms because it was only Boyd seeing it. But now that we're seeing these other characters who, as far as we know, haven't come into contact with the worms as far as we know. Um, they're seeing these, this music box now as well. So I think it's just a plot device to kind of let us know that there is some kind of hallucination on the way. But that's just a guess. And it's just a guess. Uh, maybe the worms that are dried out in the inside of the monster, perhaps the worms partially left the monster and are still are, and are in the soil now, changing everything. Now, there's, that's interesting. That's interesting indeed. One thing I was a little bit bummed with, and, and I know we, uh, we talked about it on many live streams ever since that episode aired, but um, I, I was really disappointed that they didn't dissect the head and, and try and open up the brain. It seems like, you know, when, when Boyd shoves those worms into Smiley's throat, he shoves them in right at the throat. And the closest kind of major organ to that is the brain right there. Um, I, I just, I found it a little weird that they didn't at least try to dissect the brain because I was thinking maybe the worms are in the brain. We didn't see them anywhere else in the body. They couldn't have just completely disappeared. I suppose it's possible that they could have kind of concentrated into the, you know, the gallbladder and the bile that we're seeing could be kind of worm infused. But I was just thinking, why are they not dissecting Smiley's brain? Why are they not cracking open his head and seeing what's inside there too? Especially after opening up his body and seeing that his organs are all kind of shriveled. You would think, okay, let's take a look at this brain now. Let's see what's, what's going on upstairs. But I was a little disappointed we didn't get a brain uh, autopsy. But maybe we can get one on the next time. Uh, maybe it was Kenny's mom. Oh, yeah, Kenny's mom has been a big uh, candidate lately as to who could potentially the mole could be. I know a lot of people are suspecting Kenny's mom for some reason. And uh, it would be a nice twist. She's definitely one of those characters you wouldn't expect for sure. Uh, Fatima, Fatima saying no way she could be pregnant. Um, yeah, that's because she's low key a monster and maybe that's it. Yeah, maybe that's <laughs> it. <laughs> she definitely well, seemed, I, I mean, you know, this is a place where like, like you said, monsters exist, you know, you're in a town where you can't escape. There's so much weird stuff happening, happening all around you, but a pregnancy, that's really what is giving you this much pause Fatima after everything you've seen, but maybe that's the case. <laughs> I know. Well, there's people also saying Loki, she's a dude. So I guess being a monster is almost more flattering, you know? Oh, geez. I haven't heard that one yet. Shit. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, 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 who knows where we're going to, who knows where they're not going very this flattering thing. to the actress. That's for sure. <laughs> oh no, absolutely not. For sure. Uh, the lungs are closer than the brain. Uh, well, well, just be, yeah. Well, from where the throat went in, from when the, uh, the worms went in right to the throat, yeah, I mean, the closest organ to that is is definitely the brain. Um, I mean, lungs are pretty close, but the way he went in right to the throat, boom, the brain is inches away. Um, you would think that they would want to at least crack that brain open and see what was inside. Um, I knew they were human from get go. Yeah, we call and we did call that Carrie. You're absolutely right. A lot of us here on the channel have had a feeling that they were human originally. And I just I go back to that season one scene with Jasmine at the Colony House massacre when she says it wasn't my choice to be this way. I just I don't know. For some reason, I got the feeling that she was telling the truth there. I just have a feeling that all of these monsters were indeed human at one point. And it would at the very least exper you know, explain some of the kind of period collect clothing, I guess. Um, but yeah, I had a feeling they were all human at one point, and it seems like that is the case. Um, can the monsters breed with humans? Now, there's a good question. Uh, that's the thing. We, we still know absolutely nothing about these monsters. I mean, their insides look very shriveled up, so that leads me to believe that they probably can't produce uh, the necessary bodily fluids uh, that most humans can to have a child. <laughs> but uh, who right. knows? It seems like there's a little bit more than just physiology going here, going on here with these monsters. It seems yeah. like there's a kind yeah, of mystical aspect to it. 
Yeah, that one dude was trying. I don't. He didn't get to that point though. I don't know. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, as a human, I don't know if he get the chance. <laughs> he was trying to get with Jasmine. Yeah, but she uh, she ended up biting off his tongue, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, she was more ooh, concerned about okay. the blood drip on her collar than she was about anything yeah, else. So, yeah. I mean, that dude spread all over, up, up and down the walls and everything else. All right, and she's yeah, more yeah. worried about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I like this, though. Um, uh, the actress who played uh, Christy said the brain dissection is a whole other procedure. Okay, so maybe we're not completely done with this dissection uh, yet. Maybe we will have something coming. I like that. I was just very surprised that they didn't at least try to crack open the brain. But if they're saving that for something else later down the road, that could totally make sense why they didn't attempt it in that episode. Totally cool. Uh, My blood is your blood could mean Martin and Boyd have the same blood type. Remember, Martin did the same, and uh, that is how uh, that is why he was trapped. Smiley had no blood. That is why blood worms killed Smiley. Could be the case. Could be the case. I, I mean, I saw a lot of people thinking that the my blood is your blood was some kind of way to kind of activate the worms so they would go from Boyd to um, Smiley, similar to how Martin sent the, sent the worms over to Boyd. Maybe he physically had to say the words, my blood is your blood, to kind of get the worms to transfer from one host to another, which is, a good, I mean, it's a, it's a plausible theory, I guess. But uh, so is this as well. And uh, good stuff, Jesse. Uh, maybe the worms are in the girlfriend now. She was the first person to see the worms in Boyd. That's right. Not only did she see the worms in Boyd, but she actually physically grabbed Boyd's arm. I mean, there was no cut there on where uh, where she grabbed. But I do have, I believe I do have that still. Uh, Mari, yeah, Mari straight up grabs Boyd's arms when the worms start to manifest in the uh, in the medical clinic. Because at that point, Boyd is trying to tell everybody he's got these worms in his skin and nobody's believing him. I mean, to the point where even Kenny kind of, draws down on him and is almost trying to force him to cooperate into this blood transfusion. And then lo and behold, the worms uh, start to manifest. And the first person that goes up and grabs them is um, Mari. You're right. You're absolutely right about that. So, I mean, I suppose she could have been infected that way, but it just, it didn't seem like there was any open cuts there for starters, but I don't know. I don't know. And of course I'm always having trouble finding these stills when I need to find them. Here we go. Oh yeah, and uh, yeah, after the trend, and she was like chock full of, but that was mostly Ellis's blood, I think. Yeah, that she was covered with um, when she le- at the very end of the thing when she had all those Here we go. towels that she was taking out. Um, yeah. Um, but and then she gave gave that longingly loving glance to the uh, the medicine cabinet and found out that it had that combination lock on the on the door. Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, she was covered with blood. I don't know if – yeah, I don't think any think of it was – I think it was just Ellis's blood. blood, yeah. Yeah. That seemed to be um, Ellis' blood. But she does have – she is physically grabbing Boyd's arm right here. And, I, yeah, it doesn't look like there's any cuts, but we have no idea how these yeah. freaking worms operate. So, I mean, it's not out of the realm of possibility to think she could have been infected, I suppose. I mean, we haven't seen her display any symptoms yet that come with holding these worms, which is another reason why I don't think Sarah has any worms either. I know a lot of people think Sarah has the same worms in her body because we saw the message on Sarah's arm in season one. But I've, I've dissected that scene so many times and I've watched just about every every scene of Boyd's worms. The What manifests on Sarah's arm looks totally different it doesn't look anything like the worms that boyd has it almost looks like it's a, a kind of a stigmata message that is popping up on sarah's arm so i don't think sarah has the worms and we haven't seen sarah display any of the symptoms that come along with having the worms so i don't think sarah has the worms i mean she could it's definitely a possibility but i, I don't well, think the worms yeah as people were talking about that when, when we were talking about it it did remind me more of like in the exorcist when when like she has like the scratch or like the, the welts or whatever that says, help me that come up from under her skin. They didn't seem to be like rolling and flowing worms that, that form a shape into no. that. It, it seemed more it like, like the cut. welts they were or red. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It was beat red. Like a cut would almost be. Um, yeah. I just, I, I didn't think they were worms like Boyd has. Like I said, definitely could be, but I, I, I'm pretty sure what Sarah had was just a message, you know, being conveyed to her. I don't think it was actual worms. And she's getting uh, Kenny messages from mold. different people too. Yeah, that's the thing. We well, yeah, we know uh, Sarah is being influenced by more than one entity out there. We see her being influenced by uh, some entity that is clearly having her do some pretty heinous things at time. You know, trying to kill Ethan, killing the people at the medical clinic. 
Uh, but then again, we see Sarah get influenced, you know, when they're in, the, when Boyd and Sarah are in the woods, it seems like that's almost Boyd's wife that is reaching through to Sarah, telling, you know, uh, telling her about the fish and loaves name, which is really no other way she could have heard that about the fish and loaves story unless it was Abby. And also, right. you know, giving them that warning that there's worse things out here than the monsters. I was wrong. You should go back. It seems like that voice was trying to help Sarah and Boyd. And um, whereas some of the other voices seem to have some more nefarious uh, goals. Right. And the, the voices that she when Father Cotri was challenging her or whatever, and she did the drawing of the Cosmo that he had buried that yep. I think Sarah was still uh, satisfied that the force that was letting her draw that thing were, were the voices that she was hearing, though. Yes. So at least what even if they were evil or even if they were telling her to do bad things, those voices were still uh, sufficiently invested in her being believable that they gave her that vision of like father Cotri's chocolate bar that, that she couldn't have had otherwise. So whatever force it is that was making her do those bad things was the same force that made her draw that thing that, that satisfied the townsfolk that, or the people at least in that room that they were real, that they, that they were, I mean, it satisfied father Cotri for sure. Right. Mm. And then, yeah. and then Boyd, then, then he ran in with that backpack and showed Boyd. So Boyd tend, had to believe it too. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. That, that what she was seeing was real. Cause at that point, I think Boyd was still up in the air too, right. About whether he believed. Yes. Sarah. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. I don't think he was believing it right off, off the bat. You know, I mean, I mean, who would, it's, it's, it's a pretty crazy story, even in a place like this, especially right, after right, all right. the things that Sarah has done, you know, it's not like she's some kind of innocent person coming to him with this story. This is a murderer coming to you with this story. So you're going to have a little more sus eyes than normal, I would say. Um, <laughs> right. um, if this creature is Fatima, she clearly needs a Snickers. Yeah, she doesn't look like herself. Yeah, she, you know, Fatima, you're not yourself when you're hungry. Have a Snickers. Yes, indeed. <laughs> um, did the worms shrivel or dry out of Smiley's guts? That's the big question. I, I know some people seem to think that they are kind of maybe concentrated in the gallbladder bile, which is definitely a possibility. Uh, we see in the preview for episode seven, it looks like Boyd and Kenny are going to try and dip some bullets into this bile. And they're going to attempt to shoot some of these monsters to see if the bile bullets will work. And hashtag uh, coining the phrase bile bullets. Let's get that one going. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, that, it looks like that is the at least that's the hope. They're hoping that they're they're hoping that the worms were kind of concentrated or at least there's an essence of the worms in this bile, uh, you know, because they're they're clearly going to attempt to use this bile as a weapon. But what exactly happened to the worms? Exactly. Did they get concentrated into that bile? Did the worms just kind of disappear? We, we have no idea where the worms really went. They had to go somewhere, whether they shriveled up and died, whether they kind of gotten absorbed into the body and now they are in that gallbladder remains to be seen. But they had to go somewhere, I would imagine. Yeah, and our, our uh, co-host uh, Snuggy was really convinced that that um, they aren't even physical. They're more just like a, like a magical manifestation or something. So they may not even be necessarily like actual physical worms. Um, but like you know, they might appear like worms crawling around under the skin, but that doesn't mean that there's necessarily worms under the skin. They, that's just how they appear. So I mean, if they're purely magical, if they're not physical, then that really does open the door for that transfusion. Even though he thought he had transferred, I mean, like killing Smiley was a good, um, you know, a good indicator that there was some kind of magical property to Boyd's blood, but there was nothing to indicate that um, that they were entirely gone out of Boyd and that that transfusion wasn't completely full of these non-physical, metaphysical, it's magical risk. worms. Yeah, and and just because we haven't seen worms in Boyd yet. That doesn't, doesn't mean they're mean not they're there. No yeah. time has passed, really. I mean, very little time has passed. And I was the, the whole time I'm watching episode seven, I was really expecting something like that to happen. I was just expecting for us to have a scene where boy just boom, he falls into another kind of vision and sees the ballerina again and looks down at his arm and sees some freaking worms moving around again. And then it's like, oh, shit, they're not gone because I just had a feeling they weren't all the way gone from Boyd. And if that is the case. There's definitely a possibility that uh, Ellis could have them in his system as well. But yeah, I guess you know, we're going to have to wait and see what exactly is going on with these worms. But uh, let me catch up a little bit with the chat. We've got a lot of good stuff down here. Um, now, uh, Marcus uh, was put a question out earlier, and uh, now Carrie is thinking that this maybe could potentially be Fatima, what Fatima will look like when she is at her full term of pregnancy or after delivery. Now, that is a terrifying notion. <laughs> Very terrifying indeed. 
Um, she could have needed to have a hysterectomy. Yeah, that could be the case. Yeah, she, yeah, she could. I mean, we, we don't exactly know why Fatima thinks she can't have kids, but she was pretty dead set on the fact that it is just not possible for her. So yeah, maybe she did, you know, have some type of procedure back then where she just doesn't have the necessary, you know, equipment to have a child anymore, maybe. Um, I think it's a dream. Next episode, we'll show him waking up. Yeah, I think that's where we're heading as well. I, I definitely think it was a dream. Um, let's see what else we got. Uh, is Elgin's ha is Elgin's half brother? Yeah, I, I thought a lot of people are, were bringing up the um, the theory that they think Elgin might actually be the son of Fatima and Ellis. That he's just from a different timeline, which is <laughs> it's an interesting it's an interesting thought. Don't get me wrong. I just when you start playing with that level of time travel, when sons are meeting their parents when they were younger than them, there's that kind of time travel can get really, really sticky and it really has to be, you know, developed and cultivated carefully in shows like yeah. this. Cause time travel can really throw stories just completely off the rail into some really just bizarre places. And I hope that doesn't oh, happen man. here on from from seems a little more for a, you know, kind of for all the weird shit we see on from it is seeming a little more grounded at this point. I don't think we'll see that level of time travel in this show. I think we'll see some aspects of it. But who knows? I could be wrong. It could yeah, be. That, it broke my brain. Like reading the time travel theories because it was like El like Elgin is El Ellis and Fatima's kid. But wait, actually, it isn't. Maybe it's um, uh, yeah. And, and Elgin, and, and, and like uh, Fatima was the grandma that Elgin was going to go visit. And when he woke up, it was because he knew that play. He'd heard the stories about that place. And yeah, it was like he's from the past and he's from the future and he's he's his own grandson and all this other stuff and i was just like man i can't follow it i mean some people are really into it though and 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 uh using the things but that's the funny thing about the show is uh you do use the the parts that support your theories and then kind of like confirmation bias dismiss the parts that don't right <laughs> and yeah. it's like oh my god so uh yeah um and then then they brought in the fact that it was mary that was coming in with um coming in on the bus also uh like I guess supported the idea that I, it's, but I don't, I mean, I don't know. Cause even Mary said that there was only like what, six months and you were what, how far did wait, wait, did she say like 20 miles away or something for yeah, those yeah, last six yeah, months? Two, we were just, I think she said like two hours away two or hours something. Away. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, but, and as far as she knew at that time, that was true that she was, but, but, I guess that meant that, uh, that all that meant is that Mary was riding the bus for two hours out of Grand Rapids. Yeah, that has yeah. no indication about the actual distance of where from Fromville is. No, especially so, yeah. seeing everyone so, kind uh, of, every, you know, especially seeing everyone kind of arrives from a totally different point in the map. And I did go back and uh, just just in case we ever needed to look at it at times, I tried to get a clear kind of still of this map so we could see some of these thumbtacks a little more clearly. And yeah, they are just completely split, spread out all over the globe globe the matthews oh, family came picture, in from yeah. arizona yeah the matthews family came in from arizona um kenny and his mother came in from california people came in from all over the place jade came in from the florida range i believe one of these two are jades um people are coming in from all over the map so it's just it's so it's it's just so hard to tell at this point we just simply don't have enough information yet really um but blighty asks uh, thoughts on why uh, jasmine was warm to kevin smiley didn't look warm yeah we didn't hear at least we didn't hear christy or anyone doing the dissection on smiley uh comment on the fact that he was warm um, but they, yeah, they made a specific point to let us know that Jasmine's body wasn't all cold. I think a lot of people were expecting her to be cold because they are very similar to these kind of vampiric esque creatures. But um, mm -hmm. knowing that they're warm is it just knowing that they're warm just leads me to believe that they're definitely being powered or animated by some type of magic. They're clearly not warm blooded creatures. Hell, they don't even have blood in their bodies to be warm blooded creatures. So the warm aspect just leads me to believe that there is something kind of mystical, something magical that is really powering these monsters. I don't think it, they're, they're just made up of flesh and blood. Clearly they're not. Um, but no, that, that was just my uh, explanation on, I, I'm not sure why they didn't mention anything about Smiley being warm. Maybe after the body, maybe since Smiley was dead, maybe he wasn't as warm as a living Jasmine was, but mm -hmm. um, that's kind of the only thing I could think of really. But right, uh, right, yeah, right. I, I think they're powered by some type of magic, making them a little bit warmer to the touch. 
Uh, why do you think the monsters look dirty in the tunnels but clean when they come out? I, it, when we first saw those monsters down in the tunnels, they they looked very, very strange. Not once did they go into any of their human forms. Definitely, obviously, it seems like they sleep. Their natural it, you know, form is the monster form. But when those monsters were waking up, I don't know if it was because it was early in the morning and they were still groggy or it was because it was light outside and they're not usually up during the day. But it seemed like those monsters that uh, Tabitha and Victor were seeing down in the tunnel were just moving so slow and so sluggish and I, I don't know if that was just like i said you know what explanation is that for i have no no clue none of the monsters ever really run ever run or anything like that or move any move fast but when the monsters are in human form and they're outside you can see you know they're they walk at least with a little bit of a purpose they have a, a very clean walk to them the monsters that were moving around down in those caves for some reason they just looked so slow and so sluggish and who knows it could have been just because they just woke up and they were still a little groggy who knows yeah. but they're probably um, they, not accustomed to being interrupted either uh, like being yeah, woken up i don't think they're used um, to being up during the day yeah just like anything with the hibernation, you know, you need a yeah. you need a good stretch, you know, you need your, your coffee. Yeah, yeah, you got to get your bearings. You get your bearings. <laughs> but yeah, and, and I think on, honestly, like the gr the griminess or the dirtiness or whatever of of the creature form versus the the finished form, or is a is, uh, just straight up like a glamour or a, like a like you shape shift, but you also and in, in, in not only just shape shift, but you also have a a glamour over it or uh like a veneer or a, a um a vision i get i can't remember the exact word for it but essentially you're uh i'm like forcing anyone viewing you to see you in the a clean glamour. cheerleader form or yeah. the clean yeah the clean milkman form or the yeah. clean jack mechanic form yeah, basically um, a, a glamour of sorts. They 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 yeah. call it glamouring in in True Blood. They call it a glamour in A Song of Ice and Fire. Like Melisandre is able to throw a glamour over people, making them look different, making them look like someone else. And yeah, that has been a pretty popular theory that maybe these monsters don't even have a human form. That maybe they're just making people maybe making people think that they have this human form with a some form of glamour, which could be interesting. Yeah, maybe maybe they don't physically change. We just they just kind of manipulate your mind to make you think they change. Right. And, they, and I, like I mean, that theory. yeah, as messy as they are, as far as when they kill, when they make a kill, whether they're eating the person or taking the organs or whatever they're doing, the, and what is without a doubt is that they, they are throwing it clear up on the walls and everywhere around blood is everywhere. So presumably uh, it would, it would be all over themselves as well. And even after uh, like dismantling the, the kissing guy, Jasmine really had a drop of blood on her collar and Smiley had a drop of blood that dripped down onto Dale while he was like complaining on the stairs or whatever, mm. but nothing. I mean, a drop of blood is far different than like a whole wall covering massacre <laughs> mm, definitely, <laughs> where the definitely. victim's been whipped everywhere. So you'd think that they would be very, very, you know, they would be as bloody as the room that, that they're leaving. Um, but yet they're not, they're like, mostly clean or at least to the eye they're mostly clean or maybe yeah i mean and and going uh continuing on with that glamour why would smiley have so much blood on him that it's dripping off of him over the railing down onto dale and yet he's like still in his, out of his mouth again. like he did that on purpose oh okay okay like he okay. kind of left a little in his mouth just to spit it off the railing and fuck with people that's what it looked like anyway it didn't seem like it was falling off his like clothes Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, see, I thought maybe he was just so covered in blood just that it actually was it, just yeah. coming off of him. <laughs> you just couldn't see it because he was glamoured into looking like a normal thing. But uh, he, meanwhile, yeah. he is just dripping with it as though he had just spread somebody all the way across the floors and walls and ceiling. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely yeah, could yeah. be. Definitely could be. Absolutely. Um, um, yeah, just, yeah I, I, I just got a feeling that yeah, it looked like he was kind of spitting it out of his mouth and uh, right on to Dale, nonetheless, the uh, pocket dimension <laughs> Dale right below him. Yeah, um, I'm talking about uh, how I, if, if they'd only listened to me, I could really help these people. Yeah, right? yeah, Dale has got all the answers. He, well, I, I, I'm not going to front. If it turns out to be some kind of pocket dimension, people are going to be like, oh, shit, Dale was right the whole time. <laughs> Stories like this, I mean, as, as, as far-fetched as it sounds now, you know, mystery box style storytelling like this, they usually tend to give you everything you need to solve the story very early on. It's just impossible to see yet because you don't have the rest of the pieces. That's why once more seasons of this show comes out, 
and we go back and revisit season one and season two after season three comes out, you're going to pick up on some more stuff that you missed the first go around watching season one and the first go around watching season two, just because they always add a little bit more pieces to the puzzle. And it makes things that came before make a little bit more sense. Like I really am looking forward to that season one rewatch party that we're going to be doing when season one ends. I cannot wait to see some of the stuff that we picked up that we didn't on the first go around. Um, but this is a very mm -hmm. popular theory as well that has been circling around a lot. The flood theory. Um, I, I have been seeing that there is obviously there's definitely some you know, evidence, some kind of nods pointing to some kind of catastrophe flood potentially coming. I, I don't think that is the case. I think if there is a massive flood coming, I think that's something they'll say for like an end game to Type thing. I don't think we'll see any kind of flood at the end of season two. My thought right now for where season two is heading, it seems like all roads are pointing to this lighthouse. It seems like the lighthouse is going to be the ultimate destination for season two. And they kind of spoiled a little bit of that in some of the behind the scenes features, which we're going to uh, look at a little bit here in a minute as soon as my uh, internet loads back up. Yeah, my internet just, just came back, back so I'm going to go back. back. Hello? There you go. Oh, um, right, okay, there we go. oh you, got a, you got a real bad oh, echo. Shit. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Well, uh, Ravener will get that sorted, no doubt. Um, but yeah, the flood theory that definitely has some weight to it, without a doubt. There, there is some evidence out there that is pointing to maybe they're seeing some type of flood event coming. I know a lot of people seem to think that it might be tied to the Brundles. Um, which could very well be the case. We still know nothing about these brundles, what they really are, how big they are, how far back do these brundles go? Is it just a small little lake there or is it attached to a bigger body of water? Because of course we see the lighthouse at the end of season one. And usually when you see a lighthouse, it's because it's next to a pretty big body of water. That's usually the function of a lighthouse to either guide incoming ships, you know, to keep them clear of rocks and or to guide incoming ships. Usually those are the two cases. It's a, you know, a warning sign or to guide people in. But uh, we didn't see any body of water surrounded by the lighthouse there. But then again, we didn't get a great angle of the lighthouse. I mean, there could be a body of water that is just out of eyesight or maybe just over that ridge there. Um, it, it's kind of hard to tell until we get you know, another shot of this uh, lighthouse. But uh, let me pull this back up because the lighthouse is definitely going to come back into, uh, into play. Like, like I said, I have a feeling season two, it seems like all roads are pointing to the lighthouse. And anyone who has been watching any of the behind the scenes features, um, I'm sure you have seen this by now. Um, every episode, and I, ha I have heard a lot of people asking me uh, where they can catch the trailers and stuff. Uh, the trailers, both the trailer for the next week's episode and the behind the scenes features that they play every week. The only way to catch it is if you watch the episode live Sunday night when they air at 9 p.m. Eastern on the actual MGM channel. Now, it's not on the MGM Plus app. If you're watching on the app and hoping to see the trailer or the behind the scenes features, unfortunately, they're not available there yet. But if you watch the episode live on the actual MGM channel, in my area, it's uh, channel 323, I believe. Sunday night at 9 p.m. Eastern is when the actual episodes go live for everybody that isn't an MGM Plus member. So I imagine that's why they air the trailers then, because they're hoping a bigger portion of the audience will see it then, because not everybody is subscribed to MGM. So if you watch the episodes live Sunday night at 9 p.m. Eastern, as soon as they end, you will see the trailer for next week, but you will also see a little behind the scenes featurette that is very, very, very cool to see. Not only is it cool to see how they kind of built this town and, and built some of the aspects to it because they really did. And I have to hand it to the production, uh, the head of production over there, Matt Likely. He has just been killing it, building all of these sets, uh, collapsing the Matthews house. Apparently it was one of their biggest challenges. They created collapsible floor joists and everything and collapsible staircases. They really went all out for these scenes. But one thing they reveal in the behind the scenes features is this right here, the lighthouse. They went and they built a replica of the lighthouse. And I can imagine it's going to be for season two, most likely the season two finale or maybe episode nine. I don't think, I have a feeling it will probably be towards the end that we see the lighthouse. But uh, let's see. Oh, here we go. Um, 
but yeah, here we have the lighthouse, and it uh, it looks like they built a they said they built anyway a twenty foot by thirty foot replica of the base of the lighthouse. And as you pan up, the rest of it up here is going to be CGI, obviously. But down here, this is an actual practical set that they really built. And as you can see here, they attached a door to the lighthouse. So I have a feeling this is where season two is going to be ending. Someone is going to be traveling to this lighthouse. Maybe they spot it from the drone. On, on a bird's eye view, maybe a faraway tree leads one of our characters here, who knows? But I do think this is the ultimate ending destination for season two. I do think this is where we're heading. And I do think this is where Jim is going to encounter the, uh, whatever it was, whatever was on the other end of that radio. We yeah. saw at the end of season one, you know, Jim finally made contact and they made a really, really specific point in season one to let you know that these radio signals are only going to work if it is up very, very, very high. And I can think of few things in Fromville that would be better suited for a radio tower than uh, the lighthouse. It's just it's a perfect radio tower in right. and of and, itself. And this the lighthouse, I mean, in itself is I think it's just 100 percent a set piece for the progression of the story. Um, I mean, I know I'm not a lighthouse expert and I know people like to pretend that they are. But even like along a river, I, I mean, lighthouses are set on a coast or ideally they're set off Usually the coast, on a coast on like a little yeah. island coast yeah. or an island. Um, yeah. never, never on the side of Not a mountain, in the middle of the with woods. A river, yeah, yeah with sure. a river, run, you know, <laughs> and, and they're there, they have, I mean, when you're navigating a river, there's ways to indicate, you know, safe navigation on a river rather than having to build a gigantic lighthouse. I mean, what purpose does, I mean, <laughs> if you're going down the river, you kind of know where you're headed. You don't need a giant. Uh, light beacon to, to indicate, hey, there's a, you know, the river. Well, there's... some people think this might be an indication of that river that you're talking about here. And some okay. people think that there's more than one lighthouse that these little, obviously these uh, right here seem to be depictions of trees. They're the same kind of depictions of trees that we see on the talismans. But yeah. next to it, we're seeing these other structures and there's three of them. I have heard some people theorize that maybe these three are all lighthouses and these are this is how people used to get to the town before there was cars obviously people were arriving to the town by boat down this little river being guided by these lighthouses um and it's an interesting, oh, interesting. theory it, it, you know it's it's interesting um yeah and, uh, but i yeah. do think this lighthouse is going to be very very important i do think I just it's just a theory but i do think whatever was on the other end of that radio is up here in this lighthouse i do think that is their base i think that's where they are hanging out um, and I definitely think that is where season two is heading. It seems like I, I don't see them building an entire replica replica set of this lighthouse to just not use it in season two. If they are built this, if, if they built this entire replica, I have to imagine it's because it's going to make an appearance in season two. You don't build something like this and, you know, for season three, that just right. they, production right. just doesn't do that. If it's just going to be in one scene, that's the other thing. Uh, I mean, I know my internet was out when you guys were talking about the flood, the thing about, a, I mean, doing a flood is a costly uh, endeavor and there's nothing that will take a, 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 an inexpensive production into a very expensive production, like flooding out the set and trying to have, because the thing is you also have to unflood it or unless you're really doing it on like a sound stage or something. And it seems like they really like doing a lot of work in actual Nova Scotia or whatever. And, and I mean, are they going to wreck? Like, I, I mean, part of showing the flood is showing the effects of the flood and showing familiar places getting, wrecked by the flood so i, yeah. I um i don't know I'm, I, but that that theory has been coming along a, for a, quite a while I've, I've heard the flood theory talked about a lot i didn't see where it originated or what it came from and then when like ellis and i think it was ellis and julie were looking down in the pool either her, julie or fatima it was ellis and somebody looking down at that pool the swimming pool the emptied out swimming pool of the motel and then there was water in the bottom of that. They thought that the, the pool is going to overflow. They also thought that because Tabitha saw water down in the cave tunnels that um, that that might have indicated past floods or future like origin for a future flood, that kind mm -hmm. of stuff. Oh, OK. Yeah. Peter Griffin. Victor's drawing showed a flood. So I thought, yeah, was, yeah. interesting. OK. OK. That's absolutely worth it. Um, and yeah, but, a lot of people think that the boat is going to be the way out, that people are going, if they're going to find some type of way out, it's going to be by boat. That, that's a pretty popular theory right now. And it's it's definitely a possibility. I know, and I know Snug's, uh, uh, Snuggy seems to think that the Brundles could potentially hold the way out, that whatever the Brundles are attached to, if they're attached to another body of water or something back there, maybe the Brundles could offer some type of uh, escape out, which is definitely plausible that it could happen, I guess. 
But that's what's so great about this show this early on. There's so much stuff to that we just don't know. We're in the, just the sheer mystery phase of it, and uh, and I'm loving it. Uh, oh we got gosh. Luna Cascade in the house. What is up, Luna? It is good to see you as well. I think the season will end with a divided community, terrified and not having a place to live after the flood. What will they do? And yes, everyone, definitely let me know what your season two endgame theories are. Where do you guys think season two is going to end off? Where are they going to go? Do you think it will end off on a good note? Do you think it will end off on a little bit more of a grim note? I tend to think, I tend to think uh, you're right, Luna. I think season two is going to end on a little bit more of a grim note. I don't think season two is going to have a very uplifting ending and i have a feeling it is going to all uh lead to this lighthouse i don't see a flood happening in season two per se if a flood does come i have a feeling that's something they would say save for like a real end game you know scenario because once a big flood comes into a town like that it's going to be hard for them to use that town in future sets and stuff i just don't oh, see yeah. a flood coming until the very very end but I just, I just have a feeling the, this is where we're heading. I think this is where we're heading at the end of season two, this lighthouse. But uh, yep. that's just my theory. Yeah, it's got. To, I think that as a scene, as a scene, or as a, a background, that the lighthouse one hundred percent has to be addressed in this season. And uh, my my belief is we will see the big bad at least some kind of. Um, I mean, we've always heard, we've told multiple times. There's something worse in the forest than the monsters that we've seen so far. A yep. And and again, uh, Martin is saying they're the tip of the spear. Well, somebody's holding the spear. You know, if there's the tip, then there's somebody's holding the spear to you. So we're going to either get some kind of inkling other than just casual references or oblique mentions of these things. We're either going to see them or they're, they're going to appear in some way or we're going to get at least some kind of indication that they exist other than just uh, a sidelong mention that they exist. Um, so yeah, I absolutely think that that's what we're, we're going to see at the very, the very end. And, you know, shout out to all the, the channel members too, man. Uh, whether, whether they were gifted memberships or ones that you guys are paying for, man, thank you guys so much. Uh, t definitely take advantage of the, the, uh, the custom emojis. I mean, uh, Oh yeah, we got some putting... new ones. That's right. Uh, we, we got a request for a Tilly emoji last week, if you guys remember. And I, one thing I promised to do Anytime a member requests a custom emoji, I am going to do my best to try and make that a possibility. If it's possible to make it happen, I will make it happen. And yeah, we, we got a few Tilly re requests last <laughs> week. And lo and behold, we have some new Tilly emojis. And also we got some new smiley emojis in there. We got some new... Uh, we, I thought it was time. We had to have some Jade emojis. Jade is my favorite character after all. Had to have some Jade emojis. And of course, we got some ballerina emojis who doesn't like the creepy ballerina and i thought i would update the boyd um emoji a few people were saying that the other boyd emoji it almost looked like a piece of corn on the cob when it was so small on the screen just by the by the design <laughs> so i figured let me upgrade the boyd design too oh my god yeah <laughs> um, well, I, but yeah I, I think having introduced the notion of uh resource scarcity and, and actually talking first talking about the crops being destroyed Donna saying we've replanted them and then addressing it again in this episode with her yep. in the in the um, greenhouse. They're talking banking about, on those crops and I don't think they're going to come around at all. Yeah. So I think rather than wiping everything uh, and, and I think you're right, Jeremy, I think um, maybe the I mean, the the flood is uh, uh, wiping away the slate. The flood the flood is shaking the Etch-a-Sketch and making everything go away. I think if yep. they're really trying to torture these people or trying to amp up their anxiety and stress, we're, they're really going to lean into the resource resource shortage aspect more than just a couple casual mentions in a couple episodes. We're going to start yep. seeing people miss a meal. We're going to start pe seeing people get hangry. We already <laughs> saw the beginning of it. Look at what happened to with Dale and uh, Ellis. I mean, the, the food shortage hadn't even really hit at that point yet. It was just the, the notion of a food shortage was coming already freaked Dale out. So yeah, when the actual food shortage does come and they're down to rationing one small meal a day, you're going to start to see people doing some very stupid and desperate things. People that that's just human nature. People do very desperate and stupid things when they're scared. Yeah, um, Dale it's just way, how the human race is. Yeah. And he was way outside of his lane. Like the minute he got uh, Elgin trying to sneak food or uh, yeah, Elgin trying to sneak food out of there. Um, and he, he was, was trying like, to sneak food in. That's the thing. Elgin well, was he says to he was. I think he it. was trying to put it, it take it I to believe Sarah. Him. I don't think Elgin's like that. I, I think, think he Elgin's was, uh I think I, I think he's got a taste for the crazy. I think he thinks he has a shot with Sarah and he was gonna slip her some fruit by the foot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, we got a uh, we got uh, gifted five memberships. Holy 
cow. Thank you so much, Luna. Whoa, holy crap. We got gifted five new memberships. Oh, Jesse, so cool. uh, Jesse is now a member. Crazy Man is now a member. Let's see who else. Wow, holy crap. Thank you so much for the gifted memberships. That was incredibly generous of you. Wow. Um, wow, awesome stuff. You guys have been so generous. It's uh, it's very, very humbling. I certainly don't expect anything like that. I just It's it's payment enough just hanging out with you guys and talking about the show, to be honest. But uh, thank you so much. Wow. No, man, um, that makes, you know, that makes people's day too. You know, now they get to use those things. Uh, you know, other people do, but it's just great generosity. It's that, that the heart of this community, man, you guys are so, so cool, freaking man. awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Thank Absolutely. you so much, Luna. You are awesome. Awesome stuff. Um, but yeah, let's see what some of these people, uh, what some of these um, season two end game theories are. Cause yeah, like I said, I think season two is ultimately heading to this lighthouse. I do think that's where we're going to end the season off. And I definitely think you're right. Mrs. T, uh, Miss T, I, I definitely think it's going to end on a pretty grim cliffhanger. That, that's kind of where I'm at as well. Um, ends with Jim knocking on Christopher's lighthouse door. Now there's a nice thing. And yeah, next thing we know, we see season three start and Jim is just strung upside down in the lighthouse and he has <laughs> to get rescued. I definitely think that was a premonition. We're going to talk a little bit about that um, in a few minutes here because I have, I went back and I looked at Tabitha's vision and which is very much, I think of the lighthouse and uh, I got some stills. We're going to take a look at that and we see if we can dissect that in a little bit and see what we can see. Oh. Uh, grim and lots of questions. Yeah, I definitely think that that's where I'm thinking as well. It's going to end a little bit grim and it's going to be a little bit of a horrible cliffhanger, as Miss T says. I, I'm, you know, I think you're right. It, you know what it's going to be? It's going to be Jim knocking on the lighthouse door and that voice going, is that you, Jim? Exactly. Is the that same you, way Jim? You, know, <laughs> you actually way should be digging did. that hole, Jim. <laughs> that's it. That's it. There's my there's my prediction for the final. I got yeah. about 38 predictions for the oh, final episode. <laughs> really? That's the thing. This is the place to throw that tinfoil hat on people and just have fun with it. That's what I say. No theory is too wacky, <laughs> is what I say. Um, I hope season two ending gives us lots to talk about. Yeah, that's what I'm hoping to. I hope I hope like when season two ends, it's just going to have one of those effects where we're just going to be talking about this thing all the way up until when season three premieres. At least that's the plan. I know when, when season two ends, I definitely don't plan on stopping talking about From. I definitely plan on keeping the From party uh, going. I can't wait to go back and rewatch season one personally. I think that's going to be a lot of fun. Um, is the flood creating the Lake of Teats? <laughs> the Lake of Tears. Um, <laughs> maybe, yeah. We, we see a lot of liking it to not liking it. Yeah. Yeah, Lake yeah. We, we see a lot of references to the <laughs> Lake of Tears in season one. Um, I definitely think that is going to to play a part. And I know some people think that maybe the Brundles will end up being the Lake of Tears, which is a possibility. Definitely a possibility. I have a feeling if the Lake of Tears are a actual physical place, I, I don't think they are. I have a feeling it's probably more of a metaphor for some other place that's in Fromville. But I have a feeling if the Lake of Tears is a real lake, it might be closer to where the uh, lighthouse leads than actual in the town. If the Lake of Tears is real, it's going to have to be in a place where the, the characters have to trek to get to it. It's, it can't be in a place that's just right in their backyard. It's got to be a you know somewhere that they have to journey to, I would imagine. Um, my season two theory is that they'll meet the next thing down the tip of the spear Martin talked about an in introduction. And it, that's exactly what I think is waiting for them up here in this lighthouse. I do think when we get to this lighthouse, we are finally going to get a glimpse of the, you know, the next, uh, boss as it were. Cause yes, you know, Martin clearly made it seem like the, Mar uh, the monsters are just pawns in this whole whole scheme they're the tip of the spear as it were and we have seen so many chess references throughout the show that lead me to believe that yes it seems like the the people of the town and the monsters themselves they're just pawns ultimately in this grand kind of chessboard that is being played by whatever entities are in the background controlling the strings and i do think we're going to get a little glimpse of what is above the monsters in that lighthouse as well so i i totally agree with you 100 percent uh, grim note says Kayla Ames for sure. Uh, absolutely. I think it's gonna be a little bit grim. We'll end up with major deaths. Yeah, that's another question. Who, if, if, uh, who do you exactly, who do you guys think will not make it to the end of season two? If we get a season three, which I'm pretty sure we will, who do you think, uh, which characters do you guys think are on the chopping block for season two? Who, who will not make it out of season two is the question. Ooh, I'd love to know what you guys think. Oh, that's going to be a tough one. Yeah. I, you know what? I'm thinking, honestly, um, Anyone particular come to mind for you? Yeah. Honestly, I think Donna, man. I think no, everybody's don't say like, Donna. Don't say Donna. Because look, everybody liked her when she was like the badass because she was dropping bombs on Jim. She was dropping bombs on Boyd with her like snappy comebacks and stuff. And dropping, now dropping literal axe bombs on Randall. <laughs> 
<laughs> then she suddenly became nice. She was all sweet and nice to Ethan. And then she was trying to be uh, Tony Robbins motivational speaker to Fatima this last episode. Now mm. everybody likes her. The people that like the kinder, gentler Donna. And then the people that like the Billy badass Donna, she's dead, dead than disco, man. They're going to kill her. No, no, because everybody no. likes her. You don't think so? <laughs> no, no, and no, nobody, Donna cannot go. Not this early. Um, if I think, I mean, who knows? Maybe it'll be, uh, maybe it'll be, uh, Tilly. Maybe it'll be Tilly. Maybe it'll be good old Tilly that ends up going. I don't think anybody will miss her, though. I thought it was going to be a, <laughs> Elgin. I mean, maybe third third time's a charm, man. He took a header off the porch and got a shoulder sprain. Then he took a knife to the lung or whatever, the thorax, and he lived through that. So maybe third time. Because we, 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 when we talk about who's going to die, is the same thing as about talking about who who's the mole. It, it, you have to set up the the criteria, you know, what what reasons for and what reasons against. And I always, when we were talking about Fatima being mm-hmm. the mole or how Fatima died, we thought Fatima was going to die because the way she was wigging out like uh, uh, the first night after the bus people arrived. But then you're like, well, if Fatima dies, the only person that's going to be affected is El- uh, Ellis. But if Ellis dies, then both Fatima, who's in a relationship with him and Boyd, W- um, will be affected. So that's oh, yeah. two people yeah. being affected by one death rather than just one. And I'm not just friendships and whatever. I'm talking about like intimate, intimate relationships. The same way, I don't think Kenny can die because that would mean that the mom has lost both the son and the father, which is too much a uh, burden to bear on one person that, that we kind of see as innocent, I think. Uh, I think she's more likely the mole than... Uh, the. I think Mrs. Liu is more likely the mole than she is likely to lose both Kenny and her husband. So mm. I think that means Kenny's going to be safe um, unless the writers really want to affect multiple characters with the death of one. Um, I think, yeah. I mean, I don't want Donna. I mean, I think there's probably equal chance that the Donna is the mole versus that she's going to die, but I'll just throw that out there to stir up the, the bees nest. <laughs> mm. Yeah. It's yeah. I, I, I don't think Donna will go. I certainly don't. I certainly hope she doesn't go, but um yeah, for me, I, I was really worried about Ellis going into this season personally, just because uh, for that exact reason, you know, a show like this, I could definitely see them throwing a nice grim aspect into it where, yeah, you, you see Boyd losing kind of his last kind of tether he had to this town. He already lost Abby. Then he, you know, he, his relationship with, with Kenny was, you know, all but gone at that point. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, you know, losing someone like Ellis would kind of throw that perfect kind of wrench into a lot mm-hmm. of these characters' plans that would kind of tip things upside down and create that kind of chaos. But yeah. since and he decided, think- I, I don't think they're going to kill him off right after giving him that scare. I mean, obviously, we saw that big scare with Ellis in episode six where he got stabbed. You, you don't put a character through that and have them survive just to kill them off an episode or two la- later. So I think Ellis is one of the only characters that's safe. That's pretty safe. And the, the, the other thing is, I mean, yes, as far as stirring up the, the bees nest in the story, you, you know, killing Ellis would really be a shocking blow to both Fatima and Boyd. But then you look at and then you say, well, Boyd will have lost two people. That'll that'll really spur him to do something. Well, maybe what it spurs him to do may not be what you want him to do, because why would you why would he want to go back to the normal world? What, what's his incentive to go back to the normal world and be completely alone now in retirement? Now he's got this mm. boat that it was gifted to him as like one of the last things that. Oh, he'd be is, miserable. He'd yeah, be miserable. He'd, yeah, he'd live with those ghosts every day on that boat. So, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's pretty um, Cromanockle thinks that Donna, Marie, and one more will die. Okay, I think three people are on the cho- chopping block. That's and the kind of grim ending I wouldn't. Yeah, that's the kind of grim ending I wouldn't be too surprised would happen if we just see something like that happen. Uh, could the mole possibly be revealed? That's definitely a possibility. We, we could get some type of reveal of maybe a character in the town, maybe not being a mole per se, but at least not being who they appear to be at first glance. Ooh, I don't think the mole us, thing is going to, to be as town. simple. Yeah, I don't think the mole thing is going to be as simple as just there's just a mole in the town. I think it's going to be a little more as there's someone in this town who isn't quite they as they appear. I don't know if it'll be a direct mole or someone just pretending to be someone they're not, maybe. No, that's going to be I think that's a very powerful scene. I think that's a really good uh, prediction, too. Uh, it's a good no, cliffhanger to end it, the season on, too, to keep people like, oh, shit, what? Yeah, it won't because, be. Because uh, we well, Harold Perrineau, the actor playing Boyd. He saw. He said in an interview when he saw how season two ends, it gave him his reaction was, "What? 
really what like he had this kind of like crazy kind of reaction to it so i definitely think we're going to get a kind of grim cliffhanger type revelation ending for sure and and and, you know they can reveal the mole to us without revealing it to the rest of the town they can just show one scene with somebody doing super sus or doing something to sabotage one of the other uh people uh, people's efforts like that are trying to get out of town the same way i mean you could have a flashback of somebody going into the greenhouse and putting friggin' salt water or maybe maybe they're putting salt in the because they were putting spoons of salt in the uh like um what's the name to Ethan preserve, was putting spoons yeah, of salt it. Things. and she's like be careful only two teaspoons because we're we're uh, we have a limited amount or whatever maybe somebody took some salt and threw it in the damn uh watering can so then when they were <laughs> watering the the plants they they're watering them with salt water and you don't really know you know uh and uh <laughs> i was talking about that uh um uh, in the chat earlier about we who has access to the greenhouse and somebody said i think it was Seems like, like pretty everybody has it. access to it by the looks yeah. of it looks like that door is always yeah. open you may have to lock it down because they're, they're not really growing the food the cr- food crops in there they're growing this the seedlings or whatever that they should eventually yeah the greenhouse the is too small yeah yeah so yeah. um who knows man who knows but uh and, and i don't think it's just environmental i don't think it's just part of the evil of the the place uh that's killing the ma- no, it's ma- winter. making the things. It, oh. It's winter that's coming around, and I'm 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 almost positive of that at this point. That we're seeing that the leaves are changing color for the first time ever. Not only changing color, but falling off the trees for the first time ever. And they are really banking on this next batch of crops to really help their food supply. And I could see just as they're banking on that to happen, boom, we get a change of season coming in, and winter comes around, and those crops never come to fruition. As, that's where I think this is going. I, I don't think they're they're dropping those hints that the seasons are changing right as they're dropping the hints that they're growing more crops at the same time. That That's not a coincidence. Those two things are going to collide and it is going to be bad for the crops. I think. Right. I still think this, I mean, I, I think everything has to have, a. I mean, even in a world of magic and strangeness and monsters and stuff, I still think somebody, I think there's a human hand behind the, the problems in the greenhouse, at least in the greenhouse. I think that somebody did some could kind be of human sabotage, sabotage you think yeah i don't think it's okay. just because the air is poisonous or whatever now now the the season change i totally agree with you that's absolutely part of the world changing and, and that's also i mean regardless of whether somebody is speeding up the process by killing the seedlings or whatever any any crops that are planted are still going to be on that accelerated timetable that we've all been introduced to because the seasons are changing because the leaves are falling. Um, their growing season is going to be definitely shortened, which again is something that they've never had to contend with in that world, according to multiple characters, right? Uh, Victor yeah. And Victor's others. been there for at least 40 years and the leaves haven't changed once in the whole time he's been there. So yes, there's something is happening to this town that hasn't happened before, or at least hasn't happened in a very long time with this, with these leaves changing for sure. And I think it just could be, obviously we heard that we see at the end of season one, that this place, it's not just a regular, you know, slice of land as we've seen. It almost seems like it has a consciousness to it. It can physically get mad at you from what we've seen at the end of season one. Like this place <laughs> was physically mad at the characters from, you know, you had Boyd and Sarah trying to escape, which probably pissed it off. You had Jim building the radio tower, which probably pissed it off. And we hear Nathan have the theory that, if you try to if you try to escape too much, something will quote unquote push back. And the boy in white even says as much that yes, you know your brother was right about this place. It's angry. So I definitely think that this winter that is coming around is a it, it, it has to do with that. This thing is kind of bringing some winter around because these people are maybe I have a feeling these people are probably coming closer than anyone else ever has to solving or escaping this place. So it's only going to make the place that much more hostile. So I think that's why winter is coming around now and why it hasn't come along in previous years, because they're closer now to finding real answers than they ever have been, at least during Victor's lifetime. Okay. Yeah. And short of something catastrophic like a flood where they would wipe everything away, the way that the powers that be are going to just tighten the screws a little bit, make, you know, introduce, make it a little bit harder. Scarcity. Yeah. Re- introduce it, re- the scarcities. Yeah, and it reinforces Jim's theory as well. If he, if this is some kind of twisted, messed up experiment, be it supernatural or otherwise, you would definitely see the, these type of aspects being introduced into an experiment like this. Things that would increase the stress just to see how people react. At the end of the day, if this thing is an experiment, 
it's an experiment basically just to see how human beings will react in certain situations. That's really all these experiments are, are, are meant to be. Jim right. wasn't lying when he said experiments like this are very much real and date all the way back to World War II. They really oh, do. Yeah. If, if you look up in, you know, in, in our real history, look at, back at some of the twisted fucking twisted experiments that have been declassified because some of them oh, have yeah. been declassified over the decades you can yeah. see some of the sick stuff some of you know some of the nazis were working on and some of the other kind of dark regimes throughout history they, they were doing some really nasty experiments you know oh, yeah. I mean, into, look at our, into humans like this seeing how yeah. humans would react in fucked up situations right the tuskegee experiment all the stuff the cia yeah, did. there you the go CIA took the stuff from that the nazis were working on and said ah oh, that's a good start <laughs> you know, it was it. it wasn't you know horrific, and yeah, it wasn't horrific, and and it should be you know burned, you know, and removed from humanity. It's like, oh, that's let's see where they're going with that. Let's see what we can do. All the 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 psychedelic experiments and stuff, the LSD experiments. Yeah, the I mean, LSD and, and, experiments. It's and that isn't real. even. I mean, that stuff was the realm of conspiracy theories. Yep. Um, and, until they flat out said, oh yeah, until by the they way, straight we up doing classify that. all it decades <laughs> later, and they're like, oh yeah, by the way. 40 years ago, you weren't crazy. That experiment was real. Right. And the, Tus the Tuskegee experiment, the, I mean, that was the one where they uh, told uh, like mostly black males that they were going to be given uh, like uh, health checks and, and health care and medicines, I think. But they actually gave them syphilis and basically Oof. their whole and that yeah. didn't until I mean, I think I was alive by the time that ended. Like in, it was in the, either the early 70s um, okay. or like the first couple of years of the 70s that it ended and it started like. 30 something years before basically they just gave people syphilis refused to treat them and just wanted to monitor the progression to see of, how it would of, progress of yeah. yeah it's and, just it's, and I mean, it's crazy man literally it, it, it's unfortunate exactly yeah. it's unfortunate but that shit is real it, it you know you, you're not going to learn about that shit in schools obviously but you know there is a darker side to human history that i'm sure most of you know about as well yeah. uh, but yeah like like luna says the lsd experiments on unknowing soldiers exactly slipping soldiers lsd to see how they would react during wartime mk yep. ultra as doc Absolutely. hayes brings up look up <laughs> look up mk ultra after the stream if you want to see some trippy ass shit man mk ultra is another one but yeah these experiments are real. They re they did really happen in the real world. So it, it's not out of the realm of possibility, you know, Jim's theory. And, right. you know, where stuff like that would only reinforce his theory at the end of the day. The, the, the higher stress factor being entered into it with something like winter coming around or something right. like that. And, well, the other thing is, uh, I mean, following on to that is th uh, Jim's theory is based on what he's observed i mean his is one of the more realistic ones because he's basically he's a practical on man you know he's a he's yeah. electrical engineer he's going to try and quantify things that can make sense to him in a exactly. real world yeah so what yeah. he's seeing is exactly as he would i mean he's taking the data that he's been provided with and forming a theory on it and and espousing that as his theory the experiment theory whereas we're seeing like metaphysical stuff we're seeing magic essentially these worm uh, things that really defy physical reality like worms yeah. that appear then don't appear things that are dead uh, things that are completely mummified but yet still ha, have the ability to move at a pace and, and that's kind of stuff i mean he hasn't seen the autopsy or any of that kind of stuff jim hasn't but i mean he's he's putting it he's framing it in the world that uh, in his worldview a very uh, pragmatic worldview uh now these other people are seeing visions visions that have the ability to pass through their their into physical reality we're seeing uh you know boyd uh, you know, go, go evidently travel through time, not only travel through time, but also bring something that he, you know, he passes, you know, just the whole, uh, the whole tree, the whole faraway tree concept. He passes through a faraway tree, ends up in a well in the bottom of a dungeon. The rope appears, he flies, he comes up. Then he talks to this old man, gets uh, magical worms transferred into his neck, then walks out the door, but he doesn't walk out the door of the dungeon that he just left the old man at. He walks out the dun the door of a de uh, demolished building. A ruined which may, place may that not. looked yeah. like the dungeon almost. Exactly. Yeah. Yet he still mm -hmm. has a torch in his hand. He has the torch in his hand when the monsters are coming, and he has a torch in his hand when Victor opens the door to the peach truck and, and puts the torch, the douse torch, on the floor of the peach truck when After he, he almost bashes them with it when they open the door. <laughs> exactly, exactly. He's got it held up. He's getting ready to hit Victor and Tabitha, and then he sees it. Done. He's like, "Oh shit!" And he drops it. <laughs> and then here comes Elgin right behind him. So that as yeah. far as as far as that torch, man, that torch was there. And I I'd said this like I think last Saturday. That was his. That was 
that was the thing because people were saying, well, maybe all of this was up in his mind. Was uh, all of this? No, was yeah, the cut mind. on his arm, the the torch. Those were there to let you know this was real. Yeah, exactly. And that very final scene, almost a throwaway, but there the daylight comes. They all line up and walk out, and Victor sees the worms in Boyd's arm in the daylight. So mm-hmm. we know that it isn't all just in Boyd's mind. Um, yes, Victor saw them too. So. Um, we got a, <laughs> we got a four ninety nine super chat from Crazy Mad. I want a scared Jeremy emojis after that jump scare last week during the live watch party. I know. I mean, <laughs> hey, it got me. It got me. And and I, again, shout out to uh, Lion Mill Studio for for clipping my uh, reaction to that jump scare and posting it on Twitter for everybody to hear. Uh, very very fun <laughs> to relive that. Um, but no, nah, yeah. It was, it was Do good, I sound man. like that? Do I really sound? I was like, like that? shit. Is that what I sounded like? <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> Um, that was good. That was really good. But no, yeah, we can get, uh, you know, we can, you know, I'll, I'll do a face reveal soon and we'll do a Jeremy emoji at some point for sure. Um, <laughs> uh, but remember Donna said, it's like the soil turned to poison. The weather is not going to matter if the soil is contaminated now. Yeah. If the soil, if there's something wrong with the actual soil, then you know, the weather is just going to be overkill at that point. But, um, yeah, I guess we'll have to wait and see, but yeah, winter is coming. Indeed. Winter is coming for all of our uh, Game of Thrones fans out there. Um, can you kill something that is already dead is the question. That's a good question. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Can you kill something that is already dead? Uh, I guess it depends on what kind of lore you, uh, you you read, you know, what story you're going at. In this, in terms of from, who knows? Who knows? Um, it's team, <clears throat> it's two teams in from, in from the moon team and the sun team. The moon collects, the moon team collects points up from fear, pain, the Sun team collects points of hope, courage, and the other positive emotions and behaviors. Okay, I like that. Almost like it's like kind of a, it definitely seems like there is some kind of maybe cosmic yin, yin and yang thing going on here in the background. Maybe there's, it definitely seems like there's two opposing forces at work here that are, you know, opposing each other basically for, you know, control of the town or whatever the end game is. It hasn't really been revealed, but it definitely seems like there are definitely two, you know, kind of opposing forces here in this town. And uh, even the cave paintings kind of point to that is when you see the um, you see one of the cave paintings on the left looks like the uh, the symbol that Jade is seeing. And then the other one, you see that weird kind of big red creep, big red one. It almost seems like it's a representation of a yin and yang type thing, maybe. But uh, yeah, I like that thing. Oh, yeah. Um, Taryn, Math- Taryn Mathar is uh, gathering. Yeah, the there's a lot here. I got to catch uh, up on yeah. <laughs> to his theory. Yeah, yeah, let's let's catch up. To, yeah, catch let's up catch to up the a chat. little bit. Um, the community has worked on trust, but that's uh, changing. The mole has done things to set division in the community. Food supply, for example. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, maybe. I mean, maybe it's just that's the you know, if there is a quote unquote mole, we don't really know what the purpose of them is going to be. Maybe it is that simple, just to simply make the quote unquote experiment harder on people as it goes along. You know contaminate the food a little bit sabotage this a little bit maybe uh, yeah maybe that's the case yeah, just like bit that. by bit too yeah it doesn't have to be catastrophic doesn't have to be big to yeah tighten that screw tighten yep. that screw yep yep um yep winter is definitely coming that's when all goes to hell yeah i, I just i have i have a feeling i think that's what we might be ha- heading heading into here as soon as we see those leaves changing and leaves falling down especially since that hasn't happened in at least 40 years 40 50 years from the time that victor has been here yeah, it, it seems like there is some winter on the way, and I definitely don't think it is going to be a good sign for sure. <laughs> uh, we got um, Jade's uh, Jade's luck. He finds out how to escape through the caves, water, and it freezes over. Oof, that that would be Jade's luck for sure. <laughs> uh, Donna, uh, longest there other than Victor, photo with her sister, stole her story, and and corner mysteriously ripped. Ah, that's right. To hide the young Victor photo taken in from land. Okay. Okay. Oh, I like wow. that. I like that. Yeah. People have been wondering why that, uh, why that photo of Donna is ripped there in the corner. What exactly is it just a random rip or is it, is it, is it hiding something there? Um, could well be, could very well yeah, be. Victor's photo bombing everybody's, but he's, right? he's, he's photo bombing everybody. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, with autumn coming, uh, the uh, the crops failing, can the uh, can the survive on mushrooms? Maybe. I mean, a mushroom, a sole, a sole mushroom diet only must be. Um, I don't know how healthy that is going to be long term, but <laughs> it'll get them through a little bit of time at least. Shit. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, and, and even in a situation like that, whether it's a survival situation, any kind of resource 
resource shortage. You grow what you can, and then you would supplement it with the preserved foods that you had uh, from before, whether it's canned goods or or canned, like uh, like canning like fresh produce, like uh, in mason jars or actual canned goods. You you would probably try to grow or eat as much fresh food, live food as you can, and then only supplement. You know, because you don't. Because the thing is, once all Whatever that stuff is going gone, to it's last gone. longer. You're going to save for last. Definitely. Yeah, super long term stuff. You don't dip into that until it's absolutely necessary. Because mm-hmm. once that's gone, it's gone, and then you have nothing but your your livestock and your your fresh food and stuff. Unless you continuously can more, but they're not. They don't have. They're in nowhere close to a surplus where they they even have extra to can they're going to be consuming it all unless a whole bunch of those people from the bus end up uh dead you know they, they need to reduce the number of mouths i mean that's mm-hmm. uh, that's one of those practical realities <laughs> that you don't really want to talk about and and people like tilly would be like first on the list somebody who's like terminally ill um you know do you really want to waste a meal on somebody <laughs> yeah yeah i don't know i don't think that's a i don't like just knowing how boyd is his his kind of moral compass his sense of mm-hmm. morality as long as boyd is in that town i don't think that's an option he will ever entertain personally right but that's the kind um, of stuff that dale will bring <clears throat> up though these guys yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah if randall was in charge you know maybe mm-hmm. maybe but right. uh, yeah, as long right. as Boyd's there, I, I don't see them descending into uh, I don't see them descending into Yellow Jackets territory yet. Right. And shout out for all my Yellow Jackets fans. I just started watching um, that show, man. True. Good show. Yeah. yeah. Chat recommended it. And I loved it. I, I've already saw both seasons and uh, I'm thinking, yeah, maybe we start talking about that next as well. It's a really fun show. I'm down for that, man. It's a little wild. It's a little crazy. And always that's always the smart people, though, man, that are always turned out to be the psychos. You know, it's Absolutely. always the people that know how to do Absolutely. stuff. Absolutely. <laughs> Um, Ricardo P. Oliveira says the uh, hospital doesn't have a protection rock. See clearly on episode six and seven. Uh, it, it, it does. Uh, the, the hospital does have its own talisman. Uh, if you're referring to how Smiley was, was inside, the, the, the way the talismans work is if the talisman is up um, and all of the entrances are closed, then nothing can get in from the outside. But the second they open a door or open a window or anything, they, they could physically bring one of the monsters in with a talisman up if they if they quote unquote invited in. So yeah, uh, the hospital does have its own talisman. We saw that in season one. Actually, um, that's actually how Sarah, um, you know, Sarah left the door open for the monsters to get into the clinic in season one, so they could slaughter everyone uh, because it had a talisman up. Yeah, vampire invitation rules. See, and that's another thing. That's that's the metaphysical. That's the the magical aspect of it. I mean, yeah. literally, just the act of inviting, the act of opening the of uh, that the mustache guy opening the window was enough. Um, the little girl uh, Megan at the very first episode opening the window was just enough. Even when the mom's saying no, uh, and they had a talisman, uh, whether it's a physical act or the verbal okay, um, yeah, they get they that that evidently lifts whatever barrier of protection that the the talismans provide and at this point yeah. that is absolutely magical there's really no no two ways about that there's i mean whether it's simulation theory whether it's uh, virtual reality whether it's anything uh, you know uh, the, uh, even jim would be hard pressed to explain the workings of the talisman right in in mm-hmm. a yeah, sure. some things just can't be explained from scientific means at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, will we see the boy in white at the end of season, at the end of the season? I wonder. I've been wondering that all season. I, I, brought, I, I brought it up. I feel like every two or three videos, I'll bring it up again in my recorded videos just to kind of touch on it again. Because, yeah, like, where exactly is this boy in white? He was very present in season one kind of showing up when the characters needed him most the colony house massacre, right. When Victor and Julie are, you know, need somewhere to go right when the boy in the light is needed most boom, he pops up and gives Victor and Julie a, you know, a, a way out to the faraway tree. Sarah and Boyd at the end of season one, they're very much in a very dire situation. Sun is beginning to set They're They're going to be screwed. And then boom, the boy in white shows up, guides them to the faraway tree. He was very present in season one, helping our characters when they needed help. We haven't seen him in a single scene in season two at all, anywhere. Um, and I'm really wondering why that is. He, like, I definitely thought the boy in white was going to be a little bit more of an important fixture of the show going forward. And maybe he still will be. But um, I definitely thought we would see him a little bit more. It seems a little weird. We haven't, not only have we not seen the boy in white, but none of our characters have even mentioned him. We haven't heard Victor mention him. We haven't heard Ethan mention him. No one has even brought him up. 
And that was a little bit strange, I thought. Where exactly is this boy in white? And let us know in the comment section as well. Where do you think happened to the boy in white? And why haven't we seen him yet? Yeah. Um, Dale. And it is, uh, um, he's one that, uh, <laughs> like Sarah's missing and that's plausible that she's gone. But the boy in white, we've seen the Ankui kids a couple of times this mm -hmm. season and, and yeah. no boy in white. Now, here's the thing. And um, if you, it, let's, let's get caught up. But I do want to uh, circle back to the boy in white. Yeah, we will. Yeah, we'll circle back to the point of white, definitely. Um, Dale probably uh, Dale probably first after Donna. He knows some things. That's why Donna gives him uh, so much leeway. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Well, and, and and for those who don't know, the actor playing Dale and the actress playing Donna, uh, and I only just recently found this out, apparently they are uh, married in real life, actually. The, the actor playing Dale and Donna, they're actually a real couple in real life, apparently, which is really cool. It's really cool to see a, you know, a husband and wife kind of team up on a cool show like this, and it must be really fun for Donna to have those scenes of her just decking Dale every once in a while. Pretty cool. <laughs> Pretty cool indeed. Because yes, Donna keeps it real. She does. Donna keeps it real. Donna's one of my favorites. I really ho hope nothing happens to her indeed. Um, what experiments are the government doing to society now? Ooh, that's a good, good question. Do you think they use TV and movies for their experiment? I, who knows? Maybe. Who knows what the heck is going on in uh, these days? Uh, no clue, but it's a very good question. It's a very scary question too, um, and many folks uh, and many folks sued. I have family there were affected. Oh yeah, the uh, yeah yeah. And, oh man, if you had family affected there, I am terribly sorry to hear that, Tim. That's that's horrible, man. I'm sorry to hear that. My condolences. Indeed. Yeah, those people that were alive in in our time. I mean, literally. I mean, I'll, I'll say you know I was in, a child of the '70s, so if you <laughs> had somebody who was around in the '70s, '71, '72, maybe I can't remember if it was '72 or '74 that it actually ended. But yeah, I mean, you literally would have somebody who's not even, maybe your grandpa's age, but not some like, it's not something like, uh, even like lobotomies and stuff that ended in like, well, the lobotomies went on, uh, frontal lobotomies went, were like the choice uh, treatment for the longest time. But yeah, you find out about that stuff. And then you wonder why people are really, like, really hesitant when the government comes up to you and says, hey, I got something for you that'll really help you. And a whole lot of people are like, man, I, you know, thank you, but I'm going to pass on that. And then the government's like questioning. They're like, I just don't understand the reticence of this population to not accept our lovingly provided medicine. B bitch, look what you just did. <laughs> I mean, there's people still living with those effects. So yeah, don't, don't act like, uh, you know, the, the government acts like they're befuddled why people don't trust them. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, here I am off on my little, my no, little... It's, it's, you're, you're good. You're good. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we try to stay away from politics on this channel. Politics just isn't my thing. And yeah, I try to keep it to pure escapism, but every once in a while we, we venture into these territories. It happens. It's, it's, it's oh, cool. Well, uh, but yeah. no, anyone who is affected <laughs> by <laughs> anything, you know, definitely biggest condolences go out to anyone if they were ever affected by anything like that. And in, in, in particular, Tim R. Man, that's, uh, that's rough. I'm sorry. Um, what if the mole is unaware they're a mole that now that is another possibility as well. Like maybe there's like, obviously Sarah was clearly being manipulated by something she clearly didn't fully understand. What if there is a mole that is kind of being used in a similar fashion and they don't even realize that they're being used. Definitely could be a possibility as well. Uh, the town needs to have a meeting to discuss everything uh, that has happened up until now. Yeah. They really need to get all on the same page. There's so much information that everybody really needs to catch up on. Indeed, um, I think the showrunners wanted to center the story around Boyd and the math and the Matthews family. Yeah, it seems like the Matthews family and Boyd are the two main um, fixtures going forward. And it seems like I'm seeing. I know we're going to get into it in a little bit, but I have a feeling that this this lighthouse. There's so much stuff that is tied to the Matthews family going on with this lighthouse, and we're going to talk a little bit about that in a minute. Uh, when Boyd passed the worms onto Smiley, there was an electrical noise. Could the worms have done uh, that to Smiley's insides? Yeah, I heard a few people bringing up this this kind of uh, this sound that was being made when the worms were transferring. And I don't think it was electricity per se. I think that was just the, the show's audio kind of indication to let us, the audience, know that the worms were passing from one bo uh, body to the other. Because when the uh, worms were passing from Martin to Boyd, there was a slight sound there, but it wasn't anywhere near as prevalent as when Boyd gave them to Smiley. But um, I mean, it could be electricity, maybe, maybe it fried Smiley's insides. That definitely could be a possibility. But I, that, I get I mean, the I feeling. Clip, right? I isolated that clip. Do we just um, not want to play it? Um, yeah, yeah, we can. Um, I, well, I, where is it? I think, I, yeah, I think I have it still. Yeah, Bidey. I, I, you know what, another, another member of the chat mentioned that a couple episodes and I said, you know what, cause this is one thing that I will do just like taking the, the screenshots of the guy that wanted the map or whatever. I'll do this. I'll, I, you know, I know I, like Jeremy goes way above and beyond in, in, in producing stuff like this. And this is just my little, 
um, attempt at trying to be helpful and stuff. But yeah, I did. I, I isolated those scenes out uh, side by side and put them one to the other. There's definitely more of a squiggly. I thought it was like the sound, what you would think of a squishy, squiggly worm sound. When yeah, I think it's just the show's way of indicating to us the transfer is going on. I don't think there's more anything of, more than that. Yeah, um, but who knows? It could be silent. electricity. Yeah. yeah, but almost nothing on board. Uh, there's more music, I think, when uh, when Martin was transferring it to Boyd, though. It was more music and then a very, like the slightest hint of a squiggle sound. Mm. And you'll see you the squiggle sound, what I meant. I, I, there's no way they can, um, I mean, if, if people are allowed to do, like listen to whole music videos with, only the, the sound and do commentary on it. I think we're pretty safe as far as well, we, we just have to pause it every once in a while. You can't let it play for too long. Cause th they will, they will strike every once in a while. I just, it's just not something I want to risk. You know, I don't want to risk getting struck by MGM, yeah. but um, no, we'll, we'll take a look at it. Definitely for sure. Um, what did we see in the episode eight preview? Yes, we will definitely take a look at that next. Uh, let me, let me scroll down here to the bottom. Let me catch up a little bit with what you guys are saying. I know I'm really far behind. I am sorry. Uh, let me see. We've got some awesome stuff down here. Uh, Sarah's going to the lighthouse says Luna cascade. Yep. Could be a possibility. Uh, yep. We haven't seen him at all. Yeah. We haven't seen the boy in white at all. It's very strange. And it's, yeah, I thought he was going to be a little bit more prevalent in season two, especially after his presence was so felt in season one. Uh, yeah, I hope Donna, not a mole. Yeah, I really hope it's not Donna as well. Donna is definitely one of my favorites. I, I hope she's not the mole. Uh, the show from is the experiment. They, they, there it is. Maybe the whole, the show itself is the experiment in today's uh, timeline. Hey, I like that, Larry. I like your thinking. <laughs> I like your thinking. <laughs> uh, Jade's actor is also an amazing violinist in real life. Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, I brought that up in, um, in, in when we see him first playing. Yes, uh, David Alpi himself in real life, the, the guy is a world class violinist. So every time you see Jade playing the violin on the show, it's most likely really David playing himself, I would imagine, because, yeah, he's he, he's a real world class violinist. And even uh, Chloe, the actress playing um, Christy is a real uh, medic in real life as well. So a lot of these, it's, it's, coincidentally enough, a lot of these actors share the pr uh, profession that they had, um, you know, on the show as in real life. It's pretty crazy. Yeah, that was so awesome. And the thing is, they could have picked any song under the sun for, for uh, you know, because of uh, Jade's talent in in the violin, they could have picked any song under the, world, in, in, under the sun for Victor to have chosen. And for him to pick, Twinkle, twinkle, little star. That is like, that's like 101. That's like learning chopsticks as a piano player or, you know, when it's like learning... smoke on the water for a guitar player. It's the <laughs> first thing you learn, yeah. you know? <laughs> but the thing is, he had such a level of mastery that he could do Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star, not like a. And make a novice, it sound masterful. Yeah. So, so emotive and so much strength in that. And I mean, that was a tearjerker. I mean, there's, there's, there's some so, so heavily emotional emotionally weighted scenes in this show that mm -hmm. i mean if you allow yourself to get caught up in it it'll catch you it'll catch you you know because you're you're trying to put pieces together and you're trying to see what's going to happen and you're trying to solve something but boy if you let them get the hooks and i mean and they you know they're really good at it i thought it was really touching you know uh the scene i was talking about when um kelly had her head nailed to the thing and she wanted to say goodbye to her mom and they were writing down the letter because she yeah. couldn't, you know, didn't have phone connection. But this stuff here, man, uh, like that that scene with Victor and and all the emotional weight involved, and the way these characters, ha, ha, um, you know, really pull it off. There really isn't much of a weak link. Um, yeah, it's uh, so good, man. Yeah, the, the supporting cast, and I mean, the we cast know, is freaking yeah. crazy. Harold Perrineau is absolutely the anchor for this show. He he absolutely binds this whole show together with his powerful powerful performances week in week out but man oh man it's the supporting cast because you have so many characters that you have to balance and you have to give them lines of dialogue and man one weak point is really going to show uh, it's really going to stand out but these guys are nailing it man week this is how week. you cast an ensemble you know uh, some shows you know tend to have one main lead and a bunch of secondary characters or you can have a show like this where it's 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 basically an ensemble ensemble cast. Yes, Boyd and the Matthews family seem to be the kind of main focal points, but it's very much an ensemble cast similar to Lost. But yeah, it's nice to have someone like Harold Perrineau there who is that veteran actor to kind of ground it all, to kind of helm the ship, and as for lack of a better term. Yeah, I mean, there isn't a weak link in that whole chain. Yep. It's crazy. 
Um, what episode had Jim hanging from the lighthouse again? I want to look up uh, up those years. Yes, uh, uh, well, we have the years actually loaded up, and we are going to take a look at all of those uh, as well. Because I went back and I looked at the that that exact episode as well, because I was dissecting this Tabitha vision for the video that I uploaded last night. And anyone who hasn't checked it out, definitely after the stream, definitely check out my Endgame theory video that I just dropped uh, yesterday. It's basically just my theory as to where season two is heading. We'll talk about it a little bit here as well. But um, yes, that was season one episode, it was either eight or nine, I believe. It's either eight or nine in season one where Tabitha has the vision. Uh, I'll, I'll go back and double check, but I, it's, it's either eight or nine. Um, let's see what else we got. The boy in white will be back. The show has done um, a good job so far coming back to things. Yeah, I think he'll be back at some point for sure. Uh, Jeremy, you could hear the same sound when Boyd goes down to the basement in the preview. Ooh, yes, that's right. In this preview, for uh, the, we, we see Boyd going down there, and that is true. Um, how do y'all watch the show Saturday night? Um, if you're an MGM Plus member, Saturday right around midnight, the episode is usually uploaded right on the MGM Plus app. Uh, we did a watch party last Saturday, and last Saturday was the first week that this had happened. Apparently, there was so much traffic on the MGM app that it crashed in certain places, and it didn't upload for everyone. Um, it was it was available for most of us uh, as at, at the same time it usually was, but everyone, you know, for a few people, it wasn't available right at midnight. I have to imagine they're going to get their ducks in a row this week. I have to imagine whatever server issue they had last week is probably fixed by now. Um, but yeah, usually if you are an MGM Plus subscriber, if you're paying for the actual MGM Plus app, usually Saturday, just after midnight Eastern Standard Time, the next episode is usually loaded up right to the app. Um, and you can watch it right after midnight. And th that's how we did our live watch party. And that's what we're going to do again tomorrow night as well. So if anyone has the MGM Plus app and you want to come and hang out with us and do a live watch party, a nice late night live watch party, it's going to start around 1230 or so. Um, and we all we all get up here and we all hit play at the same time and we just watch the episode live together and then we discuss it when it's over. Um, and it was a lot of fun. It, it was very, very experimental when we did it last week. It was the first time I had ever done any kind of watch parties here on the channel. So I had no idea how it was going to go. And with the exception of MGM kind of dropping the ball a little bit on their servers, it, it went pretty good, I, I, I must say. We had a blast uh, for the people that were able to watch it and, and stay and hang out. We had a blast uh, talking about the show afterwards and watching it and reacting to it live. Um, so it was a lot of fun. It's, I'm looking forward to doing it again. Of all the things that could have gone wrong, we never, I mean, right? we would have expected it, it would have been something end. on our end. Yeah. yeah, it was literally Amazon. <laughs> it was literally, but the thing is. Hello? Ravener? Yep. Did we lose Ravener or did we lose me is the question. Uh, in the chat, let me know if you can hear me or if uh, Ravener is gone. Down goes Ravener, so it was Ravener. Oh, yeah, MGM was listening. <laughs> MGM was listening, yeah. Down goes Ravener. Uh, Jeremy's still here. Okay, so I'm still here. All right, I, I'm sure, yeah, Ravener, it's probably just having internet issues. I'm sure he will be uh, back as soon as he's uh, able to. Um, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, MGM was listening. They got us. <laughs> uh, awesome stuff. But no, yeah, if you are an MGM Plus member uh, and you are a paying member of MGM Plus, usually right after midnight Eastern Standard Time, the newest episode usually does load up right on the app. And that's how we did our live watch party last week. And that's how we're going to do it uh, again this week. And if you are an MGM Plus member, definitely uh, come back and hang out with us tomorrow night. We usually go live around, we're, we're going to go live tomorrow, probably around 1030 Eastern or so, which is an hour and a half before the new episode loads on the app. Just so we can do a little bit of pregame, discuss some uh, predictions and stuff like that. And then as soon as the episode air, uh, loads up on the app, we'll give, you know, we'll give it 15, 20 minutes or so. So people can, you know, have time to sync up together, go to the bathroom, get drinks, whatever you need to do. And then at around 1230 or so, we'll all hit play at the same time. And we will watch this sucker live and uh, should be some fun. Should be some. Yeah, fun. I, I, I love the irony of like complaining about technical difficulties and then having technical then difficulties. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, dude, but yeah, I mean that whole, that whole thing, it was awesome. The people that hung with it, I don't know how much of my spiel got, got picked up, but the people that hung with this even afterwards, and we could have gone so on longer. Fun. I mean, 
we wanted to go. Oh, we could have kept on going longer. We had people in the chat saying, man, if we'd have stayed another hour, they could have stayed. I think you said we're yeah, going to we start would've. a little later to make us yeah, more accessible yeah. to the European audience as well. Plus, yeah. I, I mean, the thing is, I mean, we're still going to be talking about this man for a couple hours before the, the thing launches. That's just going to give us another hour of longevity after it's over with. But yeah, we were light on the spoilers. I mean, you can say where the just things are set. Everybody and, saw it. Yeah. Yeah. And believe me, With you know, and, and you, like that, yeah. Jeremy knows and you guys in the chat, uh, if you don't know, I am so against spoilers. I absolutely despise them and hate them. Um, now, going over an episode that we've already seen, an episode that's already been released. I mean, the, it, that's up to you to like, uh, you know, avoid the spoiler if we're talking about that. But like future spoilers and stuff, I even avoided the trailers of the future episodes, that kind of stuff. I'm, I, I've actually softened my stance on because um, really it's just going to tell you which characters are going to be talking, you know, because they'll show you, a, you know, a two minute trailer and you'll see where the things are set. Because this next episode, I don't think it's going to be in the evening at any time. Right. We're still every all the settings, I'm not sure. the interactions that we've seen are. Or, or wait, we've had the daytime. Maybe it's going to be the ni the nighttime when well, the trailer uh, at least at least starts off. The only stuff that we've seen from the trailer is during the day, but it, it might it might lead into night as well. But just from the trailer, all the stuff that we've seen on the trailer seems to be taking place during the day. Yeah, and the one line of Boyd saying, "If anything comes up those stairs, run." Yeah. Uh, now is that a vision could that be a vision could that be uh you know who knows but who knows? it also could be something that indicates to boyd that something might come up the stairs yeah. and mm, i don't yeah, know let's, man let's dive into that actually let's dive into the trailer okay. and, and, and talk about <laughs> it because it, it, it is some interesting stuff in this trailer for sure um uh well 1609 definitely had witch trials in spain first thing i found yeah 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 and we're gonna look at those dates too as soon as we're done di we'll dissect this trailer for next week's episode and then yes we'll go right back to those uh, that spiral staircase vision we'll take a look at some of those dates because we have some theories that are going along with those dates as well but um the episode eight trailer starts off and of course the episode eight is titled forest for the trees so who knows maybe the uh, faraway trees will come into the play at some point or maybe it's a metaphor for something else but the trailer starts off and we see jade and tabitha are at the mouth of the caves and it's pretty interesting because we saw at um we saw it in last episode Jade and Tabitha are in the bar together and Tabitha notices the symbol that Jade has been drawing. And finally, Tabitha is at least sharing some information with people. She lets Jade know that she has seen this symbol before in the tunnels. And of course, Jade is uh, wondering what these tunnels were. And it looks like at the very least, we have Jade and Tabitha traveling to these tunnels in this next episode. Um, now, are they going mm. to enter the tunnels? That remains to be seen, but at the very least, they are at the entrance of the tunnels. And we hear uh, Jade say, um, "This." Uh, we hear Tabitha say, "This is where I saw your symbol." And Jade basically replies with, "And the things that come out at night are down there as well." And then it just uh, end scene. Right now, would she not? I mean, why would she not just oh casually mention that part? Oh yeah, I've seen the symbol before. It was down in the tunnel. You know, it, it's oh, it by the way, it's right where the monsters sleep as well. <laughs> You might want to lead lead with that little lead tidbit with that there, next time, Tabby. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I'm looking forward to what is, go what is going on here, and we're, we're going to see a little bit later on in the trailer. Um, it maybe Tabitha and Jade might not be alone. It might not just be Tabitha and Jade at this uh, cave. Maybe there might be a third party. At least I'm hoping there's a third party. Uh, but then we flash to uh, Kenny and Boyd, and Boyd is basically at Kenny's doorstep, and they are coming up with some type of plan to use the bile that they have collected. Obviously, we saw the bile get collected from Smiley's gallbladder in, in the last episode. And we we're all wondering, what exactly is this bile going to be used for? Is it going to be a weapon if you put it on a blade or coat it on something or on a bullet or something like that? And you shoot the monsters, will it potentially kill them? And that is, it looks like that is what Boyd and Kenny are going to be trying. Boyd tells to Kenny that we can dip bullets in the bile shoot the monsters from a safe distance and see what happens. So that seems to be their plan for this next episode. And I saw a lot of people, you know, having a lot of problems with just this idea in general. And I totally understand the <laughs> physics behind it. I mean, the second you kind of, you, you pull that trigger, you know, bullets burn incredibly hot. And I mean, incredibly hot. Any liquid that would be on would most likely evaporate super fast. But in instances like this, you just kind of have to dispend suspend disbelief every once in a while this is a show with monsters at the end of the day and magical talismans and shit like that so every <laughs> once in a while you kind of have to just suspend disbelief on little things like that or at least i do 
Um, but no, right. I totally understand people's concern with the whole bullet thing. I definitely understand the physics behind it. I understand your concern. But for me, I, I try to just dispend disbelief with little things like that here and there. Yeah, I want to see. I want to see what happens. Um, I am. Uh, I, I'm in with the doubters. I'm in with the skeptics because uh, just uh, just on the basis of what we have been shown. Now we know we didn't even know that blood that was chock full of worms was going to work, and now we've got a little squiggle, a little like droplet capsule, like a little bottle with dropper with a dropper of the one kind of liquid that came out of this monster, there is a 0% indication, absolutely nothing that indicates it should ever in any way be effective in any way. Uh, it's a shot uh, in the a, dark. Yeah. 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 No, I mean, given their options and I, and I could see Boyd espousing that as a, as an option or as a theory, just to kind of like, cause Christy was losing her shit after he came, she opened him up and he was completely, um, yeah. She was really dry. hoping for something. She was really hoping for blood to weaponize. And she was, yeah, she didn't take it well. Yeah. And I thought, that, I mean, honestly, I kind of felt that was one of the weaker scenes where she just uh, like suddenly just wigs out and starts stabbing it. It was a necessary scene to introduce the bile if the bile is a plot device. But it was just like, wait a minute, this chick's held it together so much. And then of all the ways that she freaks out and rather Pretty than just withdrawing or whatever, okay. she just starts stabbing, 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 stabbing blindly and just happens to hit the, the gold mine. That, that's like um, the Beverly Hillbilly shooting the ground and the bubbling crude comes up. Um, <laughs> you know, she stabs in this gusher of uh, bile comes out still absolutely nothing indicating. But the thing is Boyd uh, again, Boyd is the man that he needs to be for every situation. When he needs to be strong, he's strong. When he needs to be supportive, he's supportive. And he basically said, look, there's the bile. That's not nothing. So they go through the whole rigmarole of gathering it up and putting it in that dropper. And maybe that's Boyd still bolstering um, Christie's doubts about about everything being pointless. Maybe he's like, well, now I got this bile. We got to do something with it. So maybe that's his idea to to, I mean, even if he doesn't believe it, he's going to say it's a more sensible option trying to weaponize it just to keep Christy, you know, stable, <laughs> mentally yeah, maybe, stable. Maybe, maybe. So, no, but um, I absolutely. Yeah, it's going to be interesting I mean, to see if it works. Yeah. Yeah, we absolutely don't know, though. So, yeah, I could be completely wrong. It might be l the literal silver bullet, you know, that, that It's going to have need. a use. I'm almost positive that that is going to have some type of use. Is it going to be a weapon? Who knows? It's going to have some type of use, though, for sure. Yeah. And how much is it going to? I mean, if it's useful, how useful? How often are they going to be able to use it? How much bile do they need to put on a bullet to, to make it effective? How much is too little? All this stuff. And we really don't know. So you guys who are, are bile bullet fans, you guys may get the, the biggest vindication. Uh, feel free to clip this and shove it in my face next week when we find out, <laughs> uh, you know, I, you were a doubter and now... You know, I could be completely, completely wrong, but man, yeah. yeah. But it looks like they're going to try it. It definitely looks like they're yep. going to try it. So we, we will be finding out one way or another, that's for sure. So I yeah. can't wait. Yeah. Um, <laughs> let's see uh, what we got here. I have a Paramount Plus, uh, and the episode start, drops around 2 o'clock Eastern. Um, the time is up at MGM app drops, so I can join. Yeah, that's uh, that's the thing. If you um if you watch um if you watch from through Paramount Plus or if you watch it through Amazon Prime, it doesn't load up as fast as if you are a direct member of MGM Plus directly. Um, I, that would be my recommendation to everyone. If you're not a direct member of MGM Plus, I would highly recommend just subscribing directly to the service. Going through Amazon or going through uh, Paramount Plus is, is is fine too. But from what I've seen. It, when you when you are a subscriber directly to the MGM Plus app, it's usually there right after midnight Eastern Standard Time, and you don't usually have to wait. Like another one of our co-hosts, he subscribes through Amazon, or he did. I don't know if he's – I think he might have switched over now. But he used to subscribe through Amazon, and for him it was similar. It usually wouldn't load up until sometimes 1, one thirty in the morning, like an hour, hour and a half after the rest of us. So, yeah, Paramount Plus and Amazon Prime members, they don't seem to get it loaded up as quickly as the direct MGM Plus members do and it's only around six dollars a month i believe for the mgm plus app it's super cheap it's one of the 
cheapest uh, streaming services out there to be a subscriber to. And it's got so much good stuff. It's not, it's not like From is the only good show on MGM+. Plus. There's so many good programs that are continuing to come out on MGM+, Plus all the time. It's very much worth the $6 a month uh, that you pay for. But that would be my recommendation. If you're not a direct member of MGM+, Plus, probably sign up directly to the MGM+, Plus service. And that way you will be getting them right when they drop at midnight. But yeah, sometimes they don't, they don't load up as quick through Amazon or Paramount, unfortunately. Um, let's see. I commented on the last video. She is going to be the main villain for season three. Ooh, I, Tilly, I believe you, I think you were saying, right? That could be interesting. That could be interesting. Um, I've been watching season one again to catch things that I've missed, some extra content. Yeah, that's ex and I cannot wait until season two ends. Uh, and and that, that, that is our plan to go back and rewatch season one all over again from start to finish. We'll probably do live watch parties like we have been doing for the end of season two. Maybe we'll do that for season one. We'll just watch a, a new episode of season one every week and uh, discuss it. But yeah, I'm really looking forward to going back and doing a nice rewatch of season one after season two ends, because you're always going to pick up on some things that you missed the first go around for sure. Now that we have some more pieces to the puzzle, as it were. Uh, let's see what else we got. We got Edwin in the house. What is up, Edwin? It is good to see you as well. Good, sir. Um, I have Paramount Plus. Yeah, it drops around two o'clock for the Paramount Plus people. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And hello from the other side of the world. Hello, indeed. Hello, indeed. Uh, the next episode is definitely day. Yeah, it looks like it takes place during the day. I mean, will it fold into night by the end of it? Maybe. Uh, I'm not sure. But it definitely seems like at least the, major the majority of it is taking place during the day for sure. Uh, Jade looks like Tom did. <laughs> yeah, Jade is uh, slowly turning into the new Tom, the new uh, bartender there. He moved into his place. He's kind of trying to create a new distillery. It's uh, Jade is slowly becoming the next Tom. Um, how many days uh, do y'all think it's been since uh, the end of season one? Um, it's been four days since the end of season one. Uh, it, no, I think we might be entering our fifth day here in four nights since we saw the bus arrive at the end of season one. Um, yeah, I mean, it seems like so much time has passed for us because we're seven weeks into season two and you know, we've seen so much. But for the actual characters themselves, yeah, it's only been around four or five days for them since the bus arrived. Not yeah, a lot of time we, we saw, passed. Yeah, we've seen uh, what the, the first night was when the, all the bus people were in the um, were in the diner. And that was when the house fell on Jim. Yeah. The second day was uh, when they distributed the diner people. In the daytime, they distributed the diner people between the town and Colony House. That's how Randall ended up in Colony House getting in a conflict. So the yep. second night was Randall's first night on the bus. So we've had the night overnight in the diner and the overnight in the bus um, for Randall was night number two. Night number three was this most recent one, right? Where uh, where they uh, were... They had the con. The, it was started out with the conflict at Colony House where Dale stabs Ellis. They had the the evening run down to the um, down to the clinic, and then uh, so all that happened on night number three. The the Colony House, the, the Dale stabbing Ellis, the the run to the clinic, and then the urgency of the transfusion. So uh, Boyd went and killed Smiley on night number three. And then yep. this most recent episode was the the day of day number four. Sunrises, they go out and get uh, Smiley's body and do the autopsy. So yep. no matter what happens, whether it's day or night, this will be either the end of the day of day four and the beginning of the night of night four. Yeah. So that's it, how far it hasn't we've even gone. been a week for them at this point since the bus has arrived. It, it, like it seems like a lot of time for us, but. Yeah, for them, hasn't even been a week. It's it's that, and that's the thing. It's something that you have to just kind of have to keep in the back of your mind when you're watching. From I know it seems like a lot of time has go has gone by. We saw a lot of people in the comment section on my uh, latest video asking, "Where is Sarah? We haven't seen Sarah in forever." And for us, not seeing Sarah in two episodes feels like a long time. But in all actuality, in the show's timeline, it's been literally one day since we've seen Sarah. So she's most likely probably just settle, settling up into the church or wherever she's going to be living now. And I'm sure we'll see her again soon. But it's little things like that that you just kind of have to keep in the back of your mind when you're watching the show. Slow uh, Time is moving much, much slower for them than it is for us. Um, why is Kenny allowed to carry a gun when he's no longer a deputy? I think it's just a trust thing. I think at this point, Boyd just trusts Kenny to, you know, to be able to handle the firearm. And I think Boyd is hoping that Kenny comes back. I think Boyd is definitely hoping that Kenny will rejoin him and be a deputy again. We even see him hint, hint at that in this episode as well, where he says, hey, Kenny, anytime you want that badge back, 
it's waiting for you. So I think it's only a matter of time before Kenny is suited up in the sheriff's uh, uniform again. So that's probably yeah, why Boyd let him. Boy, but drawing that gun, I mean, drawing that gun on the unarmed Boyd when he wasn't dangerous, trying to force him to do the the transfusion. That was, I, I mean, any, like anybody who like does responsible gun use or anything like that, man, you just don't do it, man. You, you just don't draw down on people unless you really want like some kind of a response. So I did not mm -hmm. like that. I, I, that, I, I mean, the other thing is when you're confiscating a gun from somebody, you actually have to go get it from him. So, I mean, they pretty much have to give it to you unless, you know, you want, you want to do it the easy way. So yeah, I, I agree with, uh, with Larry on this one, Larry, uh, Quartowitz, it looks like, um, you know, I trust, uh, Victor with a gun more than I trust, uh, Kenny at this point. Although, <laughs> I mean, I, I understand your point too. I mean, to take his gun away would be a, like would be the final nail in that relationship kind of thing um, mm. to really strip him of every. Uh, I mean, it, what we're dealing with is Kenny losing trust in Boyd. We haven't seen Boyd losing trust in Kenny and taking the gun back would be losing trust in Kenny. So I think mm. you're dead on, man. I think uh, that is Kenny's redemption arc. Um, that yeah, is I think, uh, yeah, the, I think the sign Boyd's that just that, waiting on it. Yeah. Yeah, that relationship I think Boyd's just waiting on him to pick that star up again, pretty much. Yep. It, it's going to happen. It's definitely going to happen. Yep. Um, why not have a spear like Oberyn or an axe on the end of a long shaft like Hodor and cold it like the blades with the bile? Keep distance. Bile <laughs> remains intact. That I mean, it, it, hell yeah, you know, get get a nice uh, Oberyn style spear and go to town, Red Viper style. Hey, I'm all for that, man. Red Viper is one of my favorite book characters, indeed. And show characters as well. I mean, the Red Viper was good on the show as well. Uh, the same reason Victor gets to carry his gun in his lunchbox <laughs> exactly exactly that's right victor is running around out there with his nice uh, little looked like a little 38 snub nose special by the looks of it so yeah victor is definitely strapped um this is all a game between donna the witch and father katri the devil they both are parents of victor donna has a spell on the peaches to <laughs> On the peaches to forget now that there is less peaches, he remembers more. <laughs> That's pretty interesting. I, 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 this is what I'm saying. I love, I love theories that are, you know, theories that I just haven't heard before. Like I said, there's no theory that is too out there for me personally. Um, I like that. I mean, who knows? Yeah, Donna is the kind of witch. Father Cautry is the other aspect of it. And yeah, they've been kind of giving Victor these uh, forget-me-nots through these peaches, and now Victor's finally remembering now that they're gone. That's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> I like it though. I like it. That's I like I like out there theories. And like I said, no theory is too out there for me anyway. Um, but the point that this place makes, uh, but the point is that this place makes even that this place makes even the strongest break. Yeah, and we've seen that. Like like Abby, of course. Abby, of course, was a decorated marine, someone who who I imagine was probably very mentally tough in the real world. And then yeah, even someone like Abby was able to break here in this place where you know, like Ella said. Maybe, you know, certain people just aren't able to hold on to that certain aspect inside of them that keeps them sane and keeps them grounded. Some people just lose that that tether, for lack of a better term. And yes, they end up kind of slowly succumbing to whatever influences are trying to influence the people here in the town, because there's definitely forces out there that are trying to influence the, the town members. And we've seen that just for these uh, voices that are um, communicating with Sarah. They, they even straight up said they have been trying to communicate with the, with the people of this town for a very long time. But it seems like Sarah was the first or at least one of the first who was actually able to hear these voices and really kind of tune into the right frequency to hear these voices. But, yeah, there are other entities out there that are definitely trying to influence these uh, town members. For that, I'm almost positive. Uh, yeah, Victor strapped up. Bullet, <laughs> bile bullets, baby. Yes, lol. What the f? Uh, how he allowed to have a gun? I, it's I, yeah. I think it was just that. I think it was just the the, the trust actor there. Uh, showed up at 11 p.m. for me last week on the app. Yeah, last week it was a little bit delayed in some places because it, they had that server overload, which has never happened on the app for me and for us. Every week the episode is usually always there right after midnight Eastern Standard Time. Last week was the first time that didn't happen. They had that so many people were trying to access this episode right when it loaded at midnight that it crashed the servers in some places. And in some places it wasn't even available until the next day. Um, so I have to imagine they probably are going to get their server issues squared away. I don't imagine that happening again this week. So yeah, hopefully when midnight comes around, the, uh, the episode will be right there. Man, I hope so. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 
Um, and that's what we, I we hope do. So, yeah. Do that little delay. You know, we we say it's for a potty break or whatever. Refill your drinks and stuff. But we do try to give people a little bit of time. And you did say that we're going to probably go even just a tidbit later, right? We'll go a little uh, bit later accommodate. this time. Give some people some time to sync up and and get ready. Yeah, yeah. For sure. and we have man, we have uh, poor souls in Europe. You know, then they're up at three a.m. and and stuff. They either have to get up and they super don't even have access morning. to MGM Plus. So it's, right, right, it right, right. As yep. Canada doesn't either. It doesn't either. As uh, someone was just pointing out. Oh, um, and, and yeah, it's, I have to imagine if it's, uh, yeah, Jesse, um, I think Jesse was saying it. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's very weird that it's not available in these countries yet. Uh, again, you know, MGM plus was just recently bought. It was, uh, the epics network last year was the epics network. It was recently bought by MGM plus. Um, and so it is still very much a small kind of fledgling streaming service. It's just starting to, you know, it's, it's very new still. So I have to yeah. imagine that's probably the only reason why it's not available in every country that Netflix is available on. But as this app starts to get gain in popularity, as From starts to become more popular, which it really seems to be doing. Mm -hmm. I mean, anyone who was watching season one of From when it aired on TV, I mean, you guys know there was not a lot of us talking about this show. There was a small handful of channels and there just wasn't the big kind of fan, you know, demand for it that we have here in season two right. the show has grown so much in popularity from season one to season two i imagine the app is only going to continue to grow as well so i'd be very surprised if it's not going to be available in more countries pretty soon like canada and the uk and some other countries that it's not available in yet oh, yeah. i'm this sure is, it's yeah. coming it's is a, yeah, it's a Canadian production, so you guys have everything to exactly, be proud of. Exactly, yeah. You know, rattle, rattle, make some noise. Um, let let the people that need to know. I mean, it's one thing to make a comment in Twitter threads and stuff, but but talk to your your service providers and talk to your cable companies and stuff. Send out an email. Sometimes you know that it's just, it's cheap and free and easy. But you, it's so cheap and free and easy, you think that it's not going to be effective. But the more people we do, and I mean, we shot it from the rooftops and we say, you know, look, man, we don't know that uh, we still haven't heard that season three is greenlit yet. We've heard unconfirmed reports, but nothing from production, nothing from the cast, nothing from anybody who actually knows. So keep shouting it from the rooftops. Share it with everybody, you know, uh, your friends. Uh, family, anybody. And, and we've had almost universal support when people have said, Hey, I showed it to my dad or, Hey, I showed it to these guys from work and they absolutely love it. Nobody hates it. Everybody loves it. This is a very safe recommendation and people get into it. Um, but I mean, we had, we've had people in the chat from Argentina. We've had people from uh, All over Portugal. The place. It's been yeah. crazy. Man, yeah. say uh, wherever you growing. are. Yeah. The around the world, wherever growing. you are locally, uh, let your, your internet service providers know, let your streaming service, whoever it is, your cable companies, however you get, you access this stuff, uh, let them know, man, let them know that there's a fan base out there because they ain't going to know unless, unless they hear it, they're not going to know They're You know, they might, I think get... it's going to be coming regardless. Like, like I said, I think this show is just growing so much in popularity. I'm, I, I would be very surprised if MGM plus isn't available in Canada and UK by next year the latest i'm thinking that, that's just my, my guess and mgm <laughs> plus jesse. i know poor jesse i know i saw that it's just it's heartbreaking um it just sucks yeah it, it, it really sucks if it's not available in certain countries but like i said i i'm almost positive it is going to be coming to these countries that it's not available and now this show is only growing um but yeah keep an eye out i definitely think it is going to be coming soon and yeah like ravener said you know shout it out from the rooftops let people know you want this show let people know you want mgm plus and uh you know the, the more noise that we make about this show, the better. Uh, Rooster says, okay, hear me out. Victor saw and recognized the worms in Void's arm after leaving the truck. Did they not think about weaponizing the worms before? I mean, and that's definitely a, a, an interesting question too. I think I think it just comes down to the fact that Boyd just didn't tell anybody about the worms. Yes, I think, I mean, we're assuming that Victor saw them, but even if Victor did see them, Victor isn't the type to tell anybody. He keeps everything to himself. And Boyd wasn't sharing the worms with anybody until this sixth episode. It wasn't until this episode that he finally started sharing the uh, worms with everyone, e episode six, the same episode where he loses them in. So I think before that, Boyd just didn't tell anybody, anybody about the worms. So I don't think they had a, even a chance to maybe even think about weaponizing them. And at that point, I don't think Boyd was thinking of them as a weapon uh, of, at any means. He probably thought that these things were killing him. Um, so I think it was just that nobody else really knew about the worms until they knew about the worms, really. Um, but who knows? Who knows? Uh, Sarah, Sarah in the church looking for something to do after sitting around mad as hell that she doesn't have friends here, that she doesn't have uh, any more friends. Yeah, poor Sarah. I know, man. She, I, know. Uh, I can fix her, right? She's like the yeah. simp bait. Poor Sarah. <laughs> I, can, I yeah. can fix her. I'll accept and I definitely you, Sarah. Think, 
<laughs> yeah, and I definitely think she is in this church. Uh, I def- I mean, it seems like she was settling up in the church. She went and grabbed her box of stuff from the diner. It seemed like she was walking back to where the church was. I have a feeling she's probably going to be living in the church for the foreseeable future. I know. Um, will no Victor run either. out of crayons? Yeah, food. Yeah, yeah. yeah she's banned from the banned from banned the from diner, the diner. So no, no more. Uh, no more tea. Fish. No more. No more pancakes. <laughs> right. like nothing. Yep. Uh, will Victor run out of crayons? That's a good question. We, we did see he just got a new fresh supply of markers. Of course, the orange one was empty, so it was a bad gift. Oh but, my um, god, he was so funny with that. That yeah. was so funny. That scene. Yes, the, the orange one was dry. It was a bad gift. It's just such, it was such a thing <laughs> like a 10, 11 year old would say, and it's just, it's just, it's so funny. You know, Victor is just forever stuck in that 10, 11 year old mind frame, and it, it's kind of sad that he is. Obviously, he's dealing with some major trauma. He's got some major PTSD from everything that happened to him as a kid and he hasn't really fully it just he doesn't seem to have developed past that 10 11 year old age so it's just so funny to see a grown you know a grown man like like Victor just say you know the mark was dry it was a bad gift it's, it was oh, just hilarious yeah and, hilarious. and Ethan and believe me like earlier on even in season one I was a super critical of of Ethan's acting but they've been giving him some good lines and he's been really doing a good job and and the whole mm-hmm. uh, Victor and Ethan yep. dynamic I thought was awesome. Great when dynamic. The, the yeah. first time he came up and he apologized uh, for for letting uh, Jade take Victor's violin. Victor was still mad when when Ethan left, and that's why uh, when Julie was trying to sweet talk Elgin on his barber chair out on the porch, uh, um, Ethan just burst out and said, "Let's go home." And he was flying, so she had to leave. She yeah. kind of like uh, whatever, like <laughs> kind of C blocked him there. Um, but the thing is, uh, see, if it was if it was trite, if it was um, kind of like a, a tie it up with a bow, really simplistic story, then Victor would have like caught Ethan as he was turning around and said, well, it's all right. You know, something like that. But he didn't. He was like a little kid who was mad. And yeah. when you're a little kid and you're mad, you're mad. But that doesn't mean that you're mad forever. Yeah, so then you relent a little bit at the end. It's like, oh, if you want to help me measure, I suppose you can. Yes. One of those type things. Yeah, it, and, it was and, perfectly played. Like it was two 11-year-olds talking to each other. Yeah, yeah, and Ethan's logic in that too. It was kid logic, but I mean, if anybody's an adult, you 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 got it exactly. I mean, uh, how can we be friends if we can't be friends? Yeah, like, yeah. No. What? That's exactly. It was just a good <laughs> scene. It was just a, and it's good that the show has these moments of levity from time to time because a show, a show like this could really just be really dark and really grim twenty four seven if it wanted to, with just the nature of the show, the monsters and everything else. So it's nice to have these kind of nice character moments, these nice moments of levity here and there to kind of you know give us that breathing room. Like oh, okay, there's some you know some nice stuff that happens every once in a while too. Yeah, and the way they're writing Victor uh, so far, I mean, I'm I'm on board with it i i believe it and i mean and like they said i mean you can go back to the like you know uh like the forest gump and the um the what was the one uh, tropical thunder you know like never go uh you're like when somebody's like mentally challenged or underdeveloped or like frozen in time or in any way kind of like i can't remember the words that um that jim used or whatever like stunted like emotionally stunted emotionally stunted i think he said yeah, um like but you really have to approach that um in a real nuanced way and i think they're really pulling it off believably he is an adult obviously he is he does have you know he is at least trusted enough that they're not taking the gun away from him while he's sleeping in his lunchbox um but he has childlike concerns and the way he sees things and I, and who knows i mean the way he's kind of a loner even in the communal living of colony house um, you know, where everybody butts into everybody's stuff and there is no such thing as privacy. Right. He had his own little section and it wasn't just like a broom closet, man. He had a big room, right? It seems he's like he's enough... got the whole attic almost. Yeah. <laughs> man, so sure. yeah, man, that, that is really such a strong character and Scotty McCord is pulling it off, you know, flawlessly, I think. So super enjoying it. Uh, you know, that, that dynamic and the little, the little kid, um, Ethan has, made leaps and bounds as far as acting wise. And granted, you know, he's just a little kid and I'm not trying to be like edge Lord, like picking on a little kid for being a bad actor or something. He, he just wasn't, he was the weakest link in the earlier season. And, and it just by the, the process of becoming seven years old to eight or eight years old to nine or whatever, he's learning his craft as an actor and he's doing a lot better job as an actor. And I'm yeah, gonna absolutely he's like really elevated for sure. Yeah. And he's yeah. he's South African, so they they make him sound like a regular person. So that's got to be a task. 
No, that was me mm-hmm. being mean. No, he's got he's South African, so most likely he's got an accent, but he sounds just like a regular American, just like he's the son of Jim. And I mean, uh, you'd think he'd have more of an accent inherited from Tabitha, because um, mm-hmm. she has a she has a, a nice. I accent. think it's all it's all a matter of that's nature versus nurture, really. I think I mean, if you he, it looks like the, he looks like he grew up in the states, and usually it's it, it, you, you know your accent usually refre- uh, reflects the environment you grow up in most most times. <laughs> Um, Thank you for catching that betrayed king and Doc Hayes. I made my little South African joke uh, <laughs> that they're normal people. Um, Dana Marie <laughs> says, uh, when I talked about this show, literally no one knew what I was talking about. No, me too, especially when season one was on. Nobody knew what I was talking about. They're like, from? What the heck is from? Nobody had even heard of the Epic streaming service. Nobody even knew what Epics was. Um, but uh, every one of them now hooked, and we watch together and have pasta Sundays. Awesome stuff. And, and that's ca- kind of how it's been for us here. Just about everybody that we have introduced to the show has just been has has been falling in love with it both here online and in my personal life like everybody that i introduced to my to this show my family and friends all of them that i have showed it to have been loving it so far it's just it's one of those shows that just it's it's just so much stuff to get into there how can you not like it there's something there for everybody but uh, yeah that's how that i mean it's really good to see really good positive word of mouth really spread this show around from season one to season two it's been it's been really good for sure um, have any of the humans who lived in Frumland throughout the decades died a natural death, or have they all died violent deaths either by the monsters or by another human? Um, I don't think we, they've talked about any natural deaths um, that I am aware of. Every death that we have seen on the show so far has been a violent death. We haven't seen any natural deaths yet anyway. So, uh, yeah, not that I know of. Yeah, uh, plus and- the people making it are talented and impressive. I want them to keep working. Yeah, absolutely. And and I'm 100% with you there, Larry, when you said earlier, it would be a, it would just be the biggest shame in the world if this show didn't get the proper number of seasons to properly tell this story. Because just by the pace and by the way that they're setting everything up, they're going to need at least, I would imagine, four, maybe five seasons to really wrap everything up tightly and neatly just by the nature of everything they're throwing at us now and all the stuff they do have to kind of you know, tie up at, by, by the time the show ends. I would imagine they're going to at least need four seasons, maybe five. Um, and yeah, hopefully they, you know, it would just be a real shame if they don't get the proper number of seasons to, uh, to, to, to really tell this story. That would suck. Um, I'm late, but I have to say that the closing music at the end of your stream is the bomb. I just listened to it about three times. Well, thank you so much. I love the, uh, the, the intro and outro that we use. And uh, all credit of that goes to uh, our other co-host who, who isn't with us on the panel tonight, but our other co-host, Aldous on the Farm. He is the one who made that intro for us. And it, is, uh, it really has been great. It's, it's a really catchy song. And it's just perfect for the show of From, I thought. So, yeah, big yeah. shout out to uh, my co-host, Aldous, for making that intro. Everyone seems to really be liking it. Yeah, the song is called Sinner Man. It's all one word, Sinner Man. It's by uh, an artist named Nina Simone, but the one we use is a remix, so it's like free use. But it's yeah. called uh, Sinner Man, Nina Simone. It's from like the '60s, and my God, it's like a, um, it's like ten minutes long if you watch the the YouTube version or something. Uh, it goes mm-hmm. on and on, and it seems almost like it's a almost like a hymn or a gospel type song because essentially the the gist of it is it's a sinner man and the day of uh, reckoning has come and he's looking for somewhere to hide he's like work you know i run to the rock and i and uh, i can't hide you i run to the rock and even the rock says i can't hide you so uh, basically nobody's escaping their final judgment so it's this guy he's running to the rock the rock can't hide him won't hide him uh, he runs to the river he runs to the sea first time the river is made fitting. of blood it's the yeah. second time it's boiling so this guy is trying to escape his judgment is finding that when that time comes uh you know all on that day is a is a recurring theme in that thing in in that song uh he finds out man there ain't no getting away from it so yeah i mean i honestly i told aldis that that song it was uh, every bit as apt as the actual theme song for the show yeah they have um, the case to Ross Ross song yeah yeah sure. and that final it's song, just very fitting very fitting for the show yeah and the final instrumental part of the actual show the the one that the the exit th- uh, theme the instrumental one i thought for sure that was a song i thought it was so 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 familiar but from everything that i've gathered that is also a, an original piece for the show by whoever runs the music for the show but oh, man nice. it just seemed like i i it felt like i've heard that so many times uh, or at least somewhere in like a pop song and it may be like very similar it might be derivative it might be something but i didn't see anything in the closing uh closing credit theme 
uh, of the actual show that that indicated that there was anything about that theme that was um was not original to the show uh mm. part, you know uh, the the product of the music director yep. but yeah, yeah the music has been great on the show it really has the scores the song choices all of it has just it, it's so <laughs> fitting it's it really reminds me of lost in some points and and i love that i feel like lost had some of the best music at any tv show ever had um but yeah the the, the music they've been killing it in uh, the score department for sure um i just love what they're doing man the the, the whole aesthetic that they're setting up is really good um what do you guys think if fatima has her baby someone will have to die it seems like they always have people die and then the tree replaces them uh, who knows i mean is there some kind of uh, you know give and pull type thing here will you know will someone have to give their life up in order for new life to be created we see that kind of trope happen in fantasy often um who knows maybe that's the case i guess we'll have to find out uh, the actor is killing it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, I believe you're referring to the actor Scott McCord playing Victor. Uh, yeah, absolutely killing it. It really does seem like these scenes between him and Ethan. You're, you're, you're. If you're just listening to him, it almost it really sounds like it's just a scene between two 10 and 11 year old kids just kind of having a you know having a fight and then making up it's just very very well acted and if anyone if you've ever seen scott mccord in anything else or heard him speak in any of his behind the scenes stuff he's a, you know he's a very well spoken individual it just 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 speaks to his acting chops that much more the guy is a phenomenal actor for sure uh yeah the actor playing victor and Harold uh, should definitely be nominated for something after the season. Yeah, I mean, if Harold Perrineau does not get nominated for an Emmy, then he, I'm sorry, he just got completely snubbed. Um, I, I know that. I mean, I know winning an Emmy these days isn't as prestigious as it was winning it, you know, ten years ago or so. Uh, but if Harold does not get nominated for a ton of awards, then yes, I am, you know, I am crying, I am calling foul, and we are going to riot in these streets because he deserves. He just throw all the Emmys at Harold. Throw them all at Harold. Um, I love the scenes of Victor and Ethan. Yeah, I do too as well. Really good scenes. Uh, let me scroll down a little bit here. Let me catch up a bit. Um, awesome stuff here tonight. Uh, I'm familiar, familiar with the song and it's so fitting. Yeah, it's a, it's a pretty fitting song. Um, I was just shocked how younger people are so familiar with these older songs. It, it is pretty interesting, right? And and I, I find that pretty interesting as well that where – some of the younger generations, like, and I know I kind of surprise my parents all the time when, when they see kind of the music selection that I listen to. Um, and they're like, how the hell do you know about that song? And it's like, it's just <laughs> the oldies are the best, man. You know, if, if it was made after, you know, 85, I don't want anything to do with it at this point. Um, uh, not, <laughs> not literally, but, you know, the, some of the best music came out, you know, before the 80s, um, you know, up until the 80s. There's just so much good stuff back there to discover. If you have not discovered some old music and you're only listening to current day stuff, you are missing out. You're missing out on Queen, ACDC. There's just so much good stuff out there to describe. Johnny freaking Cash for crying out loud. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of good oldies. Yeah, there's a few things more depressing than, you know, you, you click on a station and it's like, hey, I know, that, man, this is, this is a great song. And you're jiving and jamming along. And then you get three or four songs in. And then they're like, 1037, oldies, classic. I'm like, oh, shit, I'm an oldie. I'm an oldie. It's like I'm only, shit, I'm only in my freaking mid thirties. How am I, I an oldie know. already? Shit. I'm an oldie. Now. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's uh, it's it's it's. I mean, yeah, the show is great, but yeah, the old music is uh, the old music is the best music as far as I'm concerned. There's still some great stuff coming out nowadays. Don't get me wrong. There's there's still some really really good stuff that comes out today, but the majority of the best and most classic music came out, you know, from you know from you know in the earlier days. But uh, yeah definitely missing out if you're not listening to some older stuff but yeah let's get back into this um yeah we get to this point now we're at the medical clinic and uh we see basically uh we see christy uh mari kenny and boyd and uh christy basically says there's something happening in the basement and uh, i know the way the trailer is set up it, they kind of make you think that maybe it's smiley's body down there or maybe smiley's back the, the trailer definitely the trailer definitely kind of frames it in that light but i don't think that's what's going on here i don't think what is going on here has anything to do with smiley at second glance i think something totally different is going on here might be nothing at all might just be someone sneaking around down there and it's just nothing but um, we see this next scene and uh, Boyd is basically about to go downstairs and he tells them, if you see anything come up this stair, up, come up these stairs, run. And it just, you know, the trailer frames it in a way where you're, you're thinking that maybe Smiley or something else is down there. And especially after you read the episode synopsis where it says a new terror is brewing. 
Um, so maybe this could be that new terror that maybe we'll get a glimpse of that, but I would find it hard to believe that this new terror would already be in this town in the basement of the medical clinic. Seems a little strange. I have a feeling once they do see this new terror, it's going to be in the forest or in the lighthouse. But um, yeah, I don't know. This this whole this whole trailer, this whole scene just could be one, you know, big misdirect too at the end of the day. Make us think one thing so they could do something else. Like they, they tend to frame trailers in certain ways sometimes so the audience will think a certain thing when they're really gonna do something else. But let us know in the comment section. What do you guys think that this was what that this part of the trailer was going on? Do you think this has something to do with smi uh, smiley's body do you think like what exactly could be going on here it looks like boyd is getting ready to go into the boiler room by the looks of it and i believe they did the autopsy in the boiler room so i think that's why the trailer is definitely indicating that this has something to do with smiley but i have a feeling they're going to throw some type of curveball at us and it's going to be something totally different but let us know in the comment section what do you think this is going on here and Ravener, let me know your thoughts as well do you think this has to do with smiley or do you think this basement scene is something totally different well, i was wondering if that boiler room wasn't also the same place that kenny's father was butchered because there was like oh, a yeah. water yeah yeah that's water right heater, it could right? be that room yeah you're right I was the water heater that. was yeah now forest for the trees is episode eight title um the same way belly of the beast was uh episode seven title and we got the autopsy but a lot of people thought um that also indicated the uh confirmation of the pregnancy of of uh fatima and and there's i mean there's about two or three different ways you could go whenever they have a, a title like this forest for the trees on this one i think it absolutely has something to do with randall and um and jim and their efforts with that drone um, but I mean, as, as you know, like the, the saying, you can't see the forest for the trees means you're focused on a, a small issue, a small when problem, you're not focusing on the real issue. Yeah. Yes. And you're losing sight of something bigger. So I'm thinking, yep. I'm thinking there's got, this is like double, triple, quadruple entendres. And we're going to okay. see those parallels, <laughs> uh, probably, uh, throughout this episode. And, and I think, uh, probably the, the, the drones flying over the trees, whether, I mean, whether they do a test run um or with before hooking up the antenna wire or whatever or whether they actually do hook up the antenna wire i think there's going to be some revelation out there just on the superficial level just on the surface level that that they actually finally get a, an above ground view of the the forest or what's out there um many people thought that they're going to get an above ground view of the car graveyard that victor may have unknowingly just parked these cars you know, dro drove him till he was done driving and parked him. They think an above ground view will give us those symbols uh, or one of the symbols that, the, mm -hmm. um, you know, the cars will be in the f shape of that when seen from above. Um, we might get a, a closer view of the lighthouse. We might get a closer view of the, at least the ravine, even if it's just a river or like you guys were saying, uh, referencing those cave paintings. If that lighthouse is one of three, you might see the other two. Um, yeah, maybe you know, it, some other ones. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. We know that the light is working on the lighthouse. The beacon is working. So when they're spinning around, um, the purpose of being able, you know, of a lighthouse is being able to see it from a distance. So maybe from that uh, that higher view, you, they're going to see multiple, uh, or maybe at least one other of the lighthouses. Maybe the lighthouse they're building isn't the one that we're seeing, or you know, very likely it is. Um, we still don't know how far it is uh, away because it was super far in the distance when. Uh, Boyd and Sarah saw it, yeah. Um, and that was when they were not only in the forest, but then also dragged unknown distance through the forest by whatever dragged them and then dumped them out. Then they got out, then they saw the lighthouse. Um, mm -hmm. which then he got bit by the spider, then he started getting all weak, and then they just conveniently happened to be right next to a faraway tree that dumped them back into different places. Um, and, and yeah, and I actually brought that up in my recent um, Endgame video. It almost seems like whatever was dragging their tent, maybe, I mean, at, at first glance, you think maybe it was dragging their tent just to throw them off course, or what was ever dragging their tent, maybe it was trying to get them closer to the lighthouse so they could find it. Because um, we just, we still have no idea what was going on with that tent dragging scene. I know we're assuming that it was something bad and nefarious, but what if whatever dragged that tent was trying to help them find the lighthouse because right the next morning they find themselves boom right within distance of the lighthouse and the light that's coming off it i almost feel like whatever dragged them was trying to help them maybe i have to agree if something's big enough or strong enough to drag you at a, a rapid rate blah 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 it, the talisman they, fell down so it clearly could have yeah. killed them if it wanted to 
Yeah, if yeah, if they wanted him dead, and your whatever it is, it's big enough to drag two people in a tent through a, a grimy forest, and you know, to for a certain distance. Yeah, if he if whatever it was wanted them dead, they would be dead. I think. Yeah, so I think it was trying to help them. Is, I yeah. I think it was trying to get them closer to that lighthouse. That's just that's just my theory. Um, but who knows? I, I could be wrong. Um, let me catch up a little bit here, and then we'll go through the rest of this trailer. You guys got some awesome stuff down here. Uh, can we, as a group, figure out how many people died in season one to see if the bust number has ooh, evened it out? Uh, that was a, a, a lot of theories of a lot of people in the chat as well. It seems like as soon as we had that, um, we have the massacre at Colony House in season one. Mm -hmm. And that we took 14. A ton of exactly people. 14. Yeah. Yeah. We, we lose 14 freaking people. Boom. Big Victor, slaughter. And then yeah. Victor dug yeah. seven or six graves when he was freaking people out by digging the graves. Right. And Donna mm -hmm. said, what are you doing? And he's like, I want to get a head start. Get a head start. But he was time, still yeah. eight short of what they needed. But yeah, 14 yeah. died. And then 25 came in on the bus of yeah. which. Those Almost like 25... it was a replenishment of uh, people in the town. But um, no, as far as how many people died in season one, I thought um, this could be an interesting kind of uh, sidebar for us to do when, when we go back. Because I definitely plan on going back and doing a complete rewatch of season one from start to finish as soon as season two is over. Maybe that could be a little side note that we do where each week when we watch an episode episode we try and keep track of how many on-screen deaths there are to try and get that number um yeah i like that yeah it'll be a, it's a little interesting thing to uh, do as we do our season one rewatch i think uh crazy matt says there's something happening here and what it is isn't exactly clear hey i like it i like it i like the cut of your jib uh did they actually leave the monster in? yeah that's the thing did they leave the monster down there we we have no idea what they did with smiley cor smiley's corpse when they were done with the uh, autopsy but if, if it was me i would have severed the head before i even did the autopsy but that's just me and as soon as you're done with the autopsy and you know you have no further use of this corpse get it out there and just burn it, burn it to dust. So it is not a threat anymore, but yeah, we don't know exactly what they did with the body. Is it still down there? Did they do something else with it? It seems like it's still down there. We haven't seen them physically move it yet. So I'm assuming it's still down there. Uh, and a couple people are thinking that maybe Elgin brought Julie in there to uh, see the body. Maybe the worms are turning into something else, which could be very terrifying. Uh, no, Smiley is dead. Uh, we can see Boyd and Kenny burning something. However, if you watch until Boyd reaches the bottom, you can hear that, some, that same electric sound as we hear when Boyd passes the worms. Yeah, when Boyd gets close to this door right here, it, it almost seems like he's starting to put his ear up to the door. And it does. It, it does sound a little similar to that kind of clicking sound that we heard when the worms were passing so maybe it's a hint uh, of the worms or who knows maybe doc hayes is right and is freaking freddy krueger for all we know who knows um, um elgin brought uh, <laughs> elgin brought julie in there to show her smiley yeah maybe maybe could be a hallucination too that is also a very very big possibility anytime we see some weird type of scene like that the it, that's always in the back of my head that maybe it's just a hallucination because there is a lot of that going on um, what if the night monsters were only level one and now that they are defeated, the place is sending the next level of monsters to, okay, I see what you're saying. Um, I, that would be awesome. I think, I, I think it is past time that we have been introduced to whatever is above the monsters. And that's the thing. Is there just one level above the monsters that is control of it in, in control of everything? Or are there more levels? Are there more kind of boss levels for lack of a better term, as it were? Are there the monsters? Then maybe are there whatever this Fatima kind of looking creature is. Maybe there's this other kind of ballerina type creature is another kind of level. Maybe there's more than one type of other being out there. I have a feeling there's probably multiple type things out there. It seems like the way Martin was saying it, um, there's nightmares out in the forest. There's, you know, things that we were never meant to see. It seems like there's more than one type of terror out there in the forest of other than just whatever is above the monsters. So I wouldn't be surprised if, yeah, maybe we're going to get a little glimpse of this next level some in some way. Um, what is your favorite line in the series? Uh, that's easy. That is easy. My favorite line in the entire series is this. All right, ding dongs. It's almost go time. Anybody fucks this up, you spend a night in the box. That is my favorite line from the series, personally. I, I love Jade. I love his quippy dialogue, his uh, witty, dry humor. And uh, that right there is my personal favorite line in the entire show so far. All right, ding-dongs. It's almost go time. Anybody fucks this up, you spend a night in the box. <laughs> and she's like, nobody's going in the box. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Raymond? Do you have one favorite line above all? 
Oh my gosh. Um, it's tough. I know it's a tough question. Yeah, I only but... know because I just uploaded that clip today because it's my favorite line. That's the only reason why I was able to have the answer, but yeah, it's, it's a tough yeah. question. As far as Let us know in the chat too, if you guys yeah. have a favorite line. Donna's had some pretty zippy uh, one-liners yeah. in response to these guys in the last time. Um, I liked, I liked uh, the, the line that Boyd had when uh, like Jim was, uh, I mean, like, he, yeah, even when um, like they're packing the food and Jim's like, well, why didn't you, you tell us, you know, why didn't you tell us whatever? And Donna's like, well, when we we're supposed to tell you, Jim, when, when, yeah. when you're under the house, that fell on <laughs> After you. After the house that fell on you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that was, that was funny as heck. Um, then Jim was like raking Boyd over the coals, like in one of these uh, more recent episodes. And, and he, he's like, and um, bo like something like, why didn't you tell anybody? Or like you came mm -hmm. back with no answers or whatever from your journey or whatever. And <laughs> yeah. Boyd's like, yeah. you know, well, somebody told them that build an antenna and told them that they're all going home. You know, it's like, oh, shit. Somebody built a tower, a fucking <laughs> tower on the top of Colony House and told everybody they were going home. <laughs> I love those those zingers, uh, man. Those are good. Yeah, there's, <laughs> there is, there's a lot of good dialogue and a lot of really good one-liners in this show. Um, yeah, I mean, there's just, just some great one-liners in history. Like, I mean, just like the what's in the box thing. I, that's one of the best, you know, kind of quotes that is pulled and that has been pulled throughout pop culture forever. The whole uh, what's in the box thing. Um, another favorite of mine, one uh, one line that will always be near and dear to me. It's a, it's a very favorite of mine. And I think I still have it here somewhere. It's, uh, I mean, this is just a classic line from a classic movie. I have come here to chew bubblegum and kick ass, and I'm all out of bubblegum. All out of bubblegum, indeed. And rest in peace to the great Roddy Roddy Piper, absolute legend. Uh, may he rest in peace. Oh, yeah, uh, Iron Sheik. Iron Sheik died. Too, Iron Sheik, that's right. Iron Sheik just Another recently one. passed. Uh, R.I.P. to the Iron Sheik as well. Yep, yep, yeah, yep. man. He, he's the one who great. invented jabroni. He's the he one who invented the jabroni. Rocks you're jabroni. right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the Roth the... may have popularized it, but Iron Sheik invented it. Yep. Yes. Yep. <laughs> oh man we're losing all the greats yeah, break your um, back might... <laughs> make you humble <laughs> <laughs> um it might actually work out perfectly considering the number of bus people uh dead so far yeah it may be and you know that's the thing we lost a good amount of people on the bus um when they when the bus did arrive a lot of them died yeah it, i think it'll be fun to go back and watch season one and see if we can keep just as a side note we'll keep an eye out for how many on-screen deaths we actually see um, let's see. That sound also seems to be used in the recaps and previews in the from social media reels. Ooh, okay. I'll have to listen to that. I'll have to go back and listen to that. Cool. Um, Jade's finger sandwich line was a great one too. Yes, that was a really good one. Indeed. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, that quote belongs on merch. It really does. I mean, yeah, <laughs> it really does. That, uh, <laughs> it's, it's such a great Jade quote. All of Jade's quotes belong on merch. A second favorite of mine, one that I almost loaded up, it's probably my second favorite line of Jade's happens this season when he, um, he, he comes into, uh, T, uh, into Kenny's, Kenny and Kenny's mom's house where he's been living. And he's like, he sees the Matthews family and he goes, great. Just when we get rid of those three hippies from Colony House, now you guys are here. It's just, I love Jade's lines. He's, he's definitely probably my favorite character on the show. Um, the orange, the orange was dry is the best lines that I've ever heard in anything. Yes, you're right. <laughs> Shit, that gift. really was. That was yeah. such a good line. <laughs> the orange one was dry. It was a bad gift. And it wasn't, it's just, it wasn't just the line. It was the way that the, the actor, Scott McCord, delivered the line as well. Anyone can kind of just say it was a bad gift. The marker was dry. But the way that he just delivered it, the cadence that he used, the mannerisms, yeah. you it really sounded like it was an 11-year-old kid disappointed with his birthday present. It was yeah, like so good. Yeah, like petulant, kind of just like, <laughs> yeah, like a kid, man. So, so, so good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I like Boyd telling Crandall up. Yeah, that was another good scene. Boyd, Boyd just gets back to the town and he even says, he's like, normally I have more patience than now, but it's been a pretty weird week for me. And he just goes off on uh, Randall. That was a good scene. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's in the box? Yes. What is in the box? Indeed. Yeah, I know some of our chat. That... Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. <clears throat> I was gonna say uh, some of our chat were were saying that that we need a drinking game for uh like oh, it, for the for the live shows and stuff. I I'm yeah. still a big fan of the it's fine. Anytime they say it's fine, it's going to be fine. You're fine. I'm fine. We'll all be fine. It'll be okay. Like anytime they say that, I think you should drink because you get that about 38 times an episode. We are all gonna be hammered for the after show. 
It's like, yeah, oh, it's fine. I'm fine. Don't worry. It, you know, it'll all be fine. You know, hold a the damn pillow on your rib cage. It's leaking out blood. Oh, you'll be fine. It'll be fine, <laughs> man. No, man, things are not going to be fine. It is not. Nothing is going to be fine. <laughs> Shit. Well, no, that's, and that is. Hey, if, if if the chat is down with that, I am totally cool for that. I'm not a huge drinker myself, but every time you guys drink, I will take a nice big bong rip in solidarity with all of you. Uh, I'm just not much of a drinker. Yeah, but, I don't uh, drink no, at all, yeah, but let's, yeah, let's get a nice man. drink. Yeah, yeah, Who let's get a nice I'll drinking say. game going with the chat and uh, have some fun. If if that is what the chat wants to do, as long as we're being, you know, you know, a little responsible, yeah, we'll, we'll have some fun with that for sure. Um, I like it when Jim asks Tilly, "What do you got in your bag?" <laughs> and Tilly's like, "You ask a lot of questions, don't you, Mister? I'm trying to get at my morphine stash, aren't you?" Uh, good old Tilly, good old Tilly. Uh, but yeah, let's uh, let's take a look at the rest of this. Uh, Boyd, uh, I guess we're just going to have to wait and see what exactly is in this boiler room. It could just end up being a hallucination at the end of the day as well. I, I saw a couple of you mentioning in the chat that maybe this whole thing is just another hallucination. Definitely could be. Definitely could be. Uh, we see Tabitha go up to Victor in the trailer as well. And Tabitha is basically trying to ask Victor to accompany them back to the caves. And it seems like Victor is very hesitant to say the least to go back to these caves. And he straight up says he's people should not go looking for answers when they do, they don't come back. And, you know, it's starting to seem like, you know, we, I know it's very frustrating that Victor isn't being as forthcoming with all of the information that he knows because Victor clearly knows some information that he is not sharing. And I'm getting, and I'm starting to think instead of Victor just not wanting to share, he's specifically not sharing this information because he's afraid of what it is going to lead to. He's afraid that if he tells Tabitha too much or if he tells Jade too much, it is going to lead to them ultimately getting killed or something bad happening in the town. I don't think Victor wants to keep this information to himself. I just think he is so deathly afraid that if he shares too much, there will be some really bad consequences. Almost like Victor kind of knows they're under some sort of surveillance. You see Victor and Jade in the uh, junkyard at one point, and Victor straight up says, you should not be asking me these questions. Almost like Victor knows there's someone or something watching them, and he has to be careful to reveal too much. It seems like Victor maybe wants to share but he's afraid to because he's afraid of the consequences. At least that's the gist I'm starting to get from Victor. But uh, I guess it's going to be fun to see if Victor does accompany Vic, uh, Tabitha and Jade to the caves. We see that wide shot of them, and we can't see Victor anywhere in frame here, but um, I suppose he could show up later. Maybe Victor says no at first and then ends up changing his mind and kind of meets them halfway through the episode and ends up saving them at one point. I can definitely some see something like that happening, but... Yeah, I guess we're going to have to wait and see. And let us know in the comment section, do you think, obviously we see them going to the mouth of the caves, but do you guys think Jade and Tabitha will actually enter the caves or not? I have a feeling if they don't, someone else will. Again, going back to the behind the scenes features that they have played on some of these episodes, uh, the showrunner, Jeff Pinker, has straight up said that there might be some type of answer or clue down here in these in these caves that will help Jade solve the mystery of the symbol. So clearly, whatever Jade is seeing, the symbol that Jade is being plagued with, there is some type of answer or a clue to an answer down here in the caves that they will discover or someone will discover. So that leads me to believe that, yes, I do think they will enter the caves or if not them, someone else will definitely enter the caves. And I think they will stumble upon something that's going to help Jade with this symbol and help us just overall get some answers because Jade's symbol is clearly tied to whatever else is going on here on a bigger picture, I think. But uh, yeah, then the trailer ends. That's pretty much all we get. And that's the thing about the trailers. They don't give you a whole lot in the trailers. It's usually only two or three scenes that they show in these trailers and then they cut it off. But uh, it's going to be interesting to see where they go. Uh, like I said, it, it, they're hinting at some things at the medical clinic. It's almost like the trailer wants you to think that maybe Smiley is, you know, coming back. But I definitely don't think that is the case. I think there's something totally different going on here. If this isn't an hallucination, which it very well could be, I'm kind of 50-50 at this point it being a hallucination or just being something else. Um, if this is real, I highly doubt it's going to be tied to Smiley. I think this will be something else. It might just be a complete misdirect at the end of the day. And maybe it's nothing. Who knows? I mean, when we saw Randall pulling the, you know, the uh, seat to the top of the bus and we saw him, you know, carving something, everybody was speculating for an entire week. What exactly is Randall doing? And, and I said, I was like, it could just be as simple that he just wanted a good view of the town and somewhere to sit. And it seems like that was the case. It doesn't seem like Randall was really planning anything. Or at least if he was, it, he hasn't enacted it yet. He could still be planning something. 
But I do tend to think they throw some things in there every once in a while, just so just to keep us spinning our wheels and keep us on our heels, basically. But that's just my theory. Um, yeah, but how could uh, they get rid of that actor? He's a fan favorite. Which actor? Um, I'm not sure. Which I, I, a lot of these fa actors are fan favorites. It's uh, it'd be tough to get rid of any of them. Uh, Donna to Randall <laughs> after the axe. Get your shit and follow me. That's uh, Luna's one of Luna's favorite lines. That's a good one as well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is a good one. Oh, there he is. Ravener is back. Yeah, um, man, I I like I'm going to take an axe to the damn Comcast here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's not giving me the boop when you come back in like it usually does. Usually when uh, someone enters the stream yard, I get, a, I get a little sound in the earpiece, a little boop, and it lets me know someone's in the backyard, uh, in the back room. But it hasn't been doing that tonight for some reason. Strange. Okay, okay. Yeah, and I'm getting the, the flashing light on the modem. It should be reconnecting shortly, but I'm just going to stay on my phone here because at least that's reliable, uh, you know, for the remainder of the show. I, I, I hopped onto YouTube just so I could uh, talk to the chat and then i was like oh no um you know what you know what am i going to do and i don't want to go in and out and in and out and that kind of stuff um but and then you were getting to the end of the trailer too so i was like oh shit so i figure i'll just come in and finish out the show like this i won't be able to follow you guys in the chat though um until my internet comes back and i'll get this squared away by the weekend for sure mm, but definitely, um definitely yeah i think sometimes they just leave stuff i mean i mean they left uh that randall with the question mark uh yeah in our minds for the last episode. Now we've got Elgin in the bathtub. And I mean, I think I'm a, of the 0% chance that that's in any way kind of real. Um, I'm way on the side of the people who think that he's going to wake up in his bed. He's not in any kind of water. He's not anywhere. Um, it's entirely mm -hmm. imaginary. It probably yeah. was. I absolutely believe it was Fatima, but I believe it was a nightmare version of Fatima uh, in the robe. Um, but it doesn't matter because it's not, none of it's real. None of it's going to be anything other than just a, a unpleasant night's sleep for, for Elgin mm -hmm. um, yeah. in this episode. Indeed. Indeed. Yeah. I don't think it's going to be real. I think, I definitely think Elgin is having some type of, uh, some type of ballerina type vision similar to Boyd was having. I don't think it's really yeah. physically there, but who knows? It could be very well. Could be. Um, we got some other favorite lines. Carrie's favorite one from uh, season one was when Boyd kept slapping that man that didn't nail uh, the little girl's window shut. Yeah. A man protects his family. Um, that was a good line. That was a really good one. I saw a lot of people yeah. quoting that line after season one. Yeah, made him look. Yep. Uh, Boyd, yep, Frank, uh, they made Frank father, look too. Didn't just cover his head. Yeah. 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 Uh, Boyd arguing with, fa with the fa uh, father Cotri about dreaming a better version. Another, yeah. Really good scene between those two as well. Uh, Betrayed King likes, uh, I like Jim's reaction to Randall's comment. That feel good. Just saying that just now. Yeah. Right. I know. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Jim goes onto the bus and uh, of course Randall is, you know, you know, well, you're welcome. But seeing as your wife wasn't really down there, it seems like you got those two guys killed for nothing. And yeah, Jim's like, that feel good just now saying that. Yeah, that was a good one. That was a really good one. Yeah. <laughs> and that's pretty rare for Jim to come, uh, like to have a, a, a good comeback like that. You know, he seems not, I mean, not like a wimpy, but he's definitely not. I mean, he is more of a thinker, more of a figure or outer, not a somebody with a quick wit kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so that was a good line for him. Yeah. Yeah, some really good stuff. Um, I told you who needed a drinking game. I'm so down with this as long as we can throw in some, Skywa some Skywalker <laughs> reasonably, of course. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. I will definitely have a lot of uh, Skywalker in my possession for sure. Uh, yeah, we can do something. <laughs> like I said, you know, we, we, as long as we have a little bit of fun, do it responsibly, I am totally down. Totally <laughs> down. Uh, drinking slash smoking game idea. Every time there's an opportunity for characters to share insane info with each other, but they don't. Oh, yeah, we'll be in comas by the end of the episode. Shit. <laughs> oh, my God. I yes. like that, though. I do like that. That's, that could be a good one. That could be a good one. And it happens way too. I mean, like even when like Fatima was going to tell Ellis that she's pregnant, then there's a hubbub downstairs. That's when Ellis ends up. That's when, um, that, that's when um, Dale was yelling at Elgin. Uh, that's what interrupted their conversation there. Um, you know, and it was, it was another, I'll, I'll be it, like, it, it's fine. And, and Ellis straight up says, whenever you say something's fine, that means something not, that it's, it's not, not fine. fine. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but then whatever they were talking about got interrupted because of the, the ruckus downstairs, which ended yeah. up being the ruckus that ended up getting Ellis stabbed and that mm -hmm. whole conversation ended. But yeah, man, they get in anytime, anything critical, there's always something in the background causing that, that causes the inter the interruption or you know anytime they're about to make a thing make a progress there's some kind of interruption i could not believe tabitha was like 
it, like we talked about earlier in the, this episode, it's like when you're sitting there talking with Jade about, oh yeah, I saw this symbol in the caves, and now we're not even until the next episode trailer. Oh yeah, by the way, yeah, we're gonna go take a look at that symbol in the caves, but we're already at the caves. But oh yeah, by the way, these things are you know those creatures are down there too. Mm, man, you might want to lead with that one. Um, and that's a good one for the chat too, guys. You guys, everybody in the chat, and uh, leave it in the comments section or leave it in the thing. If you had four people, no, like knowing the people and knowing the information that they had, and you can only take four people down into the caves with you, who's your dream team? Who's your four-man crew? Uh, who's yeah. your Captain Kirk? Who's your Spock? Who's your Scotty? And who's your uh, McCoy? Um, <laughs> when, and, and no red shirts in the, on this on this ground mission. Uh, who yeah. do you take down in there? You need, you need your um, stars for this one. This is the dream team. Yeah. I, well, yeah, I'm taking and, Boyd. I, you, you mean like, so me and four others, so five in total? Um, no, I, I was going to keep it to four just because, I mean, we would oh, round. Yeah, yeah, throw in five. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. I'm picking Boyd. Definitely, obviously, that's, I think that's the obvious. Oh, obvious no, you pick. can do five. Yeah, four, you're four people. I thought I was just going to send four people down there. I wasn't going to go myself. Hey, fuck, I ain't going down in there. Oh, no, so you, you can. Gotta there you too, can go by. It's, got, it, it, it's not the dream team if you're not there as well. Shit. Um, I'm taking, because if, okay. I'm, going in, you if I'm going down into these caves, I, I'm, I'm wanting to do it with a squad that I know we have some certain aspects covered. So I'm going to take Boyd. And next to Boyd, it seems like Kenny is maybe the only other one with good firearm training. Um, so I'm definitely going to take Boyd and I'm probably going to take Kenny just for the muscle aspect. Um, I'm mm -hmm. going to definitely going to take Jade and Victor are going to be my other two for the clues aspect. That's my dream team right there. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's a, that's a good one. That's a good one for sure. Yeah. Cause yeah. that's the other thing. And, and, and my mind, honestly, um, again, we always talk about, there are no throwaway lines. There are no insignificant lines. Jade making better tasting alcohol. My mind went directly to Molotov cocktails. So I'm thinking it's going to, it's better tasting, but it's also probably purer as a result of that. And we know that Tom was making vodka. So if you purify your vodka, make it less crappy, uh, ideally it will be better, better distilled, higher alcohol content, more flammable. I went directly to Mol Molotov cocktails and we already know he has an ass load of empty bottles sitting around because he made a big giant symbol out of all of them. Um, you fill those with your high octane alcohol and you've got Molotov cocktails enough, you know, for everybody, you know, everybody in town and then some. So I was thinking about, I mean, I'm still thinking about taking the fight to the, to the creatures using fl flames in the tunnels. Um, but man, yeah, I, I guess, yeah. And I think, I uh, mean, your, your, your team is just about right though. I mean, I can't really see, uh, other than you know like victor really needs to get on board sharing info we probably need to pick his brain before we get down in there um but yeah jade jade for his, like his technical knowledge um I, I don't know about kenny as far as muscle he uh he does have the high waters so if the the tunnels ever start flooding then he'll he'll be he's well equipped for that <laughs> but yeah, yeah who else would you think Which, uh, Tabitha? she's been down there before yeah, yeah, Tabitha. I mean, well, I, I, yeah, Tabitha for maybe you know navigation, but I, I would have that uh, covered with Victor. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, the, yeah, it's there's just so many people to choose from. There's a lot of people in the town that you could potentially uh, form a nice, you know, form a nice little team with. Um, when Victor unless told me, then yeah, unless there's a, a ventriloquist dummy down there, and then Victor Ooh. goes catatonic. Yeah, right. Yeah, well, it is down there. I mean, and that's, the, <laughs> and that's the other thing. We do need to get that tied up at some point. And I, I do have a feeling it will be revealed at some point that that ventriloquist did, in fact, uh, belong to Christopher. And maybe that's how yep. Christopher used to make the, you know, we heard Victor say that Christopher, you, you know, he was a nice guy. He smiled a lot. He used to make people in the town laugh which is something mm -hmm. that was not easy to do. So I have a feeling that this ventriloquist dummy did originally belong to Christopher. And that's probably why it is sending Victor into such a crazed scare when he sees it. Cause it's probably taking Victor right back to that night when maybe his mother ran up to him and said, go find and go hide somewhere where Christopher can't find you. Um, it yep. seems like that was a major trigger for him. I would say. Yeah, that's absolutely a solid theory. I think uh, the, yeah. Uh, um, Christopher as the ventrilo a ventriloquist, absolutely. And, uh, now the only the only thing far fetched is that anybody ever liked a ventriloquist, um, you know, at any point. But because <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, those things freak everybody out always. 
I creepy think, dolls. But... They're just creepy dolls <laughs> by nature. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're, they're incredibly creepy. Uh, they're so creepy. In fact, that we have even kind of made this imaginary, this, there's this imaginary doll out there called Danny. That is our, uh, our arch nemesis. He tries to ruin all our fun all the time. And it's a very weird looking ventriloquist doll. They, ventri they just give you that creepy unsettling look, those dolls. They, they're just creepy by nature, I guess. Yeah, um, yeah, Orlando has a fun. Oh, okay, yeah, go ahead. I just want to catch up a little bit. I don't want to fall too far behind. Um, Jade, uh, Jade yelling at Donna in episode one after he finally getting the attention. There is a bus parked outside the diner. Yeah, that was good. That was another good one as well. <laughs> that is, yeah, for sure, for sure. Uh, yeah, good stuff. Uh, do you want <laughs> some tea? There's another one. There's another one. <laughs> Best line is, do you want some tea? Yeah, and we hear it a lot. We definitely hear it a lot. That's for sure. Uh, thank you, Larry. I really love the show. Yeah, I, absolutely. And I loved Lost as well, too. I, I saw a few of you talking about Lost as well. I mean, I, I know some people have their problems with Lost, thinking that saying that it didn't really provide answers, which I think is just factually incorrect, uh, personally. <laughs> um, I, I've, I've just I've made it a kind of personal crusade of mine to try and defend Lost as much as I can, because people I mean, it's it's totally fine if you didn't like the ending of Lost. That is a completely fair criticism. But to say Lost didn't provide answers is just factually incorrect. At the end of the day, we found out what the island was. We found out what the, what the islands, why it was special, why they were brought there, what made them special, the source of the island's power, Jacob's origin, the smoke monster origin, the Dharma initiative. Virtually everything on that show got an answer at the end. by the end. Now, if you didn't like the, the answers, that's totally valid. That is a totally fair criticism. But uh, yeah, to, I, I, to say Lost didn't provide answers is just, it's like, were people watching the same show as me? Of course it provided answers. Yeah, um, I don't but know. That's just I never, yeah, I never watched Lost, and I don't know what I was doing in that time period. It's like sometimes when you don't see Friends or, um, you know, like different ones. Uh, I never saw like Malcolm in the Middle, and I don't know what I where I was in my life when, but I just wasn't in a place where I was watching a, a TV show on a weekly basis that went on, you know, season after season. So mm -hmm. I'm not exactly sure. It never, it, it didn't catch me. Like certain people will watch, like like there's, um. TV series that become like iconic of the time, really, you know, um, yeah, like, even like, like a Sopranos, like a lost, very lost was very much in that category as well. Yeah. Yeah. And I never, never got into it or I might've gotten into it way too late. So it was kind of daunting to have all those seasons in front of me. And right at this point, you know, I'm getting caught up with, uh, like you mentioned, yellow jackets earlier, and I'd be mm -hmm. totally down with, with following along with yellow jackets. That was a little trippy. Um, yeah, that's it's good. It's a good show so far, and and it's very it's left very ambiguous as to is this really some magical force, dark force that's following them, or is it really all in their heads? It's very yeah. ambiguous the way they play with the mystical aspect of Yellow Jackets. It's, I like what they're doing for sure. Yeah, and Silo, uh, Silo is another one. I've gotten two episodes <clears throat> in. Um, Silo's good. I just started watching Silo too. I'm on episode four. Yeah, like this it one, a lot. We'll talk a little one, bit about Silo too after season two of From Ends because I know a lot of you in the chat have been recommending Silo and I know a lot of you wanted to talk about it as well. So totally yeah. down to do some Silo slash From streams uh, after season two ends and I'm caught up definitely. Yeah, and that's an Apple TV thing and that's coming out uh, one episode per week too. So you're, I yeah. mean, if you were to get into it, you're not, uh, you're not far behind at all. I mean, you're like maybe four or five episodes. I don't even know if they're five to six episodes deep in that one already. So you can binge yeah. it and catch up uh, very, very quickly on that one. Uh, but yeah, yeah man, good. yeah, catch up good on the chat. So I know, man, I, I always side. No, it's good, everything. man. It's good, man. It's good. <laughs> it, it, there's just so much, there's so many, there's so much to talk about about the show. It's really easy to get sidetracked. It's it's so it's too so too, it's cool, man. It is cool. <laughs> and um and no, the chat is absolutely killing it. You guys have had some really, really good ideas and thoughts tonight. Uh Boyd, Kendall, uh Boyd, Kenny, and Randall. Okay, there's a good team. There's a good team right there. Yeah, I wasn't thinking about Randall. Uh, Randall could be good in the muscle department, but I don't know how good Randall would be, you know, in a team. Randall seems like he's very much the lone wolf type. I don't know how well he's going to operate in a team setting if he's going to be able to take out orders. Because if it's my team, I am very much putting Boyd in charge of that team, and Boyd is the one calling the shots. I don't know if Randall is going to be the type of team player that is going to be okay taking orders from someone, but. He would be kind of good in the muscle territory, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. And he does good have choice. that long rifle. He has that long hunting rifle. He's got rifle. the rifle. Yep. The he, longest, he doesn't seem yeah. to be afraid either. No, right, right, right. He definitely has that aspect going for him. Um, now, if you're talking about um, bile bullets uh, and you, and going from a distance, the hunting rifle is even better than Donna's shotgun. Um, so, yeah, you could 
you could uh, get those guys as soon as they're coming out of the uh, <laughs> as soon as they're coming out of the cave. As far as we know, yeah. there's only that one exit, right? Is uh, we have we seen that's the any only one we've exits? seen so far. I, I mean, okay. a, a vast network of caves like that is bound to have multiple exits, but I, this is pro this is the only one we've seen so far yet. But I would be uh, very surprised if that's the only entrance <laughs> or exit. These vast cave systems usually have multiple e entrances and exits. Okay, there's my amended um, prediction for the the finale then. Uh, they throw, they throw, <laughs> I got an amended prediction every time they throw Molotov cocktails and, and there starts a fire up in that thing. And then they block off the ending, block, the they, they block off yeah. the first entrance. And then you just see them go out another one. Like, Hey, yep, uh, suckers, just like gopher holes. <laughs> yep. And then everybody's shit in their pants because the sun's setting that and they're like, funny. Oh, they that see all the funny. smoke rising up. Oh yeah, my God. Shit, that did not work. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Carrie has a four-man crew in Boyd, Christy, Jade, and Dale. Okay, so I can have someone to throw in front of me if the monsters come at me. Yeah, you got some Dale. Just use Dale as the cannon fodder. Oh, no. <laughs> I like your thinking, Carrie. I like your thinking. Uh, Jesse would take Victor, Jade, Boyd, and Donna. Definitely not Tabitha. She can't stay quiet. That is true. We saw Tabitha in the caves, and she would just not stay quiet. And I saw so many fans were, were commenting on that after the season one premiere. <laughs> People were getting really mad at Tabitha for not staying quiet in those caves. <laughs> Uh, Jesse just solved uh, the number of town people by themselves. Yeah, I saw that. Jesse, yeah, Jesse uh, had the number of uh, deaths in season one already accounted for. There goes our fun side game for season one. <laughs> uh, but no, that's it's uh, that's that's a very observative of you for sure. Um, it was cool because I feel like a lot of fans had a feeling that it was going to be a certain number of people there, but no one was willing to do the math, including myself. Yeah, this is a lot of uh, math. Who wants to do math when watching a show? I know I don't. I know yeah, I don't. I'd calculated sure. the actual people that we had seen, but then they were talking about other people like Donna's sister. If And now I've seen people cast doubt that that story was even true. Mm -hmm. um, and, and not, and the mom and God knows who else, uh, you know, I mean, are we going to count the massacre of the townsfolk in Victor's time? Um, because mm -hmm. we'd have to freeze frame and just try to. I, yeah, I wouldn't count that as I, I would count that as a totally different, you know, other time period, other experiment and stuff like that. I would say from season one on, you know, those mm. number of deaths from there on out that we've seen or been told about though. That we've seen, that we see on screen, you know, okay. confirmed deaths that we know are deaths yeah. for certain. Yeah, and we we did the one thing I do want to clarify though uh, for everybody who is interested in that they said twenty five got off the bus. Um, the, I think Bakta said that there was 25 people on the bus. Uh, two of them were, died right away uh, out in front in the first evening. That was when Fatima was screaming at them to come in and uh, they didn't realize they were the ones hiding behind like the minivan. And yeah, they they're shaking the monster's hands. hands and shit. Yeah, yeah. So there's those two. And then we had Brian and Kelly. But no. then who's number 25? I, I think they at some other There's point. There's one unaccounted for that yeah. we still have no yeah. idea where it is. Because there was three heard. missing at the end of the day. And right. two of those three easily could have been Kelly and Brian. But the third one, we, we still don't know what that third missing body was. They haven't explained that yet. Right, right, right. Um, right. Orlando would take uh, Boyd, Randall, Ellis, and Donna. Nice, very nice team indeed. Um, mm, I couldn't Larry. Yeah. My dad was obsessed with it. He has uh, seen it so many times. Oh, they're talking about Lost indeed. Uh, the only thing that gets me upset is when people don't believe other encounters. Like, come on. Yeah, that was true. I mean, that's <laughs> you know everything that we've seen here in this town. And as soon as Boyd tried telling both Kenny and Christy about these worms, they did not believe them. Nobody believed Boyd about these worms until they physically saw them with their own eyes. You would think people would be a little more open to, you know, the kind of impossible happening considering where they are. You're in a town with that that doesn't let you escape where monsters come out at night and hunt you and you have magic talismans that keep them out. Why, I mean, why are you finding this worm thing so hard to believe when you look where you are? But it's just one of those things where, I think that's just how humans are hardwired. We're, we're, we're just hardwired that way to believe what we see and hear with our own eyes and ears. It's until we see and hear and experience something, it's, it's a lot easier to kind of write it off as being fake. They know the monsters are real. They know they're stuck in this town because these are things they live with every day. H humans are super, super adaptable to their environment. People can adapt super fast. Um, so they're already adapted to the fact that this is their environment. This is their reality from now on. They have to go inside and put up these talismans and hide for these monsters every night. That's their normal. So to introduce something on top of that that they haven't experienced with their own eyes, yeah, they're, they're going to have some you know, resistance to it until they actually saw the worms with their own eyes. But that's just human nature at the end of the day, I think. 
Yeah, it's so funny We're all how like that, that that does become normal, and then anything beyond that is still subject to all kinds of skepticism. Like, well, you know, you're having, I don't know about you. You're saying you're having visions, but are you really having, you know, it, and you're living in this crazy world where you hang up, you have to hang up a piece of stone on your wall. If it's on the ground, it doesn't count. It only hang, works if you're hanging it up on the wall and it keeps you from the monsters that come out only at night to eat you. But well, I don't know if you're really having these visions, that kind of stuff. It's like, yeah, it's, it, you're so right though, as far as, um, you know, people's brains, like a death, you frame things in, in, to the world that you're seeing and now the monsters we're and that creatures whole dynamic. Of habit. We're, we're accustomed to seeing the same things we see and hear every day even if those things are fantastical like monsters coming out right. At night. right and then still anything beyond that and being anything beyond that framework that you just created for yourself is still sus to you right yeah it's still <laughs> sus until you actually see it it's it's just going to be one of those things that you, you got to see it to believe it even in a place like this um, Kelly Jean says, hello, Frumley. Glad to catch a live stream brainstorm on the theories. Well, thank you so much for joining us as well. We have been, I have a ton of fun doing these streams every week. At first we were only doing uh, Monday after shows, but we were having so much fun discussing the show that we thought let's start doing a pre-show as well. And it's been so fun to see everybody come out and, and share their theories and thoughts and everything. Like it's like I said, time and time again, coming onto these streams and, and, and theorizing with everybody, making the videos, going into the comment section, talking with everybody, it makes the show that much better. It's all, it's just as fun, if not more fun to talk about the show than it is, than it is to actually watch it. It's just as fun. Um, and that's all thanks to you guys and girls and everyone that has been hanging out with us in these streams and in the uh, recorded videos. It's been super, super fun. And uh, the thought that, you know, the theories and the thoughts and everything that you guys have been throwing at us have been, really really interesting and you know me one thing that i always like to say is keep those tinfoil hats on this is definitely one of those shows that it's it's just one of those shows where you know it's it's fun to kind of strap that tinfoil hat on and just have fun with this thing don't take it too seriously go down that rabbit hole if you want to in a healthy manner of course you know you want to do these things in a healthy dose you don't want it to consume your every waking moment but um yeah have fun with these things you know you know strap that tinfoil hat on and dive down that rabbit hole is what i say um, I don't believe all the monsters uh, live in the cave. The monsters that live in the cave, I don't believe, I don't believe uh, rest human meat. Writers uh, humanize them with f furniture and a pet. The, yeah, that's true. We did see the uh, the monsters in the cave. It's it, it's weird. They got, uh, you know, like you said, they kind of, <laughs> there's TVs down there. There's grandfather clocks down there. There's a little tricycle bike down there. It's almost like they have livable stuff down there. But I do think they are the same monsters that do come out to the town because we did see one of the monsters down in the cave. And it was the uh, the the '60s cheerleader looking monster, and that was one of the same monsters that was um, in episode six. Uh, we did see that exact same monster walking towards Elgin when he was getting the uh, van. But, um, yeah. but I mean, one of those could... creatures looked looked like um, it looked like the the Ankui kids. One of the Ankui kids. Um, even like even like wetter and greasier with the stringy hair. The one that was behind the four wooden sticks or whatever. So you're like, yeah, you're talking about a pet. That that thing was almost like the, I didn't consider it like that, but yeah, it might have been almost like a little pet in a cage. Um, I, I one thought, of the, yeah, it could have been. It could have. Been. I, I got the feeling that that was just one of the kids that Tabitha was seeing. Um, it, it's because it almost seemed like that was the one of one of the same kids that walks up to her later outside the cave. Right, but why why keep it in a behind uh, sticks or you oh, know? I don't behind, think they were keeping it there. I, I think those things just kind of pop up wherever they want to, similar to the boy in white. I think it only popped up down there because Tabitha was down there. I don't oh, think it was. Okay. I don't think it was kept prisoner or anything like that. I, I think it was oh. only. I think it just <laughs> happened to pop up behind where those bars were. I don't think it was physically being held down there. It could have been, maybe, but okay. I have a feeling okay. these things aren't really physical beings that can be captured. They seem similar to the boy in white, where they can kind of just appear whenever they want. Okay. But, okay. Uh, could yeah. be wrong. Uh, yeah. I could be wrong. No. See, I, I I was only thinking in terms of like that those those bars being a kennel. I never even considered that that it was a prison or a kennel. Or, or a cage for the, for the the golem creature. But yeah, man. But see, and that's that's again, that's a chat coming up with these things that that really are worth exploring. Trying to hold it up to our collective knowledge that we know of the show, and and getting a different perspective. You know, so yeah, that's interesting. That is funny though. Keep, keeping a golem kid as a pet. Hmm. 
And uh, and yeah, and Jesse points out that maybe the maybe the one body that hasn't been accounted for could have been Elgin. Uh, maybe they just didn't uh, account for him. Maybe I guess it's a possibility. Maybe um, it, it would at least answer the uh, the missing one. And yeah, Brian. And, and, and that's another thing. Where exactly is Brian? We still have not seen Brian's body. We don't know what exactly happened to Brian. And I'm getting the feeling that's one of those things that we'll probably never find out. I think as an audience, we're just meant to believe that the monsters ripped him up and, and that's it. That's all there is to it. I don't think there's some bigger mystery going on as to why we didn't see Brian's body or anything like that. I think just as an audience, that was just the show's way of telling us the monsters killed Brian. I don't think there's anything more going on there. Um, there could Ooh, be, but right. um, yeah, but the thing is, and I would would agree with you except that again going on the nothing is is wasted theory boyd told that whole story about the brian kelly that that jumped on the grenade or whatever right so the guy's name was brian kelly or, yes that's right that? yeah boyd yeah boyd makes that connection yeah and that's when boyd's starting to think there's maybe this is you know like he's going crazy or there's something more going on here yeah because the, the soldier he yeah. say, saved happened to be named brian kelly yeah so either it was or it wasn't significant, but if it wasn't, it's like one of the first times that there was such heavy, almost like the bracelet, the bracelet in the, the, where the storage room. Um, yeah, that the, I think is going tell. to be something that I think will be explained at some point. I feel like that's a little too specific to kind of just left, leave that thread not tied up at some point to have that specific bracelet in that storage bin and for them to kind of, emphasize the fact that it is definitely the same bracelet and they've clearly never been to that town before i do think we will circle back to that at one point i think some stuff like that i think will get answered but the the little the more ambiguous stuff as to what happened to brian's body stuff like that i just i wouldn't be too surprised if we don't ever find out personally oh wow but okay. we could yeah man. we could though <laughs> we definitely could though i mean that's the thing that's that's what's so fun about so early on in the show you know, we, we don't have, there's so much we don't know yet that so many of these theories could end up still being true. Everybody's theory could still be true at this point, just because we simply don't know yet. And that's what's fun in these early stages uh, for me anyway, just as a pure fan. Oh, okay. And then um, just, <laughs> Jesse just clarifies. He's like, uh, they had a bird cage. That's the pet. I didn't realize. I thought they were keeping that. that <laughs> oh yeah. The bird cage. Yes. They did have a bird cage. That's right. Okay. okay there so a bird that's in what it? she was referring to. I know. I don't think there was a bird in it. I'll have to go back and look, but it looked like there was just a bird cage either on top of uh, either the TV or, or a table or a dresser or something like that. Um, I'm not sure if there was a bird in it though. Um, maybe the chat will let us know. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's weird. Yeah. They got little, you know, they got little bikes down there. One of them had a TV down there. It looked like a little fifties TV with a rabbit ears antenna, which, uh, you know, for anyone who was, uh, you know, any millennials or, or older, that's what TVs looked like back in the day when we were kids, you used to have to fiddle with these rabbit ears, try and find the right signal. Hopefully that it came through. It wasn't as easy as just hitting a button. I promise you oh, that. Yeah, you you um, were the remote control too. I mean, your dad would say, "Hey, go yeah, to, turn that to channel yeah. seven." Like, <laughs> you, uh, were the you were control. it. You had to <laughs> physically walk up to that TV and turn a <laughs> dial if you wanted to change the channel. <laughs> you're really poor uh, with a, a pair of vice grips, a pair of pliers, because the damn th the knob had broken, and you're turning the just the knob with the, with yeah. the pliers. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Uh, yeah, they're all put in the action the second to last on Breaking Bad, Westworld, etc. Uh, eat human meat. Yes, yeah, eat human meat. That is, a, that is the way to go. Cave monsters are former humans. Yeah, I definitely think they were former humans. And I think that, that this recent episode kind of just gives a little bit more evidence to that fact when Christy opens them up and sees nothing but old, withered human organs. The, you know, these things had a heart, lungs, kidneys. These things definitely looked like they were at least human at one point. Um, which, which is, I mean, we've been saying that from the beginning. I know a lot of you have been saying that in the chat from the beginning too, I, that we think these monsters were originally human. Um, and I think that was just more evidence to the fact that, yeah, th these things were human at one point. Uh, but I believe they are the same kind of monsters, just don't eat flesh. Okay, they could be. Yeah, maybe they could be, uh, you know, the same type of monster. Maybe they're, and that's another thing. Are we ever going to see another faction of monster? Like, will we ever come across a good monster? Like, what, that's one thing I could definitely see a show like this introducing at one point. Like, a monster kind of being able to maybe still hold on to their humanity and didn't completely succumb to whatever is kind of 
you know, controlling these monsters, not controlling them, but influencing them for lack of a better term. Because if these things were human at one point, clearly they have been twisted and corrupted so much to the point where there's no humanity left in them. But what if some way along the line, one of them was able to hold on to their humanity and we see a kind of a good monster at one point? I would love to see that aspect introduced onto the show personally. Imagine, like, imagine Boyd trying to convince everyone else that this monster is there to help them and not hurt them. Like something like that. I could really see that being an interesting kind of wrench in the plan here. Oh man. Um, yeah. <laughs> That'd be uh, it. Yeah. That would bars. be, yeah. They're having a hard enough time convincing them that Sarah is not a murderous killer. I, I could not imagine something that was <laughs> formerly a monster. Right. Yeah. Um, I don't think the kids are bad. Yeah, I don't think the kids are bad either. I don't think they're necessarily bad. And if anyone has read the synopsis of the episodes leading all the way up to the finale, uh, these kids are going to be coming back at some point. They're going to play some type of point. And um, yeah, I, I, I don't think they're bad. I don't think they're bad. I think that these kids are trying to tell Tabitha something that is going to ultimately help her at the end of the day. I don't think they're there to harm her. Uh, what was the was that bath scene day uh, in the day or night? That was one thing that I was trying to figure out. It was it's really kind of hard to tell because you don't get a really good look of anything around you. You kind of only see the tub. Now, just based on everything around him, it almost looks like it's nighttime. I mean, just I mean, it doesn't look like there's a whole lot of light in the room or anything like that. But it's just it's really hard to tell if this is night or daytime when when this bath scene happens because we don't see any shots of the windows at all. It's only the shot of the bathtub. And it's, it's, it's weird. It's just, it's kind of hard to tell if this is night or day. Not a hundred percent sure myself, not a hundred percent sure, but uh, it was a good scene though. Very, very scary scene. Nonetheless, it was definitely the scariest scene that I've seen on from up until this point. I mean, just this nightmarish creature and the wailing that it was doing as well. It, was, it wasn't so much how the creature looked, but how it sounded. The, the strange wailing that was coming from this creature was just absolutely terrifying. Um, but who knows, is this thing here to harm Elgin or is this thing, you know, similar to the ballerina where it's just trying to maybe tell Elgin something? It's, uh, it's hard to know. It's hard to know for sure. Uh, there was also a tricycle down there. Yes, there was a tricycle down there. Um, you know, yeah, like you said, the birdcage, the, the TVs, is some weird stuff down there for sure. And, and Carrie did mean that the kid was a pet. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe the kid was a pet. Maybe I, I got the feeling that that kid was uh, not physically there that it was just there for tabitha's sake that that was the first time tabitha was actually seeing these weird children but it could have physically been there and been behind that bar maybe that's definitely a possibility for sure for sure uh the good times my tv would go <laughs> would go black time or green until you had to hit it yes that was another thing you got to play with the rabbit ears for a while and then you got to smack the top of the tv like five ten times and then boom it would just all of a sudden it would just catch that right frequency and you would be good and then you would have to do it all <laughs> over again the next day um but yeah that's what it was like back in the day before you know flat screens and smart tvs and you know good internet came out <laughs> it was uh yeah the good old days definitely the good old days no, uh, they were lost grounded. <laughs> we said um, that's a that's the biggest trick. We tell people that it was good old days. Man, they were some of those days were not some very of them good. Weren't great. <laughs> Overall, they were good old days though compared to now. I would say for me personally. Right. Um, but no, some a lot of stuff is much more convenient now. There's no denying that shit. Um, was lost grounded and this supposed last supernatural. Uh, that may be the clue of. That may be the clue what we are in for here. Creators rarely veer from their uh, themes. I definitely think that there is a mystical aspect as to what is going on here and from. And yes, there certainly was in Lost. Um, a lot of the stuff that we saw in Lost, some of it was explained with uh, science at the end of the day, like you know, like Desmond's visions, the weird electromagnetism that was a part of the island. Certain things, the Dharma Initiative, certain things were explained through science, but there were some things that were just straight up mystical, like Jacob, the smoke monster, Jacob being seemingly immortal, um, the source of the island's power. There, there were certain things on the show that were definitely of supernatural slash mystical in origin. And I definitely think this show is following in those same footsteps because just from what we're seeing so far, we're seeing aspects of sci-fi, we're seeing aspects of horror, we're seeing aspects of fantasy. We're getting a, a good blend of all of these different genres in this one show. But yeah, I, I don't think it's going to be one thing or the other. I do think some things will maybe have a scientific explanation at one point, but I definitely think a lot of what is going here on here is going to have a kind of mystical explanation. I think there is something magical 
there is a magical aspect to this show, I think. Uh, yeah, I think they've they've addressed that so many times that that they um, they can't. They either they, they either have to go with magic or yeah. Yeah, or they have to explain everything. And you know they ain't going to they can't explain everything. So yeah, they'll have to just say magic. I th- didn't um I thought Harold Perrineau uh, like in an interview kind of just I heard someone say that. I couldn't find the interview myself to confirm it, but I did hear someone say that in the chat. I just couldn't confirm it myself. Uh, okay, okay. And I, I know from I think Tony Teflon said um that the worms are definitely going to come back in the future. One of the uh, cast interviews he did said okay. we're definitely not done with the worms. I think it might've been oh, with, okay. um, nice. with, uh, with, um, Christy. Um, yeah, they can't I didn't watch gone. that whole they interview. Yeah. They can't. Yeah, and so I know a lot of us have theorized that maybe there's still a little trace of the worms still inside Boyd, or maybe he kind of passed them on to Kenny. And maybe that could be what this scene is here uh, that we're seeing in the trailer. I know it's the trailer mm-hmm. is definitely trying to frame it like Smiley is coming back. But what if this whole scene is just, you know, a another hallucination from Boyd and he opens this door and he sees the ballerina on the other side of it. And boom, he looks down and he still has the worms. I could totally see something like that happening. Um, but no, I just, the worms can't be gone. The way that they have introduced the worms onto this show and the kind of plot device that they have made them and making them the only known weapon that can affect the monsters, the worms can't be gone entirely. They, we have to see them again at some point. So yeah. that's awesome. And, and, that's awesome. And getting real detail oriented when he says, if anything comes up these stairs. So that means anything in any form, whether it's smiley in either form, or I didn't think about the ballerina, uh, you know, if yeah. anything comes up these stairs. Uh, you know, if they, if he was just going to talk about the, uh, with smiley, he could have just said if that thing, or if he comes up the stairs, says, you know, yeah, it's true. Run. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, and they're going in the chat, man. They're saying how great. Uh, I'm, I'm, I can't always keep track of of YouTube, um, but man, you guys are absolutely killing it. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, you know, thank you so much. I wanted to uh, shout out the the people who had super chatted. Uh, we had Michael Dici, Ayurvedic Man, Kev two four, Kev Z two forty seven, and uh, Crazy Mad uh, Luna Cascade gifted memberships tonight. Thank you guys awesome so much. Stuff. I mean, you know, it, it it it's that it's going the extra mile. Uh, and we're doing this because we love doing it, man. And, and if you guys are enjoying it, um, you know, we, we got 85 thumbs up on it already. Uh, 128 watching supposedly, uh, I, my numbers aren't exactly correct, but man, yeah, hit that thumb. Um, you know, share, share the news, share the word, spread the word. Uh, we watch all these different shows. I mean, I, some of them, some of the analyses we skip because we don't want to have our I ideas poisoned or whatever. It. Yeah, myself, yeah. myself personally, I, I had to stop watching all of From content just until season two is over. Once season two is over, I'm going to go back to all of my favorite From channels and catch up on all the stuff that I missed. But yeah, it got to a point where I, I just I had to stop watching everybody else's From content just because I didn't want to I didn't want it to influence my own theories, basically. But I am going to yeah. go back and catch up on all of Tony's streams for sure. Um, and there are some other good from channels out there, like from land and some other good ones. Nocturnal critic is another one I haven't seen in a while, but he put out some good stuff during season one. There's some really good from channels out there that have been doing some awesome freaking work. Yeah. The one thing I definitely agree with, uh, with Tony on, and this one is it. I mean, he basically did the homework on it. It was that the boy in white is Victor. And people are, I like well, that theory. I do like that theory. I, I, well, here's the thing. He said uh, season one, like when there was the cast list, they had all the characters and all the, the names and Scotty McCord, who's the adult Victor. And they then they had the Dex or whatever his name is, Lex or Dex or whatever the little kid's name is uh, yeah. as Victor. And then okay. they changed it before, like at some point they changed it real quick, but he had screenshot it before they changed it. Now uh-huh. he's listed in the credits as boy in white. Um, oh, and people are okay. like, well, maybe they made a mistake. Maybe they did this, maybe they did that. It could have been a mistake I, or it could have yeah. been a reveal that they didn't but want I am, to pick up on. Yeah. Yeah. I am 100% on board with, um, with uh, Tony's assertion that it wasn't a mistake. Was, he, they they literally, he is Victor. They, they put okay. it there accidentally. They changed it, thought that they could do it, but he did screenshot it. So, um, I mean, I'm not going to wow, follow nice. any conspiracy That's theory catch. down the line, man. Yeah. So now what does that mean? I mean, that yeah, introduces that mean? time like, travel that introduces all these different things. Uh, mm-hmm. then, you know, the, the question, I mean, uh, I will 100%, uh, go with his assertion that the boy in white is Victor. Now, which Victor? Uh, what? What? Because the thing is, the Victor, uh, the boy in white does not look like child Victor in the photos. 
Um, yeah, it so might now just how... be like a a manifestation of like not f- physically Victor, but hit like Victor's sub Victor's subconsciousness. Like it could be like maybe Victor conjured up the boy in white without even right, realizing. Absolutely, it. yeah, yeah, but uh, yeah, but I mean, for as much, uh, I mean, even if we go one hundred percent with that assertion, which I do, yeah, we're still left with this huge giant question mark of uh, yeah. like you're saying, is it a a non corporeal version of him? Is it his himself in his own? mind that he's now I like it it opens up a projecting. lot of questions it definitely opens up a lot of questions and theories that go along yeah. with that because yeah th- there has it seems like there has been some aspect of kind of time travel or whatever you want to call it especially with boyd and martin in that and wherever boyd and martin were we see boyd is you know getting right after he gets cut by martin and gets the worms boyd grabs the porch he's getting ready to leave and as soon as he is getting ready to open that door and walk out the door it seems like the entire building just disappears on him but if you look around Boyd. If you see like where Boyd is actually standing after the building disappears, look at the brick archway that is near him and look at the, mm-hmm. all of his surroundings. It looks like he is in the exact same spot where that building used to be. It's just in ruins now that maybe it's at a different time period. I, and these right. stills, I made sure to load those stills up. And, yeah, uh, the, the brickwork and the size of the stones and that kind of stuff, the way it was the masonry, the construction, you're exactly right. It's it was exactly, exactly, exactly the, same. the same. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I do have those loaded up here somewhere. Let me find them. Okay. Now, when um, that's a question that I have, though, also when now the scene where um, Kenny and Boyd were walking out and they were commenting about the trees changing or the leaves changing, uh, that was right before the. uh, But they came across another like ruined building. There was like a low stone wall in in a square shape. Yeah, yeah, just that little ruined wall there. Yeah, that's right. But that wasn't. But that was before they had even gotten to the the root cellar where the ballerina comes up out of. Yeah, it seemed like that was close to town. Yeah. Yeah, but what was that building? What was that little building? Who knows? Yeah, it looked like. And also the building. I have a feeling that building was probably from the same era because Father Cotri's church clearly was built way earlier than most of these buildings a lot of these buildings like the diner and stuff in the mm-hmm. houses they seem to be a little more modern where they were probably built around the you know 40s 50s 60s era but then you look at father cautry's church that is right out of civil war era of architecture look at the architecture for you know the civil war era that is mm-hmm. exactly how they used to build huts back then and maybe that one that ruined one that boyd and kenny walked by i have a feeling mm-hmm. that's from that same timeline from father cautry's church because the church is clearly much older than the rest of the town. Okay. And it's also kind of the same thing as that little grotto or whatever that Boyd fell into when he initially found the the talismans, right? Because that thing didn't have a door. It had the some vines. And, and, yeah. And people were like, well, the vines could have been the door. I don't yeah. think they were. But, I mean, it might have been the fact that there were 12 talismans in that room. I think that's what it was, multiple okay. talismans on each wall. I think if you put a talisman on each wall, maybe it'll have a different effect. Maybe that is the Maybe that's the key to maybe trapping one of these monsters, multiple talismans, one on each wall and luring a monster into a certain room and then trapping it maybe. Um, But but exactly what was that grotto? What was that? I mean, why would you have a masonry? Why would you have a stone built room of exactly like the size of, of not, like nothing it looked you know, like, like it a one safe room yeah like maybe yeah. that was i think that was probably there before even the town was there or before at least the rest of the town was built maybe there was just you know because it clearly seems like this town was around for a very very long time there's some ancient stuff going on here that seems to have been going on pointing very far back and yeah, maybe I think that stone structure was just an earlier version of humans figured out what these talismans were and built that as a place to protect themselves. That's that's kind of what I got from it. Uh, but no, this definitely looks like the exact same building. Like you look at all these brick, you look at the brick kind of arches here. This is exactly where Boyd and Martin are. And then boom, next thing you know, whoops, wrong way. Next thing you know, boom. Boyd is about to walk outside of the door. Next thing you know, he's just in the middle of these ruins. But look at these ruins. These are the exact same brick arches that we see uh, the, you know, the room that Boyd and Martin were in. So I'm pretty sure Boyd didn't really physically travel anywhere, but I think he might have slipped through time a little bit because, I mean, just look at this construction here. This is clearly the same place. I, I don't see how it could be a different place. This is, I mean, I think they're throwing this out there for you to see. They wanted us to see these ruins surrounding Boyd. It just looks like he is in the exact same place. It just looks like it's from two different time periods, basically. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and absolutely. And I, I absolutely agree. And I absolutely believe that that torch was essential 
Uh, that's to, why the torch to, is there to let people know this was real and it wasn't a hallucination. And he did have it in going into the peach truck. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so from the, going through the forest, we even had to douse it, but that was when his vision got blurry um, mm -hmm. and all that stuff out in the forest. But yeah, uh, the, he had, the, he had it as he was putting it in the peach truck. Yeah. Like he's mentioned, he was about to whack uh, Victor cause he yeah, didn't he's know about to was, whack them with it when the door opens in the truck. He's yeah. He's holding up like a bat. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but no, this definitely looks like it's the same place. I, I don't see how it couldn't be. It's just, it's super, super similar. Yeah. Sometimes um, when, I mean, when we're presented with, with certain evidence, certain things that are just like incontrovertible uh, as, as evidence, I am of the mind that, I mean, is too hard to, you just to have anymore. to yeah. accept that. Yeah. 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 Hey, we got uh, Larry Quartowitz as a new times. member as well. So thank you for joining us, Larry Quartowitz. Oh, make, make sure to use those, um, make sure to use the custom emojis. <laughs> thank you, Larry, for becoming our newest member and welcome to the team. Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> whoa indeed awesome stuff uh, we got some good uh, comments down in the uh, chat uh Dan marie says what if victor manifested the boy in white uh because he was all alone and became something somewhat real from that point on that i, I think that could potentially be what is going on the first time we ever see the boy in white is right after that massacre when victor wakes up the next morning and he sees the whole town is slaughtered and yes he's there alone I think, yeah, Victor could just be, like, like I said earlier, just an imaginary friend that Victor kind of conjured up. I definitely think that could be going on here, and uh, I like that theory a lot. Um, no, the boy in okay, white yeah. can't be Victor. We have seen Victor as a child. The boy in white looks nothing like Victor when he was a child. Yeah, and that's why, yeah, they, they definitely don't, They definitely look different physically. They look like two totally different people. That's why I'm yeah. leading to believe that if it is Victor, it's maybe not physically Victor, but it's some manifestation of Victor, or like, like you said, some kind of imaginary friend that maybe Victor conjured up that I could definitely see. And it just ended up kind of, you know, maybe at some point it just became an entity in and of itself because I do, you know, for it to be Victor, you would stand to think that maybe only Victor would be able to see it, but that clearly isn't the case. We saw later on, Sarah could see the boy in white. And then we saw Ethan could see the boy in white. And both of those times, Victor wasn't anywhere near them. So mm -hmm. as, if Victor did conjure up this boy in white, Maybe at one point it just kind of became its own entity. Uh, but the uh, boy in white also buttons his top button, just like Victor. Case closed. Yep, there it is. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> uh, Sarah told the boy, uh, she talked to the boy in white, and he told her he is trapped in town like all the other people. I do think he is Victor. Um, yeah, it's, 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 it's an interesting theory. It's, it's, it's hard to know for sure. But, yeah, we definitely see, you know, the, and that's the thing. The boy in white clearly developed some kind of, telepathic abilities along the way at some point because when we see him mm. talking to sarah he's not even moving his lips he he's he's he, it's like he's it's like he's telepathically projecting this message into sarah's head he's talking to her but his lips aren't moving at all it was clearly some type of telepathic connection there and it didn't seem like boyd could see the boy in white at all it seemed like only sarah could see the boy in white as well um, so yeah, there's, there's still so many questions, so many questions, but yeah, definitely a uh, same building, different time. I, I definitely think that's what we're dealing with right here. It's just, it's too similar to not be like, you look at the brick archways right here and right here, you look at where, where Boyd ends up. It's just, it's way too similar to not be the same place. And I, I'm convinced that it is the same place, but then it begs the question, where exactly is the well? Where is the little shaft that Boyd was trapped in originally? Because that is the, the whole point of this room. There was that well there where Boyd found himself after he went through the faraway tree. And if this was a different time period long after this building was demolished, I guess it could be as simple as maybe the hole was filled in. Um, but I don't know. We can't really see what exactly is behind Boyd. If this is the exact same place, the hole would be somewhere behind him, I would imagine. But, you know, it's, it's, it's all overgrown. It's really hard to tell. But just based off the structure alone, it looks like it's the same place. See, and that's one I'm never going to get over. I think that will have to be one of the unanswered questions. They may they may at some point tell us who threw that rope down in there. But the thing is, I mean, like Victor was saying when he was addressing the far away trees he goes you, you know you might end up here you might end up there you might end up inside of a mountain but the thing is man yeah. that that well was uh you know about the size of a person deep um how would you even know to build a well down in the ground because that would i mean you would if you were exiting in that space prior to that well existing you wouldn't even you would be a skeleton you would be inside yeah. the earth and i think that's that, why it was dug 
And I think that's exactly yeah. why it was dug. I, I don't think these entrance, I don't think these destinations that these faraway trees are sending people are as random as they appear. I do think at one point in time, someone figured out where some of these destinations are, like the root cellar for one. Julie get exit exit exits right at the root cellar in town. I have a feeling right. in that the root cellar, nonetheless. Yeah. Exactly. In the cabinet, I have a feeling. Yeah, I have a feeling that was specifically put there to be an entrance for a faraway tree, similar to the shaft that Boyd found himself in. Maybe maybe some people are building these kind of traps to trap these people that are going through these faraway trees. It seems like the one Boyd found himself in was a trap. Like th That was specifically put there wow. to uh, trap okay. people who end up here from the faraway tree. Um, but I, I just have a feeling people figured these destinations. I don't think they're as random as they appear at first. I think at some point, someone or maybe whoever is in charge of this whole thing knows a little bit more of these faraway trees and knows where they're going to go. And maybe it might might appear random to us, but I don't think these destinations are as random as they appear. I think they, they're specific destinations. Almost like, I mean, I, I, I'm really going off, off the cuff here, but you, I mean, to, to do something like that, you would either have to be the people who originated the yes. faraway trees or yep. somebody who got enough hints about that to say, hey, there is an exit to the faraway trees 30 feet down from this spot. Exactly. So they had to dig that well. Oh yep. my gosh. Okay. Exactly. That makes sense. And that this makes one at the root cellar sense. is, uh, you know, this one at the root cellar is only 10 feet down. So we got to only dig this far on that one. Like maybe they sure. figured out where these exits are going to be. Because I just, I don't think these faraway tree exits are as random as they appear to be. I do think there is some type of, you know, pattern to it. We just don't know it yet. Right. And that one that Victor, the very first one that he was showing Ethan where he throws a rock, you just have to hope that you don't end up in the faraway tree that exits you 30 feet up in the air, but 10 feet behind you because <laughs> you would have dropped just like the rock if you exited from there. <laughs> yeah, right? exactly. I mean, yeah, exactly. True. That's true. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I think there's, you know, maybe there's some type of, uh, you know, some type of pattern there that maybe someone has figured out at some point, or maybe someone designed it. Like exactly. We have no idea what these faraway trees really are. How did they come about? Did they grow naturally? Are they some, are they part of some kind of spell Were they created by something? Did they just grow on their own? We, we still know nothing about these things, but yeah, who knows? Maybe someone kind of cracked the code or figured out where these entrances and exits were going to be and kind of set up places to in these spots to kind of, you know, trap people maybe. Yeah. And that, man, I really hope, I honestly, I hope that's true because I mean, as I, I have my own theory and I know it's a super long one. So I'll go and maybe tomorrow I'll talk about it because I, I, I'm adjusting it as I go. But I also really hope that there is that supernatural, the actual like literal magic aspect, mm -hmm. because that does yeah. tie up. I mean, you know, you can go with simulations, you can go with um, experiments, you can go with all these different ones and how, how it, it, and find evidence some evidence in the world, but nothing really um, that that fits everything with a, a tidy explanation. And sometimes, you know, magic, when you just say magic, that is the explanation for everything because magic is limited by your imagination. So it like literally every single thing can be um, possible with, with magic or paranormal as an explanation. Um, I know some people will be super disappointed if they go in that direction, uh, because it is pretty darn convenient. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, Jesse Rivera says she, uh, it's not a well, she thinks it's an oubliette, which is, okay. yeah, it was basically, yeah. An oubliette was basically where you would get the idea of a dungeon. It was basically yeah. just either a shaft or a tiny room that was smaller than, you know, you couldn't stand up in it, but you also couldn't sit down comfortably because it was mm -hmm. too narrow. And oubliette was like French for forget or forgotten like it was where you would go you would just put them in there and forget about them um it was like really what our classic idea of what a dungeon like a torture dungeon not even a torture dungeon just a hole where you would yeah. throw yeah, just throw hole. somebody in there and forget yeah, and about i think it. that's why i was pro I and i definitely think it was put there on purpose to specifically trap people who exited that faraway tree in particular um, but they had to have just, a, a winch and a rope to, <laughs> to occasionally bring somebody out, maybe. Exactly, exactly. That you put the, you put the rope up top, so you know when when people do get trapped there, you can pull them up if you want to uh, strap them to the wall, like Martin. I have a feeling that's probably how Martin ended up there too, Martin, because Martin even says everything changed for him when he went through the faraway tree. And I have a feeling Martin went through a faraway tree and ended up in that exact same shaft, and now he's you know chained up to the wall. It seems yeah, like a cycle man. that had been happening. And, and that was a very good point, though, too, because, uh, I mean, Martin was chained up in what and two other people in various stages of decay were also chained yeah. up 
that was dungeony enough. And I mean, when you are below the dungeon, I mean, like when they talk about, you know, that guy needs to be buried under the prison or whatever, mm-hmm. when you know, locked away, that's what an oubliette was. I mean, when you weren't ever coming out, when they wanted to forget about you, they'd put you down there and they might that's throw the, you a bread uh, crust that's the or hole whatever. Today. That's, you know, yeah, they you, throw that's you the, in the hole. Back then, they threw you in the freaking oubliette. Now. Absolutely. Oh, there's there. Timar. Yeah. He, he, uh, Timar sends a super, t- it might be a super sticker. I don't see it. He said, How do you become a member? I think it's in that exact same area. It's like, that dollar sign thing and it'll say become a channel member right the same place that you, that you would pick a super chat um it i can't should, see it because yes. I'm, I'm working only on stream yards right now yeah if you, um, yeah that uh, the the same place where you usually go to super chat um it should say uh, membership uh, join membership it should be right there uh, it usually is anyway um yeah. and thank you tim for the uh, super sticker i really appreciate that i appreciate everybody man you guys have been so generous it's it's i mean it's so cool you definitely do not have to do that just like i said just hanging out here and, and sharing your thoughts and theories is more than payment enough you know just giving us your time but uh, really appreciate it nonetheless thank you so much oh, yeah. And, yeah, and tim global and yeah, media says, yep tim global media says the exact same thing it says hey guys um I just lost him. There it is. Hey guys, good night. Where can I get some from emojis? Yep. That's it, man. Become a channel member. You get the full panoply of our, you get Mr. Smiley, you get the worm mouth ballerina, all those good ones. So yeah, man, if you guys want to do that, absolutely. Uh, You know, we're just, we're so freaking grateful that 130 something people want to sit there and listen to us talk about it. And we want to talk about your theories too. Cause I tell you what, man, I have adjusted just from talking to you guys, I have adjusted my own personal guest theory and mine is very bad. It's very like random and weird, but I, I, but it's one that I hadn't heard and it's kind of like an amalgam, but um, yeah, man, you guys that are coming up and, and hold hold it up to the light every theory i mean every theory that you guys come up with and what and when you say hey but what about this thing and but how to what about that thing we do we have to hold it up to the light man we have to say okay well how does that mesh with everything else that we know can we dismiss it can we say and, and you guys say it to us I, you know every bit as much as we say it to you you're like but what about this but what about that and it's like oh yeah i forgot about that and it yeah, might discussing be one thing the show is just as fun as watching it at this point yeah. it really is and, and that you is thanks are. to everybody in the chat absolutely and your crowd we're, we're, I, I feel like we all you all hundred and however many people of you guys and us on the panel whether it's two people four people six people on the panel we're all crowdsourcing these these questions. We're crowdsourcing these solutions and holding yeah, them we're up all to fans the light. At the end of the day, that's, and, that's yeah. what's, and we're all on the same playing field, and that's what's great about a show like From. It doesn't have source material that people can go read and and learn a little bit more than the average viewer. Like with Game of Thrones and House of the Dragon, you always had the book readers that kind of would like to wield their superior knowledge over just the show watchers. It was a, it was a theme <laughs> that unfortunately did happen a lot during Game of Thrones. Um, that's, that's just not me. I just, I, I, I'm just a fan. I, I don't consider myself above anybody ever. I'm just a random freaking fan on the internet. So yeah, it's so cool that people come and hang out here and share their theories and thoughts and stuff like that. And, and you know, it's a fandom like this that makes the show that much better. I, I can't remember the last time I've been a part of a fandom that has been this freaking fun. Um, right. and, and, yeah, and it's, it's, it's all putting great. though when you're told you're wrong or like, oh yeah, you didn't know that page 887 uh, clearly addressed your stupid question because you're a stupid, stupid person. No, nah, man, we don't, we, we don't know this, uh, you know, it, and it, it is so awesome and being able to do this and I just, <sighs> Um, I, I, Tim is just having a little bit of trouble here. Um, now, uh, no, you don't have to send a super chat to become a member, but usually if you click on the super chat function where the super chat is, it should say super sticker, super chat, and then under it should say membership. Um, and if you click membership, that should give you a way to join the channel. If that doesn't work, if you go to my main home page, just the main home page on my YouTube channel, it should say right next to, if you are a, a subscriber, right next to subscribe, it should say join. There should be a join option there as well. So if you can't find it there in the chat down below by hitting the super chat function, you should be able to find it on the main home page. Um, and if it's not at either of those places, then YouTube has maybe hidden it for some reason. I had no idea why. But yeah, that's, um, that's usually the two places that it's at. No, Albert Cunningham has a good question here. He goes, so you didn't think Sarah went through the tree then? Because she said she went through it right after Boyd. And we've seen that happen before, too. Um, Ooh, when yeah. Julie went through uh, and I, well, it was Victor and Julie at that point when they had just escaped from the Colony House massacre. House, yeah. They went through. Um, now, 
even though they're going together or even though they're going in close proximity, I've never seen anybody go through like holding hands or part like that. I've seen them go one after the other. And that's how you get Boyd at the bottom of the well. And Sarah, mm-hmm. wherever she ended up, she said she just went directly to the church. Now is everybody believing that uh, Sarah went directly you know, is, to the bottom of the is church? Sarah telling the truth. And, and we brought that up right from day one. I just, I, I get, just because there was so much, Sarah was so sus at the time. I'm starting to think maybe she <laughs> did just get transported right to the church and she has been there the whole time. But yeah, at first glance, my first thought was there's no way Sarah went through that faraway church and has just been in Father's Cottery basement this whole time. But then when you start to think how much time had really passed and it has really only it had really only been like a day or maybe two at that point that she would have been down in that cellar, it starts to become a little bit more believable that, yeah, I do think Sarah did go through the faraway tree. And I am starting to think that, yeah, she just ended up in Father Cottery's basement. But, oh, um, but yeah, with it's, no food, it's with no, I mean, you had to at least use the restroom at least once in that two day period, one would think. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I know these are really a, gross, practical. A, well, no, I imagine he's got a bathroom in the church somewhere. The, the church seemed to be his oh. home. He seemed to live there. It wasn't just a oh, okay. church. Like he actually lived there. So I, I imagine okay. he's got a bathroom somewhere. Yeah. See, I was thinking she was just staying in that bottom because Kenny had to go down the stairs, right? She was down stairs in it. In the basement or the, yeah. the basement is the, basement. the church. Okay, I didn't think that she had the free reign of that whole building. So that that is entirely possible that she might have been able to to go there. Yeah. Um, Wow. Yeah. See, there we go. I mean, we're just settling out these questions or readdressing them, questions that other people are just coming across that maybe we have have seen but man and that's, a lot that's of people what it's think all she about was lying too like, right. I totally i thought she was at first too but knowing how much time passed and knowing that they didn't really they didn't really go back to that plot point at all i'm starting to think that yeah sarah went through the faraway tree and she was just she just got transported to father cautry's basement and she stayed there for the kind of mm-hmm. two days until kenny found her but yeah. who knows maybe you know maybe she went somewhere else maybe she didn't go through the faraway tree at all maybe something else happened that is definitely a possibility for sure and god knows um, she can't stay in one place i mean in, when, no every she single can't she don't listen to boyd to save her right. life you know what i mean stay in the church <laughs> the first stay thing here, she does don't is leave. leave the church Shit. she and did the Sarah. same thing that was a, i mean that was before boyd even went out to to uh, and her uh before boyd and sarah went on their adventure that was that plot line where where uh fatima told ellis you better go catch him and tell him um you know that you love him or whatever because he's you know that because they had that interpersonal conflict because uh ellis blamed boyd for killing the mom and i'm sure ellis felt guilty because boyd killed the mom because the mom was about to kill ellis they had to hash that that emotional aspect out and they were out Boyd and Sarah had already gone out and Sarah was in this little room and he said, don't come out, just stay in here. And he went out and he talked to Ellis and they had that heartfelt moment and the hug. And I love you, son. And I love you, dad. And, and all that was hashed out. And we finally got that huge burden of all of Ellis's resentment lifted. And then here comes damn Sarah popping her head out. And immediately yeah. Ellis is like, listen. what is she sure. doing here? I know, man. <laughs> you don't listen to shit. Um, yeah, it's uh, yeah, you know, it's one of those things. I, I, I'm starting to think that she was there the whole time, but who knows? Who, who the hell knows where Sarah is concerned? But yeah, conversations like this allow us to live safely in the From universe and enjoy it even more. So it's uh, more of an experience. It really is, and that's how From has has been for me. I know most of the shows that I watch, and I'm sure most of the shows that everybody watches, it's one of those things where you know you watch an episode and you, you kind of forget about it until the, you know the next week. kind of it's been so interactive and it's been one of those shows that you just can't help but think about you know for a long while after you every day i think about this show practically not not just for the channel to you know to do content and streams and stuff like that but even if i wasn't covering the show on the channel i would still be thinking about the show every single day because it is it's one of those shows that is just it's an experience but yeah having you know places like this and you know tony's channel and all of the other channels out there that are talking about this show it makes it that much more fun because yeah you get to come here and you get to talk to everybody that's watching the same show as you and 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 hash stuff out like like we do here and it's 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 a blast it really is a blast so thank each and every one of you um, either Sarah is the most cute girl on the show, or I have some unaddressed issues. <laughs> no, hey, that is okay. Tough. That is okay. Yeah, um, I, she was, man. She was the waitress. She was the good girl. She was the the ultimate good girl doing a service job in a place where people could just lay around like at Colony House and, you know, have sex on the couch. And that was the full extent of their existence. She was serving people food. She was serving pancakes and 
and everything else. And murdering people on the side. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, that's you know, granted, yeah, negative, but I mean, is, is it a deal breaker? Mm, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I'm right there with you, brother. I'm right there with you, man. <laughs> um, Faisal, yes, Faisal, says, I agree. Team Sarah. Yeah, <laughs> I can Sarah, fix her. Oh, yeah, yeah, you see that a lot. Yeah, I could fix her. Yeah, maybe <laughs> fix the uh, murdering girl who's hearing these weird voices. It's, hey, we, stranger things have happened. Um, <laughs> I believe it. Boyd and Sarah took at least two days to get to the lighthouse. She had to go through the tree. It was only one day. However, she knows more than what she is saying. She uh, talked to the boy in white. And that was, that was my, one of my theories as well. It's like, could, could maybe she have gone through the faraway tree and she ended up somewhere and the boy in white kind of guided her back to town? Maybe something else happened. Yeah, I, I don't know. I guess it remains to be seen. But I am starting to think that, yes, yeah, she went through the faraway tree and she ended up right at the uh, right at right at the basement. But who knows? Maybe there's a little bit more to the story that she just hasn't revealed yet. That is definitely possible. Um, I think I, the boy in white protected her to be somewhere there. Ha uh, there was a talisman because she gave boy the talisman they had. Yeah, that was it, that was one thing that was pretty strange. You know, I mean, the talisman is one of the only things that protects you. And the first thing Sarah does is give the talisman to Boyd as, before he goes into the faraway tree, leaving her completely kind of unprotected. So that's a good observation as well. Um, I kind of hope Randall is uh this shows so i definitely think randall is going to be this show show sawyer 100 percent, and he's going to have a similar redemption arc i think as well a complete asshole but will end up being a great loved and important character i i think you're 100 percent spot on and i'm right there with you it just i am seeing so much sawyer inside of randall it's not even funny i definitely think that is going to be the case he he i do think randall will have a nice redemption arc at one point and yes he will become one of those characters that i think a lot of people will like Our, there's already a lot of people that like randall he's already becoming a kind of pseudo fan favorite in some circles which is totally cool but yeah i definitely think he's going to have a good redemption arc and he will become a little bit more important member of the town for sure um, when they hear something in the basement this time, it better not be one of Mari's dope dreams. Yeah, I hope. Yeah, they definitely. I hope they don't throw another one of those at us. <laughs> that would definitely, definitely suck. Um, oh, okay. We got some. Um, we got. Uh, let's see. Uh, Sarah was, uh, is, and will always be a wolf in sheep's clothing. Says Carrie. Yeah, th there's a little bit more to Sarah than than meets the eye too, as well. I think she's uh, <laughs> looks innocent on the surface, but she's hiding some claws for sure. And uh, we got a new member from Lara Momo. Thank you so much, Lara Momo, for joining the channel. It is good to see you again. I know Lara is a big House of the Dragon fan who hangs out with us for our House of the Dragon streams, and I hope that you are uh, enjoying from as well. And thank you so much for the five dollars super sticker as well. Wow. Oh, so yeah. incredibly generous. Wow. Super kind. Are, yeah. And I mean, Laura, Laura's a familiar face. Uh, Momo yeah. is the doggy. Laura is the Australian girl. Uh, good to have you here, man. Good to have awesome. you on this, this fandom. Uh, she came across us when we were talking about comics and stuff. And now we're on to, uh, to this just incredible, incredible program. Um, oh, it looks like Carrie, Carrie is not having my simping for Sarah. It looks Oof. like, um, I, you know, I'm, I was team team psycho, and she's like skeptic. She killed four people. <laughs> well, she I ain't gonna. Kill, I am she, not gonna she did argue. Kill some people. Yes, this is true. She is a murderer. And pulled a guy's tongue day. out. That was a little a, a little extra. Yeah, yeah. pulled his tongue yeah. out. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if that one's fixable, personally. Mm, yeah. um, I was thinking Victor and Julie survived in the cellar um, a night of the massacre without a talisman. Is the place where you land from the faraway tree protected from the monsters, even if it doesn't have a talisman? Um, I mean, it could be the case. We don't know a whole lot about the exit down in the uh, root cellar. I don't think Victor ended up uh, in the in the root cellar with Julie, though, it seemed like Julie, uh, when Julie went through the faraway tree, it seems like she ended up into that root cellar by herself. It seems like Victor went somewhere else entirely. And I think that's how Victor ended up finding the caves originally, because we don't see Victor ag after you see the colony house massacre and ask you after we see uh, Victor and Julie both presumably go into the tree. We don't see Victor again until Tabitha finds the caves at the end of season one. So I have a feeling uh, Julie and Victor both went through that tree. It sent Julie to that weird root cellar, but it sent Victor to the caves. And I think it sent Victor to the caves where the boy in white was sitting there waiting for him. Cause clearly the boy in white told Victor to stay here and wait for Tabitha. Almost like the boy in white knew Tabitha was going to find these caves too. And he, he wanted Victor to stay there and wait for her to help guide her out. That's what I think happened to Victor. I don't think Victor ended up in the uh, root cellar himself, but as far as there being some kind of built-in talisman in that root cellar, who knows? It maybe maybe it's a safe spot that we just don't know about. I just have a feeling it's just a hiding spot that maybe the monsters don't check often. But 
who knows, maybe there's something, uh, you know, protective about it. It could be, could be. Oh, yeah, yeah. And that um, symbol that Jade saw was just purely his, his hallucination on the ceiling at the same yes. time as he saw the, the person under yeah. the, um, the thing. And I, uh, I did hear, I mean, uh, that's another one that I did a, a freeze frame, uh, a zoom and enhance on. Uh, if we were trying to determine with that body that was that Jade saw that was under the boulder inside that yes. cubby, that cabinet, uh, it still looked like a, like, almost like a formal, like a dress code or something. I wasn't completely convinced that it was it would have been it was gray so it would have been a confederate uniform just like the union uniform of the soldier that shot at jade in a hallucination mm -hmm. um i also thought that soldier was black but then they zo zoomed in on his face and it looked like he was burned that's why he was i, I thought it was just a, a african-american soldier but it was a, just a guy that was actually burned black but he was still shooting at jade in in his vision but mm -hmm. uh the the uniform or the coat it still looked like a, a formal coat uh, or coat suit jacket type it thing definitely looked like a union suit for sure yeah oh, the, the union soldier was the one that shot at jade the one the guy under yes, the boulder i was not convinced oh, that it was guy, con oh, a confederate no, yeah. yeah i don't know yeah it, it's kind of it's you, yeah you don't get an as close look at that guy's clothing as you do as the, as the one that shot at jade clearly is you know a civil war union soldier but yeah, yeah. the one in the root cellar it's not as clear. You're right. It, it's that's still to be determined. I think. I know a lot of people think it's from the same Civil War era, and, and it could, definitely could be, but mm -hmm. it's it's not as clear as uh, the one that Jade saw for sure. And, and it, it's surprising though. You don't really realize. I mean, everyone's familiar with that scene, but when you're trying to catch that freeze frame in a clear way, it it's is tough. almost impossible, man. And and we just didn't. I didn't get enough info about that being a Confederate soldier. Now Jesse says that. Um, the the soldier is both black and burned so that's entirely yes, plausible is. too yeah. okay no, okay that, yeah he was he, he was it was definitely an african-american soldier but it looked like yeah he had burn marks all over him as well yes okay and he still did he still shot did he take more than, he didn't take more than one shot right at, i'm not sure if he took one or two shots but he definitely impaled uh he definitely impaled Jade twice. Uh, the first one where he looks down and, and he, you know, obviously there's no wound. And then he goes to impale him again. And that's when he disappears. So Jade gets impaled twice and it sh and shot at, at least once. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's uh, a lot of stuff, man. A lot of stuff going on. Yeah. She'll uh, kiss you then stab you in the throat. Yeah. That's Sarah for you right there. Indeed. And yeah, Victor ended up in the cellar as a child. That's how he survived the town massacre. Yes. Yeah. That, that's when Victor was in the, in the root cellar back when he was a child. Yes, indeed. And we got Lara Momo who has just gifted five more memberships. Holy cow. Thank you so much, Lara Momo. Oh, Looks like all this is you. now a, yeah, all this is now a member. Miss T is now a member. Rick Saylor is now a member. Jefferson Roswell is now a member. And Itchy Nads is now a member. I love that <laughs> name, Itchy Nads. Yes. <laughs> These guys that aren't ah. chatting, they find out they're getting a man. They're they're a oh, member now. That is now. awesome. That is you know, so I, awesome. Welcome. I lost Itchy my train Nads. of thought. Yeah, I lost my train of thought that. earlier, and I was going to say, though, man, um, the, the people, and, and I said it on the previous show as well, um, there's people that are, were, I mean, they, they've probably been in other fandoms where you do get just beat up if you're wrong, or you get beat up if you don't remember. Theory shaming happens a lot, especially in the Song of, of Ice and Fire community. Like, I yeah. love the Song of Ice and Fire community. There's, there's a really, it's a really great fandom. It's only a very small portion that does it, but there is a very small portion of the Song of Ice and Fire that really likes to theory shame, and that's not something we ever do here, ever. Like I'll, you'll <laughs> never catch me theory shaming anybody. Hell, I'm right. a tinfoil hat guy. Up. Shit. Macro skill up saying, yeah, my first time on the live stream. Um, it's cool to be here. And, and that's the thing, man. Uh, sometimes, and, awesome. and I said this on the last show as well, but sometimes people like to lurk. Some people like to listen. Maybe they're not in a place where they're at. Maybe they're yeah, doing other work while they're listening. Some people in. like to just listen. That's totally cool. Yeah. Totally and, cool. And, and then maybe the next time somebody will say hi or, you know, whatever. And then next thing, you need to be familiar because this is the place for it, man. This is the place where if you have a theory, throw it out there, man, because we're going to talk about it. We'll see it and be like, OK, what, uh, you know, hold it up to the light. Hold my theory up to the light. Hold everybody's up. But, yeah, man, you guys are absolutely so welcome. And the people who are not participating in the chat, we got the people that are participating. Uh, there's people that we, we know very, very well. And we, uh, oh, you know, we've welcome, seen many, many times. Watch. 
Or why do and you want to participate? Yeah, Everybody's there's awesome. first timers, there's multi timers. Man, it, it's so so cool to have you. And and this is like like Jeremy said, man, we're just a couple of dudes up here. When we get a panel, there's just a, dude just a couple of dude more dudes. Guys, there's another dude. That's it. Right, man. And tomorrow's a show is going to be absolutely lit. I, I can't wait. Wait, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I, like I mean. Now, is it going to be 10 p.m. Eastern? Or uh, we're going to go live gonna go around really? 10. We're going to go live around 10:30 Eastern. That'll give us around an hour and a half to just hang out and talk about the episode before it goes live. It'll give us around an hour and a half to two hours because I figured we could all hit play right at around 12:30. Uh, that gives everybody enough time to get their apps loaded up, get you know, get it loaded up, hit play, get it to that zero mark. We all hit play at the exact same time, right at around you know between 12:15 and 12:30 when everybody is ready and settled. And then, yeah, we'll just we'll do another watch party like we did last Saturday. I'm looking forward to it. It should be uh, fun. Now, tomorrow, I do have an earlier stream on the channel that I'm doing with uh, – because we talk, I talk comic books on this channel uh, every once in a while too. And I have a comic book auction that I am doing tomorrow on the channel, but I'm doing that much, much earlier on. So tomorrow around 7, 7.30 Eastern Standard Time, I will be going live with some of my comic book friends, and we're going to do that quick comic book auction. Then that stream will end. And then at around 1030, we are going to go live for the official live watch party. We'll talk a little bit about our predictions and stuff, wait for the episode to load up on the MGM Plus app, and then we will all sync up, hit play at the exact same time, and we will have another watch party like we did last week. And it was fun. It was real fun last week. I had, definitely did not know how it would go. I thought this would – part of me was thinking it was going to be one big, you know, foobar. But um, it, it ended up going over pretty well with the exception of the MGM not loading up the episode for everybody. If everybody had access to the episode, it would have been much better. And I imagine that I imagine they did get their ducks in a row for this week. I don't expect any more server issues. That, that's something that these apps usually take care of pretty quick. So, yeah, we're going to do another watch party tomorrow night. We will go live, like I said, around 1030 p.m. Eastern, around an hour and a half before the episode loads on the app. We'll go live. We'll talk about our predictions and stuff. And then we will do the live watch party a little after 12. We will all sync up hit play at the same time. And we will see episode eight forest for the trees together. And then we'll talk about it live right after it ends. And, uh, We'll see where we're going. We will see whose theories were right, whose theories were wrong, and we will see who just made a fool of themselves. I know I make a fool of myself every week, and I love it. And uh, that's what we're going to do. It should be fun. It should be fun. I'm looking forward to it. Absolutely. I am looking forward to it indeed. Yeah, Flowers says it's lol, it's 2 a.m. here. I know, man. You guys, you East Coasters are tough. I'm, I'm yeah, in so mountain after time. 2 so it's 2 a.m. here, yeah. But it you is, guys are, are, are tough, and I know I'm going to see you guys tomorrow, too. Um, yeah, you guys but are it's so worth it. It is yeah. so fun, it's man. It's so worth it for a show like this. You know, the show is so fun, and the fact that we do get that opportunity to view it a little bit earlier if we are MGM Plus members, it's a really cool feature. So, yeah, I mean, it just, I just thought it made sense. Let, let's give it a try. Let's see if we can all watch the episode live together and then talk about it right after it ends and uh, have, you know, have a nice little live watch party. And, yeah. Last week's was a ton of fun, so I'm looking forward to tomorrow's as well. But yeah, I have the uh, the comic book live stream. I'm going to be doing around 7:30 Eastern. Uh, that'll go for you know about you know about an hour and a half, two hours or so, and then I will end that stream. And then around 10:30, I will start the official from watch party stream, and we will get things kicked off. It should be fun. It should be fun. Um, but yeah, let's, um, I guess we probably should get closer to wrapping this thing down pretty soon. We have been going for four freaking hours now we just crossed the four hour mark four minutes ago and i gotta say again a big thank you to everybody who has been coming out and hanging out with us for these live streams and i can see a ton of you just about all of you were here right when we started this stream four hours ago most of you are still here now and i just it's so cool and um, it really has just made, made these shows a ton of fun They're just an absolute ton of fun and i cannot wait for tomorrow night to do the uh, live watch party. It should be a lot of fun. Like I said, I'm going to go live around 1030 Eastern, around an hour and a half before the episode lives uh, loads on the app. It'll give us some time to, you know, get our ducks in the row, talk about the show a little bit. We'll have about an hour and a half to discuss. And then, yeah, after the episode loads up just after midnight, we will all sync up, hit play at the same time, and we will do another watch party right here live and i highly suggest anyone who is not a direct member of the mgm plus app definitely do so if you are a member of mgm plus and you are going through amazon and you are going through a different subscription service you probably won't get the episode as early as the rest of us do so my suggestion would be 
you know, become a member of the MGM Plus app directly because it really is a great streaming service. It's really worth it with all the other good shows that are on it. But if you are a member straight to the MGM app, it, you're more likely to get the episode loaded up just after midnight. It seems like people that go through Amazon and some of these other ones, it doesn't load up until maybe an hour or two hours later sometimes. So that's just my suggestion. Definitely get out there and, um, you know, get that MGM plus membership. If you want to hang out with the, with the live uh, after shows, of course, you know, I know not everybody is going to that is totally cool, but uh, yeah. I'm looking forward to it. We had fun last week. I'm looking forward to this one. Yeah, if you, uh, yeah, I mean, if you're dead set against spoilers or because uh, we'll be talking about this again on Monday, once everybody has had a chance to catch the live one on um, on Sunday evening when it plays at the regular time. And the cast does a live as the Sunday night. Uh, I think at the 9 p.m. show East, yeah. the 9 p.m. Eastern show. They do live tweeting. So Harold Perrineau, um, Liz uh, Saunders, the, the uh, Donna, uh, Christy, Julie, all of them, Kenny. Yeah. Yeah, they'll all pop in there. Scotty McCord, uh, uh, Victor will put like start posting peaches and stuff in there, man. So it's so fun to to watch. And you do the hashtag uh, from on MGM or the hashtag from Ali from I L Y, and that's uh, if you hit like most recent tweets, you'll see all of the stuff that they're putting up there. Um, again, I wanted to shout out Michael Dietschy, Ayurvedic man, uh, Kev two, four, seven, crazy mad for super chats, Larry, uh, Quarterwitz and Laura Momo becoming new members of the channel. Tim R with the super chat, Laura Momo with the super chat, all you guys, man, it, it's so extra, but it's so vindicating or so validating that when, yeah. when you guys are so generous, absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah, certainly uh, not expected, but it is incredibly humbling to see it. And like I said, yeah, you guys man. just coming out and hanging out with us and, and, and sharing your thoughts and theories. That is more than payment enough for, for us to do this show. It's just so fun to do. But yeah, no, as Ravener said, big, big, big shout out to everybody who has super chatted tonight and all of the new members as well. Welcome to the channel. We have a ton of new from emojis that I have been loading up to the channel. And of course, if you are a member of the channel and you have a specific from emoji that you want me to load up, definitely let me know in one of the comment sections or at me in the chat if we're live or something. And if I see it, I will definitely try and get that emoji made. I try to be as accommodating as I possibly can be. Last week, we got a few uh, requests for a Tilly emoji, a fanny pack <laughs> granny emoji, as I call her. And we do now have a fanny pack granny emoji in the chat right there. And uh, it's just been a ton of fun. It's just my way of saying thank you. And pretty soon, um, anyone who is a member of the channel, I will be sending out free stickers every month to everyone that is a member of the channel. And I think um, in terms of what stickers they are going to be, I will just have you guys vote out of the emojis. Whatever emoji you like the best, that emoji will I will turn into a sticker and I will send it out to all of the members of the channel. I'm going to start doing that monthly pretty soon. So keep an eye out for that. And yeah, I will have you guys vote on whatever one you like the best and I will turn it into a sticker and it will be an optional free gift for everyone that is a member. And I'm going to try and do that monthly or at least every other month at, at the latest. But yeah, uh, yeah again, you guys have, yeah, if you guys have theories and stuff that, that you don't get to, I know I see thick thickly said, Oh, did I miss it? Yeah, man. Uh, I would, st yeah, I would we, uh, start it, watch it at uh, double time, hours, double time, yeah. one and a half times. Uh, you will be quizzed on it tomorrow. So uh, do be prepared for that. But um, yeah, I started at, at the beginning, watch it at double time, time and a half. Uh, see if any of this stuff makes sense. Um, and I thought I lost my train of thought. Uh, <laughs> what what, what else we're, we're going to do? But man, um, no, yeah, we're gonna yeah, do the, yeah, it's going to be fun. It's going to be fun. We're going to have a nice fun watch party tomorrow. We'll have a little bit of a pre-show. Like I said, we're going to go live around an hour and a half before the episode drops on the app. So around 1030 p.m. Eastern, we will go live for the official from live watch party. And then, yeah, as soon as the episode loads up on the app a little after midnight, we will all sync up and we will watch the episode. We'll all hit play at the same time and we will watch this episode and react live to it and i know maybe lionville studios will be around to clip some of my uh, reactions like he did last week and <laughs> post them on twitter for everybody to see because that was so fun um oh but God, uh, yeah no, sure. it's gonna be i fun. would say I'm always forward to tomorrow yeah my uh, the thing i keep forgetting to say is uh hit the notifications because even when we go live at the notifications youtube is famous for doing that and i don't know if it's when you have to put all or just custom notifications YouTube or whatever personal sucks sometimes at sending out um, notifications yeah, even but, if you have all clicked they sometimes don't always go out that's just yeah so, so if you haven't 
make sure Definitely that you have do that bell just... click to all, but it, you know, sometimes it just, you know, make sure you have the bell click to all. Of course, that is the best chance you have of seeing all the notifications, but yeah, sometimes YouTube just sends them out or doesn't send them out. Sometimes it's, it, it can be fickle, the notification system, unfortunately. Oh, and I, of course I put my meme uh, name on here. I'm Lord underscore Ravener at, on Twitter at Lord underscore Ravener. Um, if you, you, you can follow, you don't have to listen to anything I say or anything, but when we go live uh, or Jeremy Eisenfire, you can find him on Twitter as well. Um, that's when we go live, we always send out a tweet just for that. Um, so, so that's no matter when it is that we I go live Twitter for at this point, yeah. Twitter has been, I'm not a big Twitter fan myself, but I pretty much only use it to promote the show these days and to tweet along with the cast because it is really fun to tweet along with the cast when the episode goes live on Sunday nights. But yeah, you can always yeah. get, uh, catch us, uh, announcing our shows ahead of time over there for sure. Absolutely. But yeah, again, Big thank you to everybody who came out tonight. There, there was up around 100 to 150 of you in the chat all night. I cannot believe it. Most of you have been here for the entire four plus hours. And it's just it's just a testament to how fun this show is to talk about. But it's, an, it's also a testament to just how cool and this community is as a whole. Like everybody is just having a blast hanging out with each other and, and discussing the show. And that's something that we really try to cultivate here on this channel where everybody feels welcome. And hopefully we're doing that. Hopefully we're doing that. Yeah, yeah. Come and, up with your um, theories, put them in the comment section. Yes. We'll look at them. And believe me, yes. I mean, and if you don't believe it, Jeremy does it. I do it. Aldous does it. Snuggy, our other our co-host does it. If you have homework for us, if it's like, hey, I want to see this scene. I want to see a, a, a clear version of this thing that I saw. Or what about this scene? You want something? I'll, I do homework. I promise you. I, and I will take your, your suggestions and I will look at the homework. And if nobody's going to do it, man, somebody's got to do it. That adds to our base of knowledge for everybody. Um, just like, man, that close up of the map, that real clear version of the map that you showed, the world, the, this, uh, the country map, uh, the U.S. map where uh, everybody appeared from. Um, man, this is so neat and so cool. Cause as far as anybody knows, um, like as far as what's her name knows, um, as far as Marielle knows, they were two hours outside of Grand Rapids when, when and as far as she knows, that's where Fromville is, but that ain't where Jade came from. Yeah, that ain't where to a different position. That's the thing. Nobody yep. knows where Fromville is. She might think they're two hours away from Grand Rapids, Michigan, but really it's uh, something else is going on here. Exactly. But uh, no, it's, it's, that's what's so fun about the show. You, we can sit here and just speculate on it for four plus hours and not even get bored. And that that's, that it really is a testament to not how, not just how fun the show is, but how cool the community and fandom is as a whole. And that is thanks to all of you uh, guys and girls and everybody that hangs out in the chat with us every week. And like I said, I cannot thank you guys enough. This has been so fun. And yes, definitely subscribe to the channel. If you have not already hit that like and hit that notifications to uh, receive all of our notifications, at least the ones that get sent out. And tomorrow night we will be going live around 10 30 PM Eastern for our pre-show. And then we will do our live watch party just after midnight, right after the new episode airs. And I'm looking forward to it. It should be a very, very fun one. We got three episodes left, everybody. Three good episodes, I have a feeling. And I just, I get the feeling things are only going to get amped up even more over these next three episodes. And I do have a feeling all roads are eventually going to lead to this lighthouse. But I guess we'll have to wait and see. But until next time, everybody, definitely come back and hang out with us tomorrow night for the live watch party. And we will talk all about from episode seven and eight after we watch it. And again, biggest thank you to everybody who came out and hung out with us tonight. Everybody who super chatted, all of the new members. Huge, huge, huge thank you. I, I can't tell you how much we appreciate all of it. And we will see all of you guys tomorrow night on the next one. Bye. And here. Maybe not. Well, All I right. almost forgot. Oh, I almost oh. forgot. And keep those tinfoil hats on, people. And here.